Section 1 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2, by Chao Shui Chin, translated by Henry Pencroft Jolly, Chapter 25, Part 1. By a demoniacal act, a junior uncle and an elder brother's wife, Pao Yu and Lady Feng, came across five devils. The gem of spiritual perception meets, in a fit of torpor, the two perfect men. Xiao Hung, the story continues, was much unsettled in her mind. Her thoughts rolled on in one connected string. But suddenly she became drowsy, and falling asleep, she encountered Chia Yun, who tried to carry out his intention to drag her near him. She twisted herself round and endeavoured to run away, but was tripped over by the doorstep. This gave her such a start that she woke up. Then at length she realised that it was only a dream. But so restlessly did she, in consequence of this fright, keep on rolling and tossing that she could not close her eyes during the whole night. As soon as the light of the next day dawned, she got up. Several waiting maids came at once to tell her to go and sweep the floors of the rooms and to bring water to wash the face with. Xia Hong did not even wait to arrange her hair or perform her ablutions, but, turning towards the looking glass, she pinned a chevalier up anyhow, and rinsing her hands and tying a sash around her waist, she repaired directly to sweep the apartments. Who would have thought it? Pao Yu also had his heart set upon her the moment he caught sight of her the previous day. Yet he feared, in the first place, that if he mentioned her by name and called her over into his service, Shi Jin and the other girls might feel the pangs of jealousy. He did not, either in the second place, have any idea what her disposition was like. The consequence was that he felt downcast. So much so that when he got up at an early hour, he did not even comb his hair or wash, but simply remained seated and brooded in a state of abstraction. After a while, he lowered the window, threw the girl's frame, from which he could distinctly discern what was going on outside. He espied several servant girls engaged in sweeping the court. All of them were rouged and powdered. They had flowers inserted in their hair and were grandly got up but the only one of whom he failed to get a glimpse was the girl he had met the day before. Pa Yu speedily walked out of the door with slipshod shoes. Under the pretense of admiring the flowers, he glanced, now towards the east, now towards the west. But upon raising his head, he descried, in the southwest corner, someone or other leaning by the side of the railing under the covered passage. A crabapple tree, however, obstructed the view, and he could not see distinctly who it was. So, advancing a step further in, he stared with intent gaze. It was, in point of fact, the waiting maid of the day before, tarrying about, plunged in a reverie. His wish was to go forward and meet her, but he did not, on the other hand, see how he could very well do so. Just as he was cogitating within himself, he, of a sudden, perceived Pihen come and ask him to go and wash his face. This reminder placed him under the necessity of taking himself into his room. But we will leave him there, without further details, so as to return to Xia Hong. She was communing with her own thoughts, but unawares perceiving Shi Zhen wave her hand and call her by name, she had to walk up to her. Our watering pot is spoiled. Shi Zhen smiled and said, So go to Miss Lin's over there and find one for us to use. Xia Hong hastened on her way towards the Xiao Xiang Quan. When she got as far as the Tsuyan Bridge, she saw, on raising her head and looking round, the mounds and lofty places entirely shut in by screens, and she bethought herself that laborers were that day to plant trees in that particular locality. At a great distance off, a band of men were, in very deed, engaged in digging up the soil, while Chia Yun was seated on a boulder on the hill, superintending the works. 
The time came for Xia Hong to pass by, but she could not muster the courage to do so. Nevertheless, she had no other course than to quietly proceed to the Xiao Xiang Quan. Then, getting the water pot, she sped on her way back again. But being in low spirits, she retired alone into her room and lay herself down. One and all, however, simply maintained that she was out of sorts, so they did not pay any heed to her. A day went by. On the morrow fell, in fact, the anniversary of the birth of Wang Tzu Teng's spouse, and someone was dispatched from his residence to come and invite Dowager Lady Chia and Madame Wang. Madame Wang found out, however, that Dowager Lady Chia would not avail herself of the invitation, and neither would she go. So Mrs. Xue went along with the Lady Feng and the three sisters of the Chia family and Pao Chai and Pao Yu, and only returned home late in the evening. Madame Wang was seated in Mrs. Xue's apartments, whither she had just crossed when she received Chia Hun come back from school, and she bade him transcribe incantations out of the Qin Kang canon and intonate them. Chia Huan accordingly came and seated himself on the stove couch occupied by Madame Wang, and directing a servant to light the candles, he started copying in an ostentatious and dashing manner. Now he called Sai Xia to pour a cup of tea for him. Now he called Yu Chuan to take the scissors and cut the snuff off the wick. Chin Chuan, he next cried, you're in the way of the rays of the lamp. The servant girls had all along entertained an antipathy for him, and not one of them therefore worried her mind about what he said. Sai Xia was the only one who still got on well with him, so pouring a cup of tea, she handed it to him. But she felt prompted to whisper to him, Keep quiet a bit. What's the use of making people dislike you? I know myself how matters stand, Chia Huan rejoined, as he cast a steady glance at her. So don't you try and befool me. Now that you are on intimate terms with Pa Yu, you don't pay much heed to me. I've also seen through it myself. Tsai Xiao set her teeth together and gave him a fillip on the head. You heartless fellow, she cried. You're like the dog that bit Lu Tung Pin, and you have no idea of what's right and what's wrong. While these two nagged away, they noticed Lady Feng and Madame Wang come across over to them. Madame Wang at once assailed him with questions. She asked him how many ladies had been present on that day, whether the play had been good or bad, and what the banquet had been like. But a brief interval over, Pao Yu too appeared on the scene. After saluting Madame Wang, he also made a few remarks, with all decorum, and then bidding a servant remove his frontlet, divest him of his long gown and pull off his boots, he rushed head foremost into his mother's lap. Madame Wang caressed and patted him, but while Pao Yu clung to his mother's neck, he spoke to her of one thing and then another. My child, said Madame Wang, you've again had too much to drink. Your face is scalding hot, and if you still keep on rubbing and scraping it, why, you'll by and by stir up the fumes of wine. Don't you yet go and lie down quietly over there for a while. Chiding him the while, she directed a servant to fetch a pillow. Pa Yu therefore lay himself down at the back of Madame Wang and called Tsai Xia to come and stroke him. Pa Yu then began to bandy words with Sai Xia, but perceiving that Sai Xia was reserved and that instead of paying him any attention, she kept her eyes fixed upon Xia Huan, Pa Yu eagerly took her hand. My dear girl, he said, do also heed me a little. And as he gave utterance to this appeal, he kept her hand clasped in his. Sai Xia, however, drew her hand away and would not let him hold it. If you go on in this way, she vehemently explained, I'll shout out at once. These two were in the act of wrangling when verily Chia Huan overheard what was going on. He had, in fact, all along hated Pao Yu. So when on this occasion he espied him up to his larks with Sai Xia, he could much less than ever stifle feelings of resentment in his heart. After some reflection, therefore, an idea suggested itself to his mind, and pretending that it was by a slip of the hand, he shoved the candle, 
overflowing with tallow into Pao Yu's face. Aya! Pao Yu was heard to exclaim. Everyone in the room was plunged in consternation. With precipitate haste, the lantern standing on the floor were moved over, and with the first ray of light, they discovered that Pao Yu's face was one mass of tallow. Madame Wang gave way to anger as well as anxiety. At one time, she issued directions to the servants to rub and wash Pao Yu clean. At another, she heaped abuse upon Chia Huan. Lady Feng jumped onto the stone couch by leaps and bounds, but while intent upon removing the stuff from Pao Yu's face, she simultaneously ejaculated, Master Tertius, are you still such a trickster? I'll tell you what, you'll never turn to any good account. Yet Dame Chao should ever correct and admonish him. This single remark suggested the idea to Madame Wang, and she lost no time in sending for Mrs. Chao to come around. You bring up, she berated her, such a black-hearted offspring like this, and don't you, after all, advise and reprove him? Time and again I paid no notice whatever to what happened, and you and he have become more audacious and have gone from worse to worse. Mrs. Chow had no alternative but to suppress every sense of injury, silence all grumblings, and go herself and lend a hand to the others in tidying Pao Yu. She then perceived that a whole row of blisters had risen on the left side of Pao Yu's face, but that, fortunately, no injury had been done to his eyes. When Madame Wang's attention was drawn to them, she felt her heart sore. It fell a prey to fears also, lest when Dowager Lady Chia made any inquiries about them, she should find it difficult to give her any satisfactory reply. And so distressed did she get that she gave Mrs. Chow another scolding. But while she tried to comfort Pai Yu, she, at the same time, fetched more powder for counteracting the effects of the virus and applied it to his face. It's rather sore, said Pai Yu, but it's nothing to speak of. Tomorrow, when my old grandmother asks about it, I can simply explain that I scalded it myself. That will be quite enough to tell her. If you say that you scalded it yourself, Lady Fung observed, why, she'll also call people to task for not looking out, and a fit of rage will, beyond doubt, be the outcome of it all. Madame Wang then ordered the servants to take care and escort Pao Yu back to his room. On their arrival, Shi Jin and the other attendants saw him, and they were all in a great state of flurry. As for Lin Tai Yu, when she found that Pai Yu had gone out of doors, she continued the whole day a prey to ennui. In the evening, she deputed messengers two and three times to go and inquire about him. But when she came to know that he had been scalded, she hurried in person to come and see him. She then discovered Pai Yu all alone, holding a glass and scanning his features in it, while the left side of his face was plastered all over with some medicine. Lin Tai Yu imagined that the burn was of an extremely serious nature, and she hastened to approach him with a view to examine it. Pao Yu, however, screened his face and, waving his hand, bade her leave the room, for knowing her usual knack for tidiness, he did not feel inclined to let her get a glimpse of his face. Tai Yu then gave up the attempt and confined herself to asking him whether it was very painful. It isn't very sore, replied Pai Yu. If I look after it for a day or two, it will get all right. But after another short stay, Lin Tai Yu repaired back to her quarters. The next day, Pai Yu saw Dowager Lady Chia, but in spite of his confession that he himself was responsible for the scalding of his face, his grandmother could not refrain from reading another lecture to the servants who had been in attendance. A day after... Ma, a Taoist matron, whose name was recorded as Pao Yu's godmother, came on a visit to the mansion. Upon perceiving Pao Yu, she was very much taken aback, and asked all about the circumstances of the accident. When he explained that he had been scalded, she forthwith shook her head and heaved a sigh. Then, while making with her fingers a few passes over Pao Yu's face, she went on to mutter incantations for several minutes. 
I can guarantee that he'll get all right, she added, for this is simply a sadden and fleeting accident. Turning towards Dowager Lady Chia, Venerable Ancestor, she observed, Venerable Buddha, how could you ever be aware of the existence of the portentous passage in that Buddhistic classic? To the effect that a son of every person who holds the dignity of prince, duke, or high functionary has no sooner come into the world and reached a certain age than numerous evil spirits at once secretly haunt him and pinch him, and when they find an opportunity or dig their nails into him or knock their, his bowl of rice down, during mealtime, or give him a shove and send him over, while he is quietly seated. So this is the reason why the majority of the sons and grandsons of those distinguished families do not grow up to attain manhood. Dowager Lady Chia, upon hearing her speak in this wise, eagerly asked, Is there any Buddhistic spell by means of which to check their influence or not? This is an easy job, rejoined the Taoist matron Ma. All one need do is to perform several meritorious deeds on his account so as to counteract the consequences of retribution and everything will then be put right. That canon further explains that in the western part of the world there is a mighty Buddha whose glory illumines all things and whose special charge is to cast his luster on the evil spirits in dark places that if any benevolent man or virtuous woman offers him oblations with sincerity of heart, he is able to so successfully perpetuate the peace and quiet of their sons and grandsons that there will be no more meet with any calamities arising from being possessed by malevolent demons. But what, I wonder, inquired Dowager Lady Chia, could be offered to this god? Nothing of any great value, answered the Tao's matron Ma, Exclusive of offerings of scented candles, several catties of scented oil can be added, each day to keep the lantern of the great sea alight. This great sea lantern is the visible embodiment and Buddhistic representation of this divinity, so day and night we don't venture to let it go out. For a whole day and a whole night, asked Dowager Lady Chia, how much oil is needed so that I too should accomplish a good action? There is really no limit as to quantity. It rests upon the goodwill of the donor, Ma, the Taoist matron put in by way of reply. In my quarters, for instance, I have several lanterns. The gifts of the consorts of princes and the spouses of very high officials living in various localities. The consort of the mansion of the Prince of Nanao had been prompted in her beneficence by a liberal spirit. She allows each day 48 catties of oil and a catty of wiki, so that her great sea lamp is only a trifle smaller than a water jar. The spouse of the Marquis of Qinxiang comes next, with no more than 20 catties a day. But these, there are several other families, some giving 10 catties, some 8 catties, some 3, some 5, Subject to no fixed rule, and of course I feel bound to keep the lanterns alight on their behalf. Dowager Lady Chia nodded her head and gave way to reflection. There's still another thing, continued the Tao's matron Ma. If it be on account of father or mother or seniors, any excessive donation would not matter. But were you, venerable ancestor, to bestow too much in your offering for Pao Yu, our young master won't, I fear, be equal to the gift, and instead of being benefited, his happiness will be snapped. If you therefore want to make a liberal gift, seven catties will do. If a small one, then five catties will even be sufficient. Well, in that case, responded Dowager Lady Chia, let us fix upon five catties a day, and every month come and receive payment of the whole lump sum. Omi Tofu, exclaimed Ma, the Taoist matron, O merciful and mighty Pu Sa! Dowager Lady Chia then called the servants and impressed on their minds that whenever Pa Yu went out of doors in the future, they should give several strings of cash to the pages to bestow on charity among the bonzes and Taoist priests, and the poor and the needy they might meet on the way. These directions concluded, the Taoist matron trudged into the various quarters 
and paid her respects, and then strolled leisurely about. Presently, she entered Mrs. Chow's apartments. After the two ladies had exchanged salutations, Mrs. Chow bade a young servant girl hand her guest a cup of tea. While Mrs. Chow busied herself pasting shoes, Ma, the Taoist matron, espied, piled up on a heap on the stove couch, sundry pieces of silks and satins. It just happens, she consequently remarked, that I have no facings for shoes, so my lady do give me a few odd cuttings of silk and satin, of no matter what colour, to make myself a pair of shoes with. Mrs. Chow heaved a sigh. Look, she said, whether there will still be among them any pieces good for anything, but anything that's worth anything doesn't find its way in there. If you don't despise what's worthless, you are at liberty to select any two pieces and to take them away and have done. The Taoist matron, Ma, chose with alacrity several pieces and shoved them in her breast. The other day, Mrs. Chow went on to inquire, I sent a servant over with five hundred cash. Have you presented any offerings before the god of medicine or not? I've offered them long ago for you, the Taoist matron Ma rejoined. Omi Tofu, ejaculated Mrs. Chow with a sigh. Were I a little better off, I'd also come often and offer gifts. But although my will will be boundless, my means are insufficient. Don't trouble yourself on this score, suggested Ma, the Taoist matron. By and by, when Mr. Huan has grown up into a man and obtained some official post or other, will there then be any fear of your not being able to afford such offerings as you might like to make? At these words, Mrs. Chow gave a smile. Enough, enough, she cried. Don't again refer to such contingencies. The present is a fair criterion. For up to whom in this house can my son and I come? Pao Yu is still a mere child, but he is such that he wins people to love. Those big people may be partial to him and love him a good deal. I have nothing to say to it, but I can't eat humble pie to this sort of mistress. While uttering this remark, she stretched out her two fingers. Ma, the Taoist matron, understood the meaning she decided to convey. It's your lady Secunda Lian, eh? she forthwith asked. Mrs. Chow was filled with trepidation. Hastily waving her hand, she got to her feet, raised the portier, and peeped outside. Perceiving that there was no one about, she at length retraced her footsteps. Dreadful, she then said to the Taoist matron. Dreadful. But speaking of this sort of mistress, I am not so much as a human being if she doesn't manage to shift over into her mother's home the whole of this family estate. Need you tell me this? Ma, the Taoist matron, at these words remarked with a view to ascertain what she implied. Haven't I, forsooth, discovered it all for myself? Yet it's fortunate that you don't trouble your minds about her, for it's far better that you should let her have her own way. My dear woman, rejoined Mrs. Chow, not let her have her own way. Why, is it likely that anyone would have the courage to tell her anything? I don't mean to utter any words that may bring upon me retribution, added Ma, the Taoist matron, but you people haven't got the wits, but it's no matter of surprise. Yet, if you daren't openly do anything, why, you should stealthily have devised some plan. And do you still tarry up to this day? Mrs. Chow realized that there lurked something in her insinuation, and she felt an inward secret joy. What plan could I stealthily devise? she asked. I've got the will right enough, but I'm not a person gifted with this sort of gumption. So were you to impart to me some way or other, I would reward you most liberally. When the Taoist matron Ma heard this, she drew near to her. Omi Tofu, desist at once from asking me, she designedly exclaimed. How can I know anything about such matters, contrary as they are to what is right? There you are again, Mrs. Chow replied. You're one ever most ready to succor those in distress and to help those in danger. And is it likely that you'll quietly look on while someone comes and compasses my death as well as that of my son? Are you, pray fearful, lest I shouldn't give you any reward? Ma, the Taoist matron, greeted this remark with a smile. 
You're right enough in what you say, she ventured, of my being unable to bear the sight of yourself and son receiving insult from a third party. But as for your mention of rewards, why, what's there of yours that I still covet? This answer slightly reassured Mrs. Chow's mind. How is it, she speedily urged, that an intelligent person like you should have become so dense, if indeed the spell proves efficacious, and we exterminate them both, is there any apprehension that this family estate won't be ours? And when that time comes, won't you get all you may wish? At this disclosure, Ma, the Taoist matron, lowered her head for a long time. When everything, she observed, shall have been settled satisfactorily, and when there'll be, what's more, no proof at all, will you still pay any heed to me? What's there hard about this? remarked Mrs. Chow. I've saved several tiles from my own pin money, and have besides a good number of clothes and head ornaments, so you can first take several of these away with you, and I'll further write an IOU and entrust it to you, and when that time comes, I'll pay you in full. That will do, answered the Taoist matron Ma. Mrs. Chow thereupon dismissed even a young servant girl who happened to be in the room, and hastily opening a trunk, she produced several articles of clothing and jewelry, as well as a few odd pieces of silver from her own pocket money. Then, also writing a promissory note for fifty tiles, she surrendered the lot to Ma, the Taoist matron. Take these, she said, in advance for presence in your temple. At the sight of the various articles and of the promissory note, the Taoist matron became at once unmindful of what is right and what is wrong, and while her mouth was full of assent, she stretched out her arm and first and foremost laid hold of the hard cash, and next clutched the IOU. Turning then towards Mrs. Chow, she asked for a sheet of paper, and taking up a pair of scissors, she cut out two human beings and gave them to Mrs. Chow, enjoining her to write on the upper part of them the respective ages of the two persons in question. Looking further for a sheet of blue paper, she cut out five blue-faced devils, which she bade her place together side by side with the paper men, and taking a pin, she made them fast. When I get home, she remarked, I'll have recourse to some art which will, beyond doubt, prove efficacious. When she, however, had done speaking, she suddenly saw Madame Wang's waiting maid make her appearance inside the room. What, my dame, are you in here? the girl exclaimed. Why, our lady is expecting you. The two dames then parted company. End of Part 1 Section 2 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sylvie Roth The Dream of the Red Chamber, Part 2 by Tsao Shui Qin. Translated by Henry Bencraft Jolie. Chapter 25, Part 2. But passing them over, we will now allude to Lin Dai Yu. As Bai Yu had scalded his face and did not go out of doors very much, she often came to have a chat with him. On this particular day, she took up, after her meal, some book or other, and read a couple of pages out of it. Next, she busied herself a little with needlework, in company with Si Juan. She felt, however, thoroughly dejected and out of sorts, so she strolled out of doors along with her, but catching sight of the newly sprouted bamboo shoots in front of the pavilion, they involuntarily stepped out of the entrance of the court and penetrated into the garden. They cast their eyes on all four quarters, but not a soul was visible. When they became conscious of the splendor of the flowers and the chatter of the birds, they, with listless step, turned their course towards the Ihong court. There they found several servant girls bailing out water, while a bevy of them stood under the veranda, watching the thrushes and having their bath. They heard also the sound of laughter in the rooms. The fact is that Li Gong Sai, Lady Feng, and Bao Chai were assembled inside. As soon as they saw them walk in, they with one voice shouted, smiling, Now, are not these two more? We are a full company today, laughed Dayu. 
But who has issued the cards and invited us here? The other day, interposed Lady Fung, I sent servants with a present of two caddies of tea for you, Miss Lin. Was it after all good? I had just forgotten all about it, Dai rejoined. Many thanks for your kind attention. I tasted it, observed Bao Yu. I did not think it anything good, but I don't know how others who've had any of it find it. Its flavor, said Dai Yu, is good. The only thing is, it has no color. It's tribute tea from the Laos kingdom, continued Lady Fung. When I tried it, I didn't either find it anything very fine. It's not up to what we ordinarily drink. To my taste, it's all right, put in Dai Yu. But what your palates are like, I can't make out. As you say, it's good, suggested Bao Yu. You're quite at liberty to take all I have for your use. I've got a great deal more of it over there, Lady Fung remarked. I'll tell a servant girl to go and fetch it, Dai Yu replied. No need, Lady Fung went on. I'll send it over with someone. I also have a favor to ask of you tomorrow, so I may as well tell the servant to bring it along at the same time. When Lin Dai Yu heard these words, she put on a smile. You just mark this, she observed. I've had today a little tea from her place, and she at once begins making a tool of me. Since you've had some of our tea, Lady Fung laughed, how is it that you have not yet become a wife in our household? The whole party burst out laughing aloud, so much so that they found it difficult to repress themselves, but Dayu's face was suffused with blushes. She turned her head the other way and uttered not a word. Our sister-in-law Secunda's jibes are first rate, Bao Chai chimed in with a laugh. What jibes, exclaimed Dayu. They're purely and simply the prattle of a mean mouth and vile tongue. They're enough to evoke people's displeasure. Saying this, she went on to sputter in disgust. Were you, insinuated Lady Fung, to become a wife in my family, what is there that you would lack? Pointing then at Bai Yu, look here, she cried. Is not this human being worthy of you? Is not his station in life good enough for you? Are not our stock and estate sufficient for you? And in what slight degree can he make you lose caste? Dayu rose to her feet and retired immediately. But Bao Chai shouted out, Here's Ping Ar in a huff. Don't you yet come back? When you've gone, there will really be no fun. While calling out to her, she jumped up to pull her back. As soon, however, as she reached the door of the room, she beheld Mrs. Zhao, accompanied by Mrs. Zhou, both coming to look up Bao Yu. Bao Yu and his companions got up in a body and pressed them into a seat. Lady Fung was the sole person who did not heed them. But just as Bao Chai was about to open her lips, she perceived a servant girl attached to Madame Wang's apartments appear on the scene. "'Your maternal uncle's wife has come,' she said." and she requests you, ladies and young ladies, to come out and see her. Li Gongsai hurriedly walked away in company with Lady Fung. The two dames, Mrs. Zhao and Mrs. Zhou, in like manner took their leave and quitted the room. As for me, I can't go out, Bao Yu shouted, but whatever you do, pray, don't ask Aunt to come in here. Cousin Lin, he went on to say, do stay on a while, I've got something to tell you. Lady Fung overheard him. Turning her head towards Lin Dayu, there's someone, she cried, who wants to speak with you. And forthwith, laying hold of Lin Dayu, she pushed her back and then trudged away along with Li Gong Sai. During this time, Bai Yu clasped Dayu's hand in his. He did nothing more than smile, but not a word did he utter. Dayu naturally, therefore, got crimson in the face and struggled to escape his importunities. Ay ya exclaimed Bai Yu, how my head is sore. It should be, rejoined Dai Yu. Oh, me too. Bai Yu then gave vent to a loud shout. His body bounced three or four feet high from the ground. His mouth was full of confused shrieks. But all he said was rambling talk. Dai Yu and the servant girls were full of consternation. And with all possible haste, they ran and apprised Madame Wang and Dowager Lady Jia. Wang Tzu Tang's wife was, at this time, also with them, so they all came in a body to see him. 
Bao Yu behaved more and more as if determined to clutch a sword or seize a spear to put an end to his existence. He raged in a manner sufficient to subvert the heavens and upset the earth. As soon as Dowager Lady Jia and Madame Wang caught sight of him, they were struck with terror. They trembled wildly like a piece of clothing that is being shaken. Uttering a shout of, My son! and another of, My flesh! They burst out into a loud fit of crying. Presently, all the inmates were seized with fright. Even Jia She, Madame Xing, Jia Cheng, Jia Chen, Jia Lian, Jia Zheng, Jia Yun, Jia Ping, Mrs. Xue, Xue Pan, Zhou Rui's wife, and the various members of the household, whether high or low, and the servant girls and married women too, rushed into the garden to see what was up. The confusion that prevailed was, at the moment, like entangled flax. Everyone was at a loss what to do when they espied Lady Fung dash into the garden, a glistening sword in hand, and try to cut down everything that came in her way, ogle vacantly whomsoever struck her gaze, and make forthwith an attempt to dispatch them. A greater panic than ever broke out among the whole assemblage, but placing herself at the head of a handful of sturdy female servants, Jo Dwey's wife precipitated herself forward, and clasping her tight, they succeeded in snatching the sword from her grip and carrying her back into her room. Ping Ar, Fung Ar, and the other girls began to weep. They invoked the heavens and appealed to the earth. Even Jia Cheng was distressed at heart. One and all, at this stage, started shouting, some one thing, some another. Some suggested exorcists. Some cried out for the posture-makers to attract the devils. Others recommended that Chang, the Taoist priest of the Yu Huang Temple, should catch the evil spirits. A thorough turmoil reigned supreme for a long time. The gods were implored, prayers were offered, every kind of remedy was tried, but no benefit whatever became visible. After sunset, the spouse of Wang Tung said goodbye and took her departure. On the ensuing day, Wang Xutang himself also came to make inquiries. Following closely upon him arrived in a body messengers from the young Marquis Shu, Madame Xing's young brother, and their various relatives to ascertain for themselves how Lady Feng and Bao Yu were progressing. Some brought charm water, some recommended bonzes and Taoist priests, Others spoke highly of doctors, but that young fellow and his elder brother's wife fell into such greater and greater stupor that they lost all consciousness. Their bodies were hot like fire. As they lay prostrate on their beds, they talked deliriously. With the fall of the shades of night, their condition aggravated, so much so that the matrons and servant girls did not venture to volunteer their attendance. They had, therefore, to be both moved into Madame Wang's quarters, where servants were told to take their turn and watch them. Dowager Lady Jia, Madame Wang, Madame Xing, and Mrs. Xue did not budge an inch or step from their side. They sat round them and did nothing but cry. Jia Xu and Jia Cheng, too, were a prey, at this juncture, to misgivings lest weeping should upset Dowager Lady Jia. Day and night oil was burnt, and fires were, mindless of expense, kept alight. The bustle and confusion was such that no one, either master or servant, got any rest. Jia Shi also sped on every side in search of Buddhists and Taoist priests. But Jia Cheng had witnessed how little relief these things could afford, and he felt constrained to dissuade Jia Shi from his endeavors. The destiny, he argued, of our son and daughter is entirely dependent upon the will of heaven, and no human strength can prevail. The malady of these two persons would not be healed, even were every kind of treatment tried, and as I feel confident that it is the design of heaven that things should be as they are, all we can do is to allow it to carry out its purpose. Jashu, however, paid no notice to his remonstrances, and continued as hitherto to fuss in every imaginable way. In no time, three days elapsed. Lady Feng and Bao Yu were still confined to their beds. Their breaths had grown fainter. The whole household, therefore, unanimously arrived at the conclusion that there was no hope. And with all dispatch, they made every necessary preparation 
for the subsequent requirements of both their relatives. Dowager Lady Jia, Madame Wang, Jia Lian, Ping Er, Xi Jun, and the others indulged in tears with keener and keener anguish. They hung between life and death. Mrs. Zhao alone was the one who assumed an outward sham air of distress, while in her heart she felt her wishes gratified. The fourth day arrived. At an early hour, Bao Yu suddenly opened his eyes and addressed himself to his grandmother Jia. From this day forward, he said, I may no longer abide in your house, so you'd better send me off at once. These words made Dowager Lady Jia feel as if her very heart had been wrenched out of her. Mrs. Zhao, who stood by, exhorted her. You shouldn't, venerable lady, she said, indulge in excessive grief. This young man has been long ago of no good. So wouldn't it be as well to dress him up and let him go back a moment sooner from this world? You'll also be thus sparing him considerable suffering. But if you persist in not reconciling yourself to the separation and this breath of his is not cut off, he will lie there and suffer without any respite. Her arguments were scarcely ended when she was spat upon by Dowager Lady Jia. You rotten-tongued, good-for-nothing hag, she cried abusively. What makes you fancy him of no good? You wish him dead and gone, but what benefit will you then derive? Don't give way to any dreams, for if he does die, I'll just exact your lives from you. It's all because you've been continuously at him, inciting and urging him to read and write, that his spirit has become so intimidated that at the sight of his father he behaves just like a rat, trying to get out of the way of a cat. And is not all this the result of the bullying of such a mean herd of women as yourselves? Could you now drive him to death, your wishes would immediately be fulfilled. But which of you will I let off? Now she shed tears. Now she gave vent to abuse. Jia Cheng, who stood by, heard these invectives, and they so enhanced his exasperation that he promptly shouted out and made Mrs. Zhao withdraw. He then exerted himself for a time to console his senior by using kindly accents. But suddenly someone came to announce that the two coffins had been completed. This announcement pierced like a dagger, Dowager Lady Jia to the heart, and while weeping with despair more intense, she broke forth in violent upbraidings. Who is it, she inquired, who gave orders to make the coffins? Bring at once the coffin makers and beat them to death. A stir ensued sufficient to convulse the heavens and to subvert the earth. But at an unforeseen moment resounded in the air the gentle rapping of a wooden fish bell. A voice recited the sentence, Ave, Buddha, able to unravel retribution and dispel grievances, should any human being lie in sickness and his family be solicitous on his account, or should anyone have met with evil spirits and come across any baleful evils, we have the means to effect a cure. Dowager Lady Jia and Madame Wang at once directed servants to go out into the street and find out who it was. It turned out to be, in fact, a mangy-headed bonds and a hobbling Taoist priest. What was the appearance of the bonds? His nose like a suspended gall, his two eyebrows so long, his eyes resembling radiant stars possessed a precious glow. His coat in tatters and his shoes of straw without a home, rolling in filth, and, a worse fate, his head one mass of boils. And the Taoist priest, what was he like? With one leg perched high he comes, with one leg low, his whole frame drenching wet, bespattered all with mud. If you perchance meet him, Ask him where's his home. In fairyland, west of the weak water, he'll say. Jia Cheng ordered the servants to invite them to walk in. On what hill, he asked those two persons, do you cultivate the principles of reason? Worthy official, 
the bonds smiled. You must not ask too many questions. It's because we've learnt that there are inmates of your honourable mansion in a poor state of health that we come, with the express design of working a cure. There are, explained Jia Cheng, two of our members who have been possessed of evil spirits. But is there, I wonder, any remedy by means of which they could be healed? <laughs> in your family laughingly observed the Taoist priest. You have ready at hand a precious thing, the like of which is rare to find in the world. It possesses the virtue of alleviating the ailment, so why need you inquire about remedies? Jia Cheng's mind was forthwith aroused. It's true, he consequently rejoined, that my son brought along with him at the time of his birth a piece of jade, on the surface of which was inscribed that it had the virtue of dispelling evil influences, but we haven't seen any efficacy in it. There is, worthy officer, said the bonds, something in it which you do not understand. That precious jade was, in its primitive state, efficacious, but consequent upon its having been polluted by music, lewdness, property, and gain, it has lost its spiritual properties. But produce now that valuable thing, and wait till I have taken it into my hands and pronounced incantations over it, when it will become as full of efficacy as of old. Jia Cheng accordingly unclasped the piece of jade from Bao Yu's neck and handed it to the two divines. The Buddhist priest held it with reverence in the palm of his hand and heaving a deep sigh since our parting he cried at the foot of the chingkung peak about thirteen years have elapsed how time flies in this mortal world thine earthly destiny has not yet been determined alas alas how admirable were the qualities thou didst possess in those days by heaven unrestrained without constraint from earth no joys lived in thy heart, but sorrows none as well. Yet when perception through refinement thou didst reach, thou wentst among mankind to trouble to give rise. How sad the lot which thou of late hast had to hear! Powder prints and rouge stains thy precious luster dim. House bars both day and night encage thee like a duck. Deep wilt thou sleep, but from thy dream at length thou'lt wake. Thy debt of vengeance, once discharged, thou wilt depart. At the conclusion of this recital, he again rubbed the stone for a while, and gave vent to some nonsensical utterances, after which he surrendered it to Jia Cheng. This object, he said, has already resumed its efficacy, but you shouldn't do anything to desecrate it. Hang it on the post of the door in his bedroom, and with the exception of his own relatives, you must not let any outside female pollute it. After the expiry of thirty-three days, he will, I can guarantee, be all right. Jia Cheng then gave orders to present tea, but the two priests had already walked away. He had, however, no alternative but to comply with their injunctions, and Lady Feng and Bao Yu, in point of fact, got better from day to day. Little by little, they returned to their senses and experienced hunger. Dowager Lady Jia and Madame Wang at length felt composed in their minds. All the cousins heard the news outside. Dai Yu, previous to anything else, muttered a prayer to Buddha, while Bao Chai laughed and said not a word. Sister Bao, inquired Xi Chun, what are you laughing for? I laugh, replied Bao Chai, because the thus come Joss has more to do than any human being. He's got to see to the conversion of all mankind, and to take care of the ailments to which all flesh is heir, for he restores every one of them at once to health, and he has as well to control people's marriages so as to bring them about through his aid, and what do you say, has he ample to do? or not. Now, isn't this enough to make one laugh, eh? Lin Dayu blushed. Chee! she exclaimed. None of you are good people. 
Instead of following the example of worthy persons, you try to rival the mean mouth of that hussy Fung. As she uttered these words, she raised the portier and made her exit. But, reader, do you want to know any further circumstances? If so, the next chapter will explain them to you. End of section two. Recording by Sylvie Roth. Section 3 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sylvie Roth. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2 by Tsao Shui Qin. Translated by Henry Bencraft Jolie. Chapter 26, Part 1 On the Feng Yao Bridge, Xiao Hong makes known sentimental matters in equivocal language. In the Xiao Xiang Lodge, Tai Yu gives, while under the effects of the spring lassitude, expression to her secret feelings. After thirty days' careful nursing, Bao Yu, we will now notice, not only got strong and hale in body, but the scars even on his face completely healed up, so he was able to shift his quarters again into the garden of Broad Vista. But we will banish this topic, as it does not deserve any additional explanations. Let us now turn our attention elsewhere. During the time that Bao Yu was of late laid up in bed, Jia Yun, along with the young pages of the household, sat up on watch to keep an eye over him, and both day and night they tarried on this side of the mansion. But Xiao Hong, as well as all the other waiting maids, remained in the same part to nurse Bao Yu, so Jia Yun and she saw a good deal of each other on several occasions, and gradually an intimacy sprung up between them. Xiao Hong observed that Zhao Yun held in his hand a handkerchief very much like the one she herself had dropped some time ago, and was bent upon asking him for it, but she did on the other hand not think she could do so with propriety. The unexpected visit of the bonds and Taoist priests rendered, however, superfluous the services of the various male attendants, and Zhao Yun had therefore to go again and oversee the men planting the trees. Now she had a mind to drop the whole question, but she could not reconcile herself to it, and now she longed to go and ask him about it. But fears rose in her mind, lest people should entertain any suspicions as to the relations that existed between them. But just as she faltered, quite irresolute, and her heart was thoroughly unsettled, she unawares heard someone outside inquire, "'Sister, are you in the room or not?' Xiao Hong, upon catching this question, looked out through a hole in the window, and perceiving at a glance that it was no one else than a young servant girl, attached to the same court as herself, Jia Hui by name, she consequently said by way of reply, Yes, I am. Come in. When these words reached her ear, Jia Hui ran in, and taking at once a seat on the bed, she observed with a smile, "'How lucky I've been! I was a little time back in the court washing a few things, when Bao Yu cried out that some tea should be sent over to Miss Lin, and Sister Hua handed it to me to go on the errand. By a strange coincidence, our old lady had presented some money to Miss Lin, and she was engaged at the moment in distributing it among the servant girls. As soon, therefore, as she saw me get there, Miss Lin forthwith grasped two handfuls of cash and gave them to me.' How many there are I don't know, but do keep them for me. Speedily then opening her handkerchief, she emptied the cash. Xiao Hong counted them for her by fives and tens at a time. She was beginning to put it away, when Jia Hui remarked, How are you, after all, feeling of late in your mind? I'll tell you what, you should really go and stay at home for a couple of days. And were you to ask a doctor round and to have a few doses of medicine, you'll get all right at once. "'What are you talking about?' Xiao Hong replied. "'What shall I go home for, when there's neither rhyme nor reason for it?' 
Miss Lynn, I remember, is naturally of a weak physique and has constantly to take medicines, Jiao Hui added. So were you to ask her for some and bring them over and take them, it would come to the same thing. Nonsense, rejoined Xiao Hong. Our medicines also to be recklessly taken. You can't go on forever like this, continued Jiao Hui. You're besides loath to eat and loath to drink, and what will you be like in the long run? What's there to fear? observed Xiao Hong. Won't it anyhow be better to die a little earlier? It would be a riddance. Why do you deliberately come out with all this talk? Jiao Hui demurred. How could you ever know anything of the secrets of my heart? Xiao Hong inquired. Jia Hui nodded her head and gave way to reflection. I don't think it's strange on your part, she said after a time, for it is really difficult to abide in this place. Yesterday, for instance, our dowager lady remarked that the servants in attendance had had, during all the days that Bao Yu was ill, a good deal to put up with, and that now that he has recovered, incense should be burnt everywhere and the vows fulfilled, and she expressed a wish that those in his service should, one and all, be rewarded according to their grade. I and several others can be safely looked upon as young in years, and unworthy to presume so high, so I don't feel in any way aggrieved, but how is it that one like you couldn't be included in the number? My heart is much annoyed at it. Had there been any fear that Shi Zhen would have got ten times more, I could not even then have felt sore against her, for she really deserves it. I'll just tell you an honest truth. Who else is there like her? not to speak of the diligence and carefulness she has displayed all along. Even had she not been so diligent and careful, she couldn't have been set aside. But what is provoking is that that lot, like Qing Wen and Qi Xia, should have been included in the upper class. Yet it's because everyone places such reliance on the fine reputation of their father and mother that they exalt them. Now do tell me, is this sufficient to anger one or not? It won't do to be angry with them, Xiao Hong observed. The proverb says, You may erect a shed a thousand li long, but there is no entertainment from which the guests will not disperse. And who is it that will tarry here for a whole lifetime? In another three years or five years, every single one of us will have gone her own way. And who will, when that time comes, worry her mind about anyone else? These allusions had the unexpected effect of touching Jia Hui to the heart, and in spite of herself, the very balls of her eyes got red. But so uneasy did she feel at crying for no reason that she had to exert herself to force a smile. What you say is true, she ventured, and yet Bao Yu even yesterday explained how the rooms should be arranged by and by and how the clothes should be made, just as if he was bound to hang on to dear life for several hundreds of years. Xiao Hong, at these words, gave a couple of sardonic smiles. But when about to pass some remark, she perceived a youthful servant girl, who had not as yet let her hair grow, walk in, holding in her hands several patterns and two sheets of paper. You are asked, she said, to trace these two designs. As she spoke, she threw them at Xiao Hong, and twisting herself round, she immediately scampered away. Whose are they, after all? Xiao Hong inquired, addressing herself outside. Couldn't you wait even so much as to conclude what you had to say, but flew off at once? Who is steaming bread and waiting for you? Or are you afraid, forsooth, lest it should get cold? They belong to Sister Chi, the young servant girl merely returned for answer from outside the window, and raising her feet high she ran tramp tramp on her way back again. Xiao Hong lost control over her temper, and snatching the designs she flung them on one side. She then rummaged in a drawer for a pencil, but finding, after a prolonged search, that they were all blunt, where did I, she thereupon ejaculated, put that brand new pencil the other day? How is it I can't remember where it is? While she soliloquized, she became wrapped in thought. After some reflection, she at length gave a smile. Of course, she exclaimed. The other evening, Ying'ar took it away. 
and turning towards Jia Hui, fetch it for me, she shouted. Sister Hua, Jia Hui rejoined, is waiting for me to get a box for her, so you had better go for it yourself. What? remarked Xiao Hong. She's waiting for you, and you are still squatting here, chatting leisurely? Hadn't it been that I asked you to go and fetch it, she too wouldn't have been waiting for you, you most perverse vixen. With these words on her lips, she herself walked out of the room, and leaving the Yihong court, she straightway proceeded in the direction of Bao Chai's court. As soon, however, as she reached the Xinfang pavilion, she saw Dame Li, Bao Yu's nurse, appear in view from the opposite side. So Xiao Hong halted, and putting on a smile, Nurse Li, she asked, where are you, old dame, bound for? How is it you're coming this way? Nurse Li stopped short and clapped her hands. Tell me, she said, has he deliberately again gone and fallen in love with that Mr. Something or other like Yun, Cloud, or you, Rain? They now insist upon my bringing him inside, but if they get wind of it by and by in the upper rooms, it won't again be a nice thing. Are you, old lady, replied Xiao Hong, smiling, taking things in such real earnest that you readily believe them and want to go and ask him in here? What can I do? rejoined Nurse Li. Why, that fellow, added Xiao Hong laughingly, will, if he has any idea of decency, do the right thing and not come. Besides, he's not a fool, pleaded Nurse Li. So why shouldn't he come in? Well, if he is to come, answered Xiao Hong, it will devolve upon you, worthy dame, to lead him along with you. For were you, by and by, to let him penetrate inside all alone and knock recklessly about, why, it won't do at all. Have I got all that leisure, retorted Nurse Li, to trudge along with him? I'll simply tell him to come, and later on I can dispatch a young servant girl or some old woman to bring him in and have done. Saying this, she continued her way, leaning on her staff. After listening to her rejoinder, Xiao Hong stood still, and plunging in abstraction, she did not go and fetch the pencil. But presently, she caught sight of a servant girl running her way. Espying Xiao Hong lingering on that spot, Sister Hong, she cried, what are you doing in here? Xiao Hong raised her head and recognized a young waiting maid called Jue Ar. Where are you off to? Xiao Hong asked. I've been told to bring in Master Secundus, Mr. Yun, Jue Ar replied. After which answer, she there and then departed with all speed. Xiao Hong reached, meanwhile, the Feng Yao Bridge. As soon as she approached the gateway, she perceived Jue Ar coming along with Jia Yun from the opposite direction. While advancing, Jia Yun ogled Xiao Hong, and Xiao Hong too, though pretending to be addressing herself to Jue Ar, cast a glance at Jia Yun, and their four eyes, as luck would have it, met. Xiao Hong involuntarily blushed all over, and turning herself round, she walked off towards the Hangwu court. But we will leave her there without further remarks. During this time, Jia Yun followed Jue Ar by a circuitous way into the Yihong court. Jue Ar entered first and made the necessary announcement. Then, subsequently, she ushered in Jia Yun. When Jia Yun scrutinized the surroundings, he perceived, here and there, in the court, several blocks of rockery, among which were planted banana trees. On the opposite side were two storks preening their feathers under the fir trees. Under the covered passage were suspended, in a row, cages of every description, containing all sorts of fairy-like rare birds. In the upper part were five diminutive anterooms, uniformly carved with unique designs and above the framework of the door was hung a tablet with the inscription in four huge characters, Yi Hong Kuai Lu, the happy red and joyful green. I thought it strange, Jia Yun argued mentally, that it should be called the Yi Hong Court. But are these, in fact, the four characters inscribed on the tablet? 
But while he was communing within himself, he heard someone laugh and then exclaim from the inner side of the gauze window, Come in at once! How is it that I've forgotten you these two or three months? As soon as Zhao Yun recognized Bao Yu's voice, he entered the room with hurried step. On raising his head, his eye was attracted by the brilliant splendor emitted by gold and jade and by the dazzling luster of the elegant arrangements. He failed, however, to detect where Bao Yu was ensconced. The moment he turned his head round, he espied on the left side a large cheval glass, behind which appeared to view, standing side by side, two servant girls of fifteen or sixteen years of age. Master Secundus, they ventured, please take a seat in the inner room. Jia Yun could not even muster courage to look at them straight in the face, but promptly assenting, he walked into a green gauze mosquito house, where he saw a small lacquered bed hung with curtains of a deep red color, with clusters of flowers embroidered in gold. Bao Yu, wearing a house dress and slipshod shoes, was reclining on the bed, a book in hand. The moment he perceived Jia Yun walk in, he discarded his book and forthwith smiled and raised himself up. Jia Yun hurriedly pressed forward and paid his salutation. Bao Yu then offered him a seat, but he simply chose a chair in the lower part of the apartment. Ever since the moon in which I came across you, Bao Yu observed smilingly, and told you to come into the library, I've had, who would have thought it, endless things to continuously attend to so that I forgot all about you. It's I, indeed, who lacked good fortune, rejoined Jia Yun with a laugh, particularly so, as it happened again that you, uncle, fell ill. But are you quite right once more? All right, answered Bao Yu. I heard that you've been put to much trouble and inconvenience on a good number of days. Had I even had any trouble to bear, added Jia Yun, it would have been my duty to bear it. But your complete recovery, uncle, is really a blessing to our whole family. As he spoke, he discerned a couple of servant maids come to help him to a cup of tea. But while conversing with Bao Yu, Jia Yun was intent upon scrutinizing the girl with slim figure, an oval face, and clad in a silvery red jacket, a blue satin waistcoat, and a white silk petticoat with narrow pleats. At the time of Bao Yu's illness, Jia Yun had spent a couple of days in the inner apartments, so that he remembered half of the inmates of note, and the moment he set eyes upon this servant girl, he knew it was Shi Zhen, and that she was in Bao Yu's rooms on a different standing to the rest. Now, therefore, that she brought the tea in herself, and that Bao Yu was besides sitting by, he rose to his feet with alacrity and put on a smile. Sister, he said, how is it that you are pouring tea for me? I came here to pay uncle a visit. What's more, I'm no stranger, so let me pour it with my own hands. Just you sit down and finish, Bao Yu interposed. Will you also behave in this fashion with servant girls? In spite of what you say, remarked Jia Yun, smiling, they are young ladies attached to your rooms, uncle, and how could I presume to be disorderly in my conduct? So saying, he took a seat and drank his tea. Bao Yu then talked to him about trivial and irrelevant matters, and afterwards went on to tell him in whose household the actresses were best, and whose gardens were pretty. He further mentioned to him in whose quarters the servant girls were handsome, whose banquets were sumptuous, as well as in whose home were to be found strange things, and what family possessed remarkable objects. Jia Yun was constrained to humor him in this conversation, but after a chat which lasted for some time, he noticed that Bao Yu was somewhat listless, and he promptly stood up and took his leave. But Bao Yu too did not use too much pressure to detain him. Tomorrow, if you have nothing to do, do come over, he merely observed, after which he again bade the young waiting maid, Juayar, see him out. Having left the Yi Hong court, Jia Yun cast a glance all round, and realizing that there was no one about, he slackened his pace at once, and while proceeding leisurely, he conversed in a friendly way with Juayar on one thing and another. First and foremost, he inquired of her what was her age and her name. Of what standing are your father and mother, he said. 
How many years have you been in Uncle Bob's apartments? How much money do you get a month? In all, how many girls are there in Uncle Bob's rooms? As Joyar heard the question set to her, she readily made suitable reply to each. The one who was a while back talking to you, continued Jia Yun, is called Xiao Hong, isn't she? Yes, her name is Xiao Hong, replied Joyar, smiling. But why do you ask about her? She inquired of you just now, about some handkerchief or other, answered Jia Yun. Well, I've picked one up. Jr. greeted this response with a smile. Many are the times, she said, that she has asked me whether I had seen her handkerchief. But have I got all that leisure to worry my mind about such things? She spoke to me about it again today, and she suggested that I should find it for her, and that she would also recompense me. This she told me when we were just now at the entrance of the Hungu court, and you too, Mr. Secundus, overheard her, so that I'm not lying. But, dear Mr. Secundus, since you've picked it up, give it to me, do, and I'll see what she will give me as a reward. The truth is that Jia Yun had, the previous moon when he had come into the garden to attend to the planting of trees, picked up a handkerchief which he conjectured must have been dropped by some inmate of those grounds. But, as he was not aware whose it was, he did not consequently presume to act with indiscretion. But on this occasion, he overheard Xiao Hong make inquiry of Jue Er on the subject, and concluding that it must belong to her, he felt immeasurably delighted. Seeing besides how importunate Jue Er was, he at once devised a plan within himself, and vehemently producing from his sleeve a handkerchief of his own, he observed as he turned towards Jue Er with a smile, "'As for giving it to you, I'll do so,' but in the event of your obtaining any present from her, you mustn't impose on me. Joyar assented to his proposal most profusely, and taking the handkerchief, she saw Zhao Yun out and then came back in search of Xiao Hong. But we will leave her there for the present. We will now return to Bao Yu. After dismissing Zhao Yun, he laid in such complete listlessness on the bed that he betrayed every sign of being half asleep. Shi Ren walked up to him and seated herself on the edge of the bed, and pushing him, What are you about to go to sleep again? she said. Would it not do your languid spirits good if you went out for a bit of a stroll? Upon hearing her voice, Bao Yu grasped her hand in his. I would like to go out, he smiled. But I can't reconcile myself to the separation from you. Get up at once, laughed Shi Ren. And as she uttered these words, she pulled Bao Yu up. Where can I go? exclaimed Bao Yu. I'm quite surfeited with everything. Once out, you'll be all right, Shi Ren answered. But if you simply give way to this languor, you'll be more than ever sick of everything at heart. Bao Yu could not do otherwise, dull and out of sorts though he was, than accede to her importunities. Strolling leisurely out of the door of the room, he amused himself a little with the birds suspended under the veranda. Then he wended his steps outside the court and followed the course of the Xinfang stream. But after admiring the golden fish for a time, he espied, on the opposite hillock, two young deer come rushing down as swift as an arrow. What they were up to, Bao Yu could not discern. But while abandoning himself to melancholy, he caught sight of Jia Lan, following behind, with a small bow in his hand, and hurrying downhill in pursuit of them. As soon as he realized that Bao Yu stood ahead of him, he speedily halted. Uncle Secundus, he smiled, are you at home? I imagined you had gone out of doors. You were up to mischief again, eh? Bao Yu rejoined. They've done nothing to you, and why shoot at them with your arrows? I had no studies to attend to just now, so, being free with nothing to do, Jia Lan replied laughingly, I was practicing riding and archery. Shut up, exclaimed Bao Yu. When are you not engaged in practicing? End of section three. Recording by Sylvie Roth. Section 4 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sylvie Roth The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two, by Cao Shui Qin. Translated by Henry Bencraft Jolie. Chapter 26, Part 2. Saying this, he continued his way and straightway reached the entrance of a court. Here the bamboo foliage was thick, and the breeze sighed gently. This was the Shao Shang Lodge. Bao Yu listlessly rambled in. He saw a bamboo portier hanging down to the ground. Stillness prevailed. Not a human voice fell on the ear. He advanced as far as the window. Noticing that a whiff of subtle scent stole softly through the green gauze casement, Bao Yu applied his face closely against the frame to peep in, but suddenly he caught the faint sound of a deep sigh and the words, Day after day my feelings slumber drowsily. Upon overhearing this exclamation, Bao Yu unconsciously began to feel a prey to inward longings. But casting a second glance, he saw Dai Yu stretching herself on the bed. Why is it, smiled Bao Yu from outside the window, that your feelings day after day slumber drowsily? So saying, he raised the portier and stepped in. The consciousness that she had not been reticent about her feelings made Dai Yu unwittingly flush scarlet. Taking hold of her sleeve, she screened her face, and turning her body round towards the inside, she pretended to be fast asleep. Bayou drew near her. He was about to pull her round when he saw Dayu's nurse enter the apartment, followed by two matrons. Is Miss asleep? they said. If so, we'll ask her over when she wakes up. As these words were being spoken, Dayu eagerly twisted herself round and sat up. Who's asleep? she laughed. We thought you were fast asleep, miss, smiled the two or three matrons as soon as they perceived how you get up. This greeting over, they called Zhu Chuan. Your young mistress, they said, has awoke. Come in and wait on her. While calling her, they quitted the room in a body. Dayu remained seated on the bed. Raising her arms, she adjusted her hair and smilingly she observed to Yu. When people are asleep, what do you walk in for? At the sight of her half-closed star-like eyes and of her fragrant cheeks, suffused with a crimson blush, Bayou's feelings were of a sudden awakened, so bending his body he took a seat on a chair and asked with a smile, What were you saying a short while back? I wasn't saying anything, Dayu replied. What a lie you're trying to ram down my throat, laughed Bao Yu. I heard all. But in the middle of their colloquy, they saw Zhu Xuan enter. Bao Yu then put on a smiling face. Zhu Xuan, he cried, pour me a cup of your good tea. Where's the good tea to be had? Zhu Xuan answered. If you want good tea, you'd better wait till Xu Ren comes. Don't heed him, interposed Dai Yu. Just go first and draw me some water. He's a visitor, remonstrated Zhu Chuan, and of course I should first pour him a cup of tea and then go and draw the water. With this answer, she started to serve the tea. My dear girl, Bao Yu exclaimed laughingly, if I could only share the same bridal curtain with your lovable young mistress, would I ever be able to treat you as a servant by making you fold the covers and make the beds? Lin Dai Yu at once drooped her head. What are you saying? she remonstrated. What? Did I say anything? smiled Bao Yu. Dai Yu burst into tears. You've recently, she observed, got into a new way. Whatever slang you happen to hear outside, you come and tell me. And whenever you read any improper book, you poke your fun at me. What? Have I become a laughing stock for gentlemen? As she began to cry, she jumped down from the bed and promptly left the room. Bayou was at a loss how to act. So agitated was he that he hastily ran up to her. My dear cousin, he pleaded. I do deserve death. 
but don't go and tell anyone. If again I venture to utter such kind of language, my blisters grow on my mouth and may my tongue waste away. But while appealing to her feelings, he saw Shi Ren approach him. Go back at once, she cried, and put on your clothes as master wants to see you. At the very mention of his father, Bai Yu felt suddenly as if struck by lightning. Regardless of everything and anything, he rushed as fast as possible back to his room, and changing his clothes, he came out into the garden. Here he discovered Bei Ming, standing at the second gateway, waiting for him. Do you perchance know what he wants me for? Bai Yu inquired. Master, hurry out at once, Bei Ming replied. You must, of course, go and see him. When you get there, you are sure to find out what it's all about. This said, he urged Bao Yu on, and together they turned past the large pavilion. Bao Yu was, however, still laboring under suspicion when he heard from the corner of the wall a loud outburst of laughter. Upon turning his head round, he caught sight of Shui Pan jump out, clapping his hands. Hadn't I said that my uncle wanted you, he laughed, wouldn't you ever have rushed out with such alacrity? <laughs> Bei Ming also laughed and fell on his knees, but Bao Yu remained for a long time under the spell of utter astonishment, before he at length realized that it was Shui Pan who had inveigled him to come out. Shui Pan hastily made a salutation and a curtsy, and confessed his fault. He next gave way to entreaties, saying, Don't punish the young servant, for it is simply I who begged him go. Bao Yu too had then no other alternative but to smile. I don't mind your playing your larks on me, but why, he inquired, did you mention my father? Were I to go and tell my aunt, your mother, to see to the rights and the wrongs of the case, how would you like it? My dear cousin, remarked Shui Pan vehemently. The primary idea I had in view was to ask you to come out a moment sooner, and I forgot to respectfully shun the expression. But by and by, when you wish to chaff me, just you likewise allude to my father, and will thus be square. Ay ya exclaimed Bai Yu, you do more than ever deserve death. Then, turning again towards Bei Ming, you ruffian, he said, what are you still kneeling for? Bei Ming began to bump his head on the ground with vehemence. Had it been for anything else, Shui Pan chimed in, I wouldn't have made bold to disturb you, but it's simply in connection with my birthday, which is tomorrow, the third day of the fifth moon. Cheng Rushing, who is in that curio shop of ours, unexpectedly brought along goodness knows where he fished them from, fresh lotus so thick and so long, so mealy and so crisp, melons of this size and a Siamese porpoise, that long and that big, smoked with cedar, such as is sent as tribute from the kingdom of Siam. Are not these four presents, pray, rare delicacies? The porpoise is not only expensive, but difficult to get, and that kind of lotus and melon must have cost him no end of trouble to grow. I lost no time in presenting some to my mother, and at once sent some to your old grandmother and my aunt. But a good many of them still remain now, and were I to eat them all alone, it would, I fear, be more than I deserve. So I concluded, after thinking right and left, that there was, besides myself, only you good enough to partake of some. That is why I specially invite you to taste them. But, as luck would have it, a young singing boy has also come. So what do you say to you and I having a jolly day of it? As they talked, they walked. And as they walked, they reached the interior of the library. Here they discovered a whole assemblage consisting of Tan Quan, Chun Ri Xing, Hu Qi Lai, Dan Ting Jun, and others, and the singing boy as well. As soon as these saw Bao Yu walk in, some paid their respects to him, others inquired how he was, and after the interchange of salutations, tea was drunk. Shui Pan then gave orders to serve the wine. Scarcely were the words out of his mouth than the servant lads bustled and fussed for a long while laying the table. When at last the necessary arrangements had been completed, the company took their seats. Bao Yu verily found the melons and lotus of an exceptional description. 
My birthday presents have not as yet been set round, he felt impelled to say, a smile on his lips, and here I come, ahead of them, to trespass on your hospitality. Just so, retorted Shui Pan, but when you come tomorrow to congratulate me, we'll consider what novel kind of present you can give me. I've got nothing that I can give you, rejoined Pao Yu. As far as money, clothes, eatables, and other such articles go, they are not really mine. All I can call my own are such pages of characters that I may write, or pictures that I may draw. Your references to pictures, added Shui Pan, smiling, reminds me of a book I saw yesterday, containing immodest drawings. They were truly beautifully done. On the front page, there figured also a whole lot of characters, but I didn't carefully look at them. I simply noticed the name of the person who had executed them. It was, in fact, something or other like Kung Huang. The pictures were actually exceedingly good. This illusion made Bao Yu exercise his mind with innumerable conjectures. Of pictures drawn from past years to the present, I have, he said, seen a good many, but I've never come across any Kang Huang. After considerable thought, he could not repress himself from bursting out laughing. Then, asking a servant to fetch him a pencil, he wrote a couple of words on the palm of his hand. This done, he went on to inquire of Shui Pan. Did you see correctly that it read Kung Huang? How could I not have seen correctly? ejaculated Shui Pan. Bai Yu thereupon unclenched his hand and allowed him to peruse what was written on it. Were they possibly these two characters? he remarked. These are, in point of fact, not very dissimilar from what Kung Huang looked like. On scrutinizing them, the company noticed the two words Tang Yin, and they all laughed. They must, we fancy, have been these two characters, they cried. Your eyes, sir, may, there's no saying, have suddenly grown dim. Shui Pan felt utterly abashed. Who could have said, he smiled, whether they were Tang Yin or Guo Yin, candied silver or fruit silver? As he cracked this joke, however, a young page came and announced that Mr. Feng had arrived. Bao Yu concluded that the newcomer must be Feng Zuying, the son of Feng Tang, general with the prefix of Shan Wu. Ask him in at once, Shui Pan and his companions shouted with one voice. But barely were these words out of their mouths than they realized that Feng Zuying had already stepped in, talking and laughing as he approached. The company speedily rose from table and offered him a seat. That's right, smiled Feng Ying. You don't go out of doors, but remain at home and go in for high fun. Both Bai Yu and Shui Pan put on a smile. We haven't, they remarked, seen you for ever so long. Is your venerable father strong and hale? My father, rejoined Zi Ying, is, thanks to you, strong and hale. But my mother recently contracted a sudden chill and has been unwell for a couple of days. Shui Pan discerned on his face a slight bluish wound. With whom have you again been boxing, he laughingly inquired, that you've hung up this signboard. Since the occasion, laughed Feng Ying, on which I wounded Lieutenant Colonel Cho's son, I've borne the lesson in mind and never lost my temper. So how is it you say that I've again been boxing? This thing on my face was caused when I was out shooting the other day, on the Tie Wong Hills, by a flap from the wing of a falcon. When was that? asked Bao Yu. I started, explained Zhu Ying, on the 28th day of the third moon, and came back only the day before yesterday. It isn't to be wondered at, then, observed Bao Yu, that when I went the other day, on the third and fourth, to a banquet at friend Shun's house, I didn't see you there. Yet I meant to have inquired about you, but I don't know how it slipped from my memory. Did you go alone, or did your venerable father accompany you? Of course my father went, Zhu Ying replied, so I had no help but to go. For it is likely, forsooth, that I've gone mad from lack of anything to do. 
don't we, a goodly number as we are, derive enough pleasure from our wine-bouts and plays that I should go in quest of such kind of fatiguing recreation? But in this instance a great piece of good fortune turned up in evil fortune. Shui Pan and his companions noticed that he had finished his tea. Come along, they one and all proposed, and join the banquet. You can then quietly recount to us all your experiences. At this suggestion, Feng Zuying there and then rose to his feet. According to etiquette, he said, I should join you in drinking a few cups. But today I have still a very urgent matter to see my father about on my return, so that I truly cannot accept your invitation. Shui Pan, Bao Yu, and the other young fellows would on no account listen to his excuses. They pulled him vigorously about and would not let him go. This is indeed strange, laughed Feng Ziying. When have you and I had, during all these years, to have recourse to such proceedings? I really am unable to comply with your wishes. But if you do insist upon making me have a drink, well, then bring a large cup and I'll take two cups full and finish. After this rejoinder, the party could not but give in. Shui Pan took hold of the kettle, while Bao Yu grasped the cup, and they poured two large cups full. Feng Zuying stood up and quaffed them with one draught. But do, after all, urged Bao Yu, finish this thing about a piece of good fortune in the midst of misfortune before you go. To tell you this today, smiled Feng Zuying, will be no great fun. But for this purpose, I intend on standing a special entertainment and inviting you all to come and have a long chat. And in the second place, I've also got a favor to ask of you. Saying this, he pushed his way and was going off at once when Shui Pan interposed. What you've said, he observed, has put us more than ever on pins and needles. We cannot brook any delay. Who knows when you will ask us round, so better tell us and thus avoid keeping people in suspense. The latest, rejoined Feng Ziying, in ten days, the earliest in eight. With this answer, he went out of the door, mounted his horse, and took his departure. The party resumed their seats at table. They had another bout, and then eventually dispersed. Bao Yu returned into the garden in time to find Xi Ren thinking with solicitude that he had gone to see Jia Zheng and wonder whether it foreboded good or evil. As soon as she perceived Bao Yu come back in a drunken state, she felt urged to inquire the reason of it all. Bao Yu told her one by one the particulars of what happened. People, added Xi Ren, Wait for you with lacerated heart and anxious mind, and there you go and make merry. Yet you could very well, after all, have sent someone with a message. Didn't I purpose sending a message? exclaimed Bao Yu. Of course I did. But I failed to do so, as on the arrival of friend Feng I got so mixed up that the intention vanished entirely from my mind. While excusing himself, he saw Bao Chai enter the apartment. "'Have you tasted any of our new things?' she asked, a smile curling on her lips. "'Cousin!' laughed Bai Yu. "'You must have certainly tasted what you've got in your house long before us.' Bao Chai shook her head and smiled. "'Yesterday,' she said, "'my brother did actually make it a point to ask me to have some, but I had none. "'I told him to keep them and send them to others. "'So confident am I that with my mean lot and scanty blessings "'I little deserve to touch such dainties.' "'As she spoke, a servant girl poured her a cup of tea and brought it to her. "'While she sipped it, she carried on a conversation on irrelevant matters, "'which we need not notice, but turn our attention to Lin Dayu. "'The instant she heard that Jia Zheng had sent for Bao Yu, and that he had not come back during the whole day, she felt very distressed on his account. After supper, the news of Bao Yu's return reached her, and she keenly longed to see him and ask him what was up. Step by step she trudged along, while espying Bao Chai going into Bao Yu's garden. She herself followed close in her track. But on their arrival at the Xinfang Bridge, 
she caught sight of the various kinds of waterfowl bathing together in the pond, and although unable to discriminate the numerous species, her gaze became so transfixed by their respective variegated and bright plumage, and by their exceptional beauty, that she halted. And it was after she had spent some considerable time in admiring them that she repaired at last to the Ihong court. The gate was already closed. Dayu, however, lost no time in knocking. But Ching Wen and Bi Hun had, who would have thought it, been having a tiff, and were in a captious mood, so upon unaware of seeing Bao Chai step on the scene, Ching Wen had once visited her resentment upon Bao Chai. She was just standing in the court, giving vent to her wrongs, shouting, You're always running over and seating yourself here, whether you've got good reason for doing so or not, and there's no sleep for us at the third watch, middle of the night though it be. When, all of a sudden, she heard someone else calling at the door. Ching Wen was the more moved to anger. Without even asking who it was, she rapidly bawled out, They've all gone to sleep. You'd better come tomorrow. Lin Dayu was well aware of the natural peculiarities of the waiting maids, and of their habit of playing practical jokes upon each other, so fearing that the girl in the inner room had failed to recognize her voice, and had refused to open under the misconception that it was some other servant girl, she gave a second shout in a higher pitch. "'It's I!' she cried. "'Don't you yet open the gates?' Ching Wen, as it happened, did not still distinguish her voice, and in an irritable strain she rejoined, It's no matter who you may be, Mr. Segundus has given orders that no one at all should be allowed to come in. As these words reached Lindayu's ear, she unwittingly was overcome with indignation at being left standing outside. But when, on the point of raising her voice to ask her one or two things, or to start a quarrel with her, Albeit, she again argued mentally, I can call this my aunt's house, and it should be just as if it were my own. It's, after all, a strange place, and now that my father and mother are both dead, and that I am left with no one to rely upon, I have for the present to depend upon my family for a home. Were I now to therefore give way to a regular fit of anger with her, I'd really get no good out of it. While indulging in reflection, tears trickled from her eyes. But just as she was feeling unable to retrace her steps, and unable to remain standing any longer, and quite at a loss what to do, she overheard the sound of jocular language inside, and listening carefully, she discovered that it was indeed Bao Yu and Bao Chai. Lin Da Yu waxed more wroth. After much thought and cogitation, the incidents of the morning flashed unawares through her memory. It must, in fact, she mused, be because Bao Yu is angry with me for having explained to him the true reasons. But why did I ever go and tell you? You should, however, have made inquiries before you lost your tempers to such an extent with me as to refuse to let me in today. But is it likely that we shall not by and by meet face to face again? The more she gave way to thought, the more she felt wounded and agitated, and without heeding the moss, laden with cold dew, the path covered with vegetation and the chilly blasts of wind, she lingered all alone, under the shadow of the bushes at the corner of the wall, so thoroughly sad and dejected that she broke forth into sobs. Lin Dayu was, indeed, endowed with exceptional beauty, and with charms rarely met with in the world. As soon, therefore, as she suddenly melted into tears, and the birds and rooks roosting on the neighboring willow boughs and branches of shrubs caught the sound of her plaintive tones, they one and all fell into a most terrific flutter, and taking to their wings, they flew away to distant recesses, so little were they able to listen with equanimity to such accents. But the spirits of the flowers were, at the time, silent and devoid of feeling. The birds were plunged in dreams and in a state of stupor, so why did they start? A stanza appositely assigns the reason. Pinar's mental talents and looks must in the world be rare. Alone, clasped in a subtle smell, she quits her maiden room. The sound of but one single sob scarcely dies away and drooping flowers cover the ground and birds fly in dismay. 
Lin Dayu was sobbing in her solitude when a creaking noise struck her ear, and the door of the court was flung open. Who came out is not yet ascertained, but, reader, should you wish to know, the next chapter will explain. End of section four. Recording by Sylvie Roth. Section five of the Dream of the Red Chamber, book two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dream of the Red Chamber. Book Two, by Chao Shujin, translated by Henry Bancroft Jolie, Chapter Twenty Seven, Part One. In the Ditui Pavilion, Bao Chai diverts herself with the multicolored butterflies. Over the mound where the flowers had been interred, Da Yu bewails their withered blue. Lin Da Yu. We must explain in taking up the thread of our narrative, was disconsolately bathed in tears, when her ear was suddenly attracted by the creak of the court gate, and her eyes by the appearance of Bao Chai beyond the threshold. Bao Yu, Zi Ren, and a whole posse of inmates then walked out. She felt inclined to go up to Bao Yu and ask him a question, but dreading that if she made any inquiries in the presence of such a company, Bao Yu would be put to the blush and placed in an awkward position. She slipped aside and allowed Bao Chai to prosecute her way, and it was only Bao Yu and the rest of the party had entered and closed the gate behind them that she at last issued from her retreat. Then, fixing her gaze steadfastly on the gateway, she dropped a few tears. But inwardly conscious of their utter futility, she retraced her footsteps and wended her way back into her apartment. And with heavy heart and despondent spirits, she divested herself of the remainder of her habiliments. Ji Jun and Xu Yan were well aware, from the experience they had reaped in past days, that Lin Da Yu was in the absence of anything to occupy her mind, prone to sit and mop, and that if she did not frown her eyebrows, she anyway heaved deep sighs. But they were quite at a loss to divine why she was, with no rhyme or reason, ever so ready to indulge to herself in inexhaustible gushes of tears. At first, there were such as still endeavoured to afford her solace, or who, suspecting lest she brooded over the memory of her father and mother, felt homesick or aggrieved through some offence given her, tried by every persuasion to console and cheer her. But as contrary to all expectations, she subsequently persisted time and again in this dull mood. Through each succeeding month and year, people got accustomed to her eccentricities and did not extend to her the least sympathy. Hence it was that no one, on this occasion, troubled her mind about her, but letting her sit and sulk to her heart's content. They one and all turned in and went to sleep. Lin Dayu leaned against the railing of the bed, clasping her knees with both hands, her eyes suffused with tears. She looked, in very truth, like a carved wooden image or one fashioned of mud. There she sat straight up, to the second watch, even later when she eventually fell asleep. The whole night nothing remarkable transpired. The morrow was the 26th day of the fourth month. Indeed, on this day at 1 p.m. commenced the season of the sprouting seeds, and according to an old custom, on the day on which this feast of sprouting seeds fell, everyone had to lay all kinds of offering and sacrificial viands on the altar of the god of flowers. Soon after the expiry of this season of sprouting seeds follows summer tide. And all plants in general then wither and the gods of flowers resigns his throne. It is compulsory to feast him at some entertainment previous to his departure. 
In the ladies' apartments, this custom was observed with still more rigor, and for this reason, the various inmates of the park of Broad Vista had, without a single exception, got up at an early hour. The young people either twisted flowers and willow twigs in such a way as to represent chairs and horses or make tufted banners with damask, brocaded gauze and silk, and bound them with variegated threads. These articles of decorations were alike attached on every tree and plant, and throughout the whole expanse of the park, embroidered sashes waved to and fro, and ornamented branches nodded their heads about. In addition to this, the members of the family were clad in such fineries that they put the peach tree to shame, made the almond yield the palm, the swallow envious, and the hawk to blush. We could not therefore exhaustively describe them within our limited space of time. Bao Chai, Ying Chun, Tan Chun, Si Chun, Li Wan, Lady Feng, and other girls, as well as Da Jie Er, Xiang Ling, and the waiting maids, were one and all, we will now notice, in the garden enjoying themselves. The only person who could not be seen was Lin Da Yu. How is it? Consequently, inquired Yin Chun, that I don't see Cousin Lin. What a lazy girl. Is she forsooth fast asleep even at this late hour of the day? We all of you here, rejoined Bao Chai, and I will go and shake her up and bring her. With these words, she speedily left her companions and repaired straightway into the Xiaoxiang Lodge. While she was going on her errand, she met Wen Gun and the rest of the girls, twelve in all, on their way to seek the party. Drawing near, they inquired after her health. After exchanging a few commonplace remarks, Bao Chai turned round and pointing, said, You will find them all in there. You had better go and join them. As for me, I am going to fetch Miss Lin. But I will be back soon. Saying this, she followed the winding path, then came to the Xiaoxiang Lodge. Upon suddenly raising her eyes, she saw Bao Yu walk in. Bao Chai immediately halted, and lowering her head, she gave way to meditation for a time. Bao Yu and Lin Dai Yu, she reflected, have grown up together from their very infancy. But cousins, though they be, there are many instances in which they cannot evade suspicion, for they joke without heeding propriety, and at one time they are friends, and at another at daggers drawn. Tai Yu has, moreover, always been full of envy, and has ever displayed a peevish disposition. So were I to follow him in at this juncture, why, Bao Yu would, in the first place, not feel at ease, and in the second, Tai Yu would give way to jealousy. Better, therefore, for me to turn back. At the close of this train of thought, she retraced her steps, but just as she was starting to join her other cousins, she unexpectedly decried. Ahead of her, a pair of jade-colored butterflies of the size of a circular fan. Now they soared high, now they make a swoop down in their flight against the breeze, much to her amusement. Bao Chai felt a wish to catch them for mere fun's sake, so producing a fan from inside her sleeve, she descended on to the turfed ground to flap them with it. The two butterflies suddenly were seen to rise, suddenly to drop, sometimes to come, and others to go, just as they were on the point of flying across the stream to the other side. The enticement proved too much for Bao Chai, and she pursued them on tiptoe straight up to the Di Tui pavilion, nesting on the bank of the pond while fragrant perspiration dripped drop by drop and her sweet breath panted gently. But Bao Chai abandoned the idea of catching them and was about to beat a retreat when all at once she overheard in the pavilion the chatter of people engaged in conversation. This pavilion had, it must be added, a veranda and six sack balustrades running all round. It was erected over the water in the center of a point, and had on the four sides window frames of carved woodwork, stuck with paper. So when Bao Chai caught 
from without the pavilion, the sound of voices, she at once stood still and lent an attentive ear to what was being said. Look at this handkerchief, she overheard. If it's really the one you've lost, well then keep it. But if it isn't, you must return it to Mr. Yuan. To be sure, it is my own, another party observed. Bring it along and give it to me. What reward will you give me? She further heard. Is it likely that I've searched all for nothing? I've long ago promised to recompense you, and of course I won't play you false. Someone again rejoined. I found it and brought it round, also reached her ear, and you naturally will recompensate me. But won't you give anything to the person who picked it up? Don't talk nonsense, the other party added. He belongs to a family of gentlemen, and anything of ours he may pick up is his bounden duty to restore to us. What reward could you have me give him? If you don't reward him, she heard someone continue, what will I be able to tell him? Besides, he enjoined me time after time that if there was to be no recompense, I was not to give it to you. A short pause ensued. Never mind, then came out again to her. Take these things of mine and present it to him, and have done. But do you mean to let the cat out of the bag with anyone else? You should take some oath. If I tell anyone, she likewise overheard. May an ulcer grow on my mouth, and may I, in course of time, die an unnatural death. Ah, yeah, was the reply she heard. Our minds are merely bent upon talking, but someone might come and quietly listen from outside. Wouldn't it be as well to push all the Venetians open? Anyone seeing us in here will then imagine that we are simply chatting about nonsense. Besides, should they approach, we shall be able to observe them and at once stop our conversation. Pao Chai listened to these words from outside, with a heart full of astonishment. How can one wonder, she argued mentally, if all those lewd and dishonest people who have lived from olden times to the present have devised such thorough artifices? But were they now to open and see me here, won't they feel ashamed? Moreover, the voice in which those remarks were uttered resembles very much that of Honora attached to Bao Yu's rooms, who has all along shown a sharp eye and a shrewd mind. She is an artful and perverse thing of the first class, and as I have now overheard her peccadilloes, and a person in despair rebels as sure as a dog in distress jumps over the wall. Not only will trouble arise, but I too shall derive no benefit. It would be better at present, therefore, for me to lose no time in retiring. But as I fear, I may be in time to get out of the way. The only alternative for me is to make use of some art like that of the cicada, which can divert itself of its exuvi. She had scarcely brought her reflections to a close before a sound of Gaji reached her ears. Bao Chai purposely hastened to treat with heavy step. Ping Er, I see where you are hiding, she cried out laughingly, and as she shouted, she pretended to be running ahead in pursuit of her. As soon as Xiao Hong and Zhe Er pushed the windows open from inside the pavilion, they heard Bao Chai screaming while rushing forward, and both fell into a state of trepidation from the fright they sustained. Bao Chai turned round and faced them. Where have you been hiding Miss Lin? she smiled. We have seen anything of Miss Lin, retorted Zhe Er. I was just now, proceeded Bao Chai, on that side of the pool, and discerned Mr. Lin squatting down over there and playing with the water. I managed to have gently given her a start, but scarcely had I walked up to her when she saw me, and with a detour towards the east, she at once vanished from sight. So mayn't she be concealing herself in there? As she spoke, she designedly stepped in and searched about for her. This over, she betook herself away, adding, She's certain to have got again into that cave in the hill, and come across a snake, which must have bitten her and put an end to her. So saying, she distanced them, feeling again very much amused. I have managed, she thought, 
to ward off this piece of business. But I wonder what those two think about it. Xiao Hong, who would have anticipated, readily credited as gospel the remarks she heard Bao Chai make. But allowing just time enough to Bao Chai to got to a certain distance, she instantly drew chair to her. Dreadful, she observed. Miss Lin was squatting in here and must for certainty have overheard what we said before she left. Obed Chair listened to her words. She kept her own counsel for a long time. What's to be done? Xiao Hong consequently exclaimed. Even supposing she did overhear what we said, rejoined Chair by way of answer, why should she meddle in what does not concern her? Everyone should mind her own business. Had it been Miss Bao, it would not have mattered, remarked Xiao Hong. But Miss Lin delights in telling mean things of people, and is besides so petty minded Should she have heard and anything perchance comes to light, what will we do? During their colloquy, they noticed Wen Guan, Xiang Ling, Xi Chi, Xi Shu, and the other girls enter the pavilion. So they were compelled to drop the conversation and to play and laugh with them. They then espied Lady Feng standing on the top of the hillock, waving her hand, beckoning to Xiao Hong. Hurriedly, therefore, leaving the company, she ran up to Lady Feng and with a smile heaped upon smile. My lady, she inquired, what is it that you want? Lady Feng scrutinized her for a time, observing how spruce and pretty she was in looks and how genial in her speech. She felt prompted to give her a smile. My own waiting maid, she said, hasn't followed me in here today, and as I've just this moment bethought myself of something and would like to send someone on an errand, I wonder whether you're fit to undertake the charge and deliver a message faithfully. Don't hesitate in entrusting me with any message you may have to send, replied Xiao Hong with a laugh. I'll readily go and deliver it. Should I not do so faithfully, and blunder in fulfilling your business, my lady, you may visit me with any punishment your ladyship may please, and I'll have nothing to say. What young lady's servant are you? smiled Lady Feng. Tell me, so that when she comes back after I've sent you out and looks for you, I may be able to tell her about you. I'm attached to our master Secundus, Mr. Bao's rooms, answered Xiao Hong. Ah, yeah ejaculated Lady Feng as soon as she heard these words. Are you really in Bao Yu's rooms? How strange. Yet it comes to the same thing. Well, if he asks for you, I'll tell him where you are. Go now to our house and tell your sister Ping that she will find on the table in the outer apartment and under the stand with the plate from the Lu Kiln a bundle of silver that it contains the 120 tails for the embroiderer's wages, and that when Zhang Chai's wife comes, the money should be handed to her to take away. After having been weighed in her presence and been given to her to tally. Another thing too I want, in the inner apartment and at the head of the bed, you will find a small purse. Bring it along to me. Xiao Hong listened to her orders and then started to carry them out. On her return in a short while, she discovered that Lady Feng was not on the hillock, but perceiving Si Qi egress from the cave and stand still to tie her petticoat. She walked up to her. Sister, do you know where our Lady Secunda is gone to? She asked. I didn't notice, rejoined Si Qi. At this reply, Xiao Hong turned around and cast a glance on all four quarters, seeing Tan Chen and Bao Chai, standing by the bank of the pond, on the opposite side and looking at the fish. Xiao Hong advanced up to them. Young ladies, she said, straining a smile. Do you perchance have any idea where our Lady Secunda is gone to now? Go into your senior lady's court and look for her. Tan Chun answered. Hearing this, Xiao Hong was proceeding immediately towards the Daoshang village when she caught sight just ahead of her of Qing Wen, Qi Xia, Bi Hen, Qiu Wen, She Yu, Xi Shu, Yu Hua, 
Ying Er, and some other girls coming towards her in a group. The moment Ching Wen saw Xiao Hong, she called out to her, Are you going clean off your head? she exclaimed. You don't water the flowers, nor feed the birds, or prepare the tea stove, but get about outside. Yesterday, replied Xiao Hong, Mr. Secundus told me that there was no need for me to water the flowers today, that it was enough if they were watered every other day. As for the birds, you are still in the arms of Morpheus, sister, when I give them their food. And what about the tea stove? Interposed Bi Hen. Today, retorted Xiao Hong, it's not my turn on duty, so don't ask me whether there'll be any tea or not. Did you listen to that mouth of hers? cried Qi Xia. But don't you girls speak to her? Let her stroll about and have done. You'd better all go and ask whether I've been getting about or not, continued Xiao Hong. Our Lady Secunda has just bidden me go and deliver a message and fetch something. Saying this, she raised the purse and let them see it. And they, finding they could hit upon nothing more to taunt her with, trudged along onwards. Ching Wen smiled a sarcastic smile. How funny, she cried. Lo, she climbs up a high branch and doesn't condescend to look at any one of us. All she told her must have been just some word or two. Who knows? But is it likely that Our Lady has the least notion of her name or surname that she rides such a high horse and behaves in this manner? What credit is it in having been sent on a trifling errand like this? Will we, by and by, pray, hear anything more about you? If you've got any gumption, you'd better scatter it all out of this garden this very day. For, mind, it's only if you manage to hold your lofty perch for any length of time that you can be thought something of. As she derided her, she continued on her way. During this while, Xiao Hong listened to her, but as she did not find it a suitable moment to retaliate, she felt constrained to suppress her resentment and go in search of Lady Feng. End of section 5section six of the dream of the red chamber book two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the dream of the red chamber book two by Chiao xu ching translated by henry bancraft jolie chapter twenty seven part two on her arrival at Widow Lee's quarters, she, in point of fact, discovered Lady Feng seated inside with her having a chat. Xiao Hong approached her and made her report. Sister Ping says, she observed, that as soon as your ladyship left the house, she put the money by and that when Zhang Chai's wife went in a little time to fetch it, she had it weighed in her presence, after which she gave it to her to take away. With these words, she produced the purse and presented it to her. Sister Ping bade me come and tell your ladyship, she added, continuing, that Wang Er came just now to crave your orders as to who are the parties from whom he has to go and collect interest on money due. And Sister Ping explained to him what your wishes were and sent him off. How could she tell him where I wanted him to go? Lady Feng laughed. Sister Ping says, Xiao Hong proceeded, that Our Lady presents her compliments to Your Ladyship, Widow Li, here, to Lady Feng, that Our Master Secundus has in fact not come home, and that albeit a delay of a day or two will take place in the collection of the money, Your Ladyship should, she begs, set your mind at ease. To Li Wen, that when Lady Quinter is somewhat better, Our Lady will let Lady Quinter know and come along with her to see your ladyship. To Lady Feng, that Lady Quinta sent a servant the day before yesterday to come over and say that Our Lady, your worthy maternal aunt, had dispatched a letter to inquire after your ladyship's health, that she also wished to ask you, my lady, her worthy niece, in here, for a couple of 
long life, great efficacy, full of every word, pills, and that if you have any, they should, when Our Lady bids a servant come over, be simply given her to bring to Our Lady here, and that anyone bound tomorrow for that side could then deliver them on her way to her ladyship, your aunt yonder, to take along with her. Ay yo yo, exclaimed Widow Lee, before the close of the message. It's impossible for me to make out what you are driving at. What a heap of ladyships and misters. It's not to be wondered at that you can't make them out, interposed Lady Fong laughing. Why, her remarks refer to four or five distinct families. While speaking, she again faced Xiao Hong. My dear girl, she smiled, what a trouble you've been put to. But you speak decently, and unlike the others who keep on buzz, 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 like mosquitoes, you are not aware, sister-in-law, that I actually dread uttering a word to any of the girls outside the few servant girls and matrons in my own immediate service, for they invariably spin out what could be condensed in a single phrase into a long, interminable yarn, and they munch and chew their words, and sticking to a peculiar draw, they groan and moan, so much so that they exasperate me till I fly into a regular rage. Yet how are they to know that our painter too was once like them? But when I ask her, must you forsooth imitate the humming of a mosquito in order to be accounted a handsome girl? And spoke to her on several occasions. She at length improved considerably. What a good thing it would be, laughed Li Gong Chai if they could all be as smart as you are. The girl is first rate, rejoined Lady Feng. She just now delivered two messages. They didn't, I admit, amount to much, yet to listen to her, she spoke to the point. Tomorrow, she continued, addressing herself to Xiao Hong smilingly, come and wait on me, and I'll acknowledge you as my daughter, and the moment you come under my control, you'll readily improve. At this news, Xiao Hong spurred out laughing aloud. What are you laughing for? Lady Feng inquired. You must say to yourself that I am young in years and that how much older can I be than yourself to become your mother? But are you under the influence of a spring dream? Go and ask all those people older than yourself. They would be only too ready to call me mother. But snapping my fingers at them, I today exalt you. I wasn't laughing about that, Xiao Hong answered with a smiling face. I was amused by the mistake your ladyship made about our generations. Why, my mother claims to be your daughter, my lady, and are you now going to recognize me too as your daughter? Who's your mother? Lady Feng exclaimed. Don't you actually know her? Put in Li Gong Chai with a smile. She's Lin Qi Xiao's child. This disclosure greatly surprised Lady Feng. What? She consequently cried. Is she really his daughter? Why, Lin Chi Xiaos and his wife, she resumed smilingly, couldn't either of them utter a sound even they were pricked with an O? I've always maintained that they are a well-suited couple, as the one is as deaf as a post and the other as dumb as a mute. But who would ever have expected them to have such a clever girl? But how much are you in your teens? I am seventeen, replied Xiao Hong. What is your name? she went on to ask. My name was once Hong Yu, Xiao Hong rejoined. But as it was a duplicate of that of Master Secondus, Mr. Bao Yu, I am now simply called Xiao Hong. Upon hearing this explanation, Lady Feng raised her eyebrows into a frown, and turning her head round, it's most disgusting, she remarked. Those bearing the name Yu would seem to be very cheap. For your name is Yu, and so is also my Yu, sister-in-law. She then observed, I never let you know anything about it, but I mentioned to her mother that Lai Da's wife has at present her hands quite full, and that she hasn't either any notion as to who is who in this mansion, you had better, I said, carefully select a couple of girls for my service. She assented unreservedly, but she put it off and never chose any. On the contrary, she sent this girl to some other place. But is it likely that she wouldn't have been well off with me? 
Here you are again, full of suspicion. Li Wen laughed. She came in here long before you ever breathed a word to her. So how could you bear a grudge against her mother? Well, in that case, added Lady Feng, I will speak to Bao Yu tomorrow, and induce him to find another one and to allow this girl to come along with me. I wonder, however, whether she herself is willing or not. Whether willing or not, interposed Xia Hong, smiling such as we couldn't really presume to raise our voices and object. We should feel it our privilege to serve such a one as your ladyship, and learn a little how to discriminate when people raise or drop their eyebrows and eyes, with pleasure or displeasure, and reap as well some experience in such matters as go out or come in, whether high or low, great and small. But during her reply, she perceived Madame Wang's waiting maid come and invite Lady Feng to go over. Lady Feng bade goodbye at once to Li Kung Chai and took her departure. Xiao Hong then returned into the Yi Hong court, where we will leave her and devote our attention for the present to Lin Dai Yu. As she had had but little sleep in the night, she got up the next day at a late hour. When she heard that all her cousins were collected in the park, giving a farewell entertainment for the god of flowers, she hastened, for fear people should laugh at her for being lazy, to comb her hair, perform her ablutions, and go out and join them. As soon as she reached the interior of the court, she caught sight of Bao Yu entering the door, who speedily greeted her with a smile. My dear cousin, he said, did you lodge a complaint against me yesterday? I've been on pins and needles the whole night long. Tai Yu forthwith turned her head away. Put the room in order, she shouted to Ji Quan, and lower one of the gauze window frames. And when you've seen the swallows come back, drop the curtain. Keep it down then by placing the lion on it. And after you have burnt the incense, mind you cover the censer. So saying, she stepped outside. Bao Yu, perceiving her manner, concluded again that it must be on account of the incident of the previous noon. But how could he have had any idea about what had happened in the evening? He kept on still bowing and curtsying, but Lin Da Yu did not even so much as look at him straight in the face, but egressing along out of the door of the court. She proceeded there and then in search of the other girls. Bao Yu fell into a despondent mood and gave way to conjectures. Judging, he reflected, from this behavior of hers, it would seem as if it could not be for what transpired yesterday. Yesterday too, I came back late in the evening, and what's more, I didn't see her, so that there was no occasion on which I could have given her offense. As he indulged in these reflections, he involuntarily followed in her footsteps to try and catch her up. When he described Bao Chai and Tan Chen on the opposite side, watching the frolics of the stocks. As soon as they saw Da Yu approach, the trio stood together and started a friendly chat. But noticing Bao Yu also come up, Tan Chen smiled. Brother Bao, she said, are you all right? It's just three days that I haven't seen anything of you. Are your sister quite well? Bao Yu rejoined, a smile on his lips. The other day I asked news of you of our senior sister-in-law. Brother Bao, Tan Chun remarked, Come over here, I want to tell you something. The moment Bao Yu heard this, he quickly went with her, distancing Bao Chai and Da Yu. The two of them came under a pomegranate tree. As father sent for you these last few days, Tan Chun then asked, he hasn't, Bao Yu answered laughingly by way of reply. Yesterday, proceeded Tan Chun, I heard vaguely something or other about father sending for you to go out. I presume, Bao Yu smiled, that someone must have heard wrong, for he never sent for me. I've again managed to save during the last few months, added Tan Chun, with another smile, fully ten thousand. So take them and bring me, when at any time you stroll out of doors either some fine writings or some ingenious knick-knack. Much as I have roamed inside and outside the city walls, answered Bao Yu, and seen grand establishments and large temples, 
I've never come across anything novel or pretty. One simply sees articles made of gold, jade, copper, and porcelain, as well as such curios for which we could find no place here. Besides this, there are satins, edibles, and wearing apparel. Who cares for such baubles? exclaims Tan Chun. How could they come up to what you purchased the last time? That wee basket, made of willow twigs, that sandbox scooped out of a root of real bamboo, that portable stove fashioned of glutinous clay, these things were oh so very nice. I was as fond of them as I don't know what, but would have thought it. They fell in love with them and bundled them all off just as if they were precious things. Is it things of this kind that you really want? laughed Pao Yu. Why, these are worth nothing. Were you to take a hundred cash and give them to the servant boys, they could, I'm sure, bring two cartloads of them. What do the servant's boys know? Tan Chun replied. Those you chose for me were plain yet not commonplace. Neither were they of course made. So, were you to procure me as many as you can get of them, I'll work you a pair of slippers like those I gave you last time and spend twice as much trouble over them as I did over that pair you have. Now, what do you say to this bargain? Your reference to this, smile Pao Yu, reminds me of an old incident. One day I had them on, and by a strange coincidence, I met father, whose fancy they did not take, and he inquired who had worked them. But how could I muster up courage to allude to the three words, my sister Tercia? So I answered that, my maternal aunt had given them to me on the recent occasion of my birthday. When father heard that they had been given to me by my aunt, he could not very well say anything. But after a while, why uselessly waste, he observed, human labor and throw away silks to make things of this sort. On my return, I told Jirian about it. Never mind, said Jirian, but Mrs. Chow got angry. Her own brother, she murmured indignantly, wears slipshod shoes and socks in holes, and there's no one to look after him. And does she go and wear all these things? Tan Chen, hearing this, immediately lowered her face. Now tell me, aren't these words utter rot? She shouted. What am I that I have to make shoes? And is it likely that Huang Er hasn't his own share of things? Clothes are clothes, and shoes and socks are shoes and socks. And how is it that any grudges arise in the room of a mere servant girl and old matron? For whose benefit does she come out with all these things? I simply work a pair, or part of a pair, when I am at leisure, with time on my hands. And I can give them to any brother, elder or younger, I fancy. And who has a right to interfere with me? This is just another bit of blind anger. After listening to her, Bao Yu nodded his head and smiled. Yet, he said, you don't know what her motives may be. It's but natural that she should also cherish some expectations. This apology incensed Tan Chun more than ever, and twisting her head round, even you have grown dull, she cried. She does, of course, indulge in expectations, but they are actuated by some underhand and paltry notion. She may go on giving way to these ideas, but I, for my part, we only care for Mr. Jia Chen and Madame Wang. I won't care a rap for anyone else. In fact, I will be nice with such of my sisters and brothers as are nice to me, and won't even draw any distinction between those born of primary wives and those of secondary ones. Properly speaking, I shouldn't say these things about her, but she's narrow-minded to a degree, and unlike what she should be, there's besides another ridiculous thing. This took place the last time I gave you the money to get me those trifles. Well, two days after that, she saw me, and she began again to represent that she had no money and that she was hard up. Nevertheless, I did not worry my brain with her goings on. But as it happened, the seven girls subsequently quitted the room, and she at once started finding fault with me. Why, she asked. Do I give you my savings to spend, and don't, after all, let Huang'er have them and enjoy them? 
When I heard these reproaches, I felt both inclined to laugh and also disposed to lose my temper, but I there and then scattered out of her quarters and went over to our maiden Wong. As she was recounting this incident, well, she overheard Pao Chai sarcastically observed from the opposite direction. Have you done spinning your yarns? If you have, come along. It is quite evident that you are brother and sister, for here you leave everyone else and go and discuss your own private matters. Couldn't we two listen to a single sentence of what you have to say? While she taunted them, Tang Chen and Bao Yu eventually drew near her with smiling faces. Bao Yu, however, failed to see Lin Dai Yu, and he concluded that she had dodged out of the way and gone elsewhere. It would be better, he muttered, after some thought, that I should let two days elapse and give her temper time to evaporate before I go to her. But as he drooped his head, his eyes was attracted by a heap of touch-me-nots, pomegranate blossom, and various kinds of fallen flowers, which covered the ground thick as tapestry. And he heaved a sigh. It's because, he pondered, she's angry that she did not remove these flowers. But I will take them over to the place, and by and by ask her about them. As he argued to himself, he heard Pao Chai bid them go out. I will join you in a moment, Pao Yu replied, and waiting till his two cousins had gone some distance, he bundled the flower into his coat and ascending the hill. He crossed the stream, penetrated into the arbor, passed through the avenues with flowers and wended his way straight for the spot where he had, on a previous occasion, interred the peach blossoms with the assistance of Lin Dai Yu, but scarcely had he reached the mound containing the flowers, and before he had, as yet, rounded the brow of the hill, that he caught, emanating from the offside, the sound of someone sobbing, who, while giving way to invective, wept in a most heart-rending way. I wonder, soliloquized Bao Yu, whose servant girl this is, who has been so aggrieved as to run over here to have a good cry. While speculating within himself, he halted, he then heard mingled with wells. Flowers wither and decay, and flowers do fleet. They fly all over the skies. Their bloom wanes, their smell dies, but who is there with them to sympathize? While vagrant gossamer soft doth on fluttering springs bowers bind its coils, and drooping catkins lightly strike and cling on the embroidered screens. A maiden in the inner rooms I saw deployed the clothes of spring. Such ceaseless sorrow fills my breast, that solace nowhere can I find. Past the embroidered screen I issue forth, taking with me a hole, and on the faded flowers to treat I needs must, as I come and go. The willow fibers and elm seeds have each a fragrance of their own. What care I? Peach blossom may fall, pear flowers away be blown. Yet peach and pear will, when next year returns, burst out again in bloom. But can it ever be told who will next year dwell in the inner room? What time the third moon comes? The scent nests have been already built, and on the beams the swallows perch, excessive spiritless and stayed. Next year, when the flowers bud, they may, it's true, have ample to feed on, but they know not that when I'm gone, beams will be vacant and nests fall. In a whole year, which doth consist of 360 days, winds sharp as swords, and frost light unto spears each other rigorous press. So that how long can last their beauty bright, their fresh charm how long stays? Sudden they droop and fly, and with her they have flown. This has to guess. Flowers, while in bloom, easy the eye attracts, but when they with her, hard they are to find. Now by the footsteps I bury the flowers, but sorrow will slay me. Alone I stand, and as I clutch the hole, silent tears trickle down, and drip on the bare twigs, leaving behind them 
the traces of blood. The gold sucker hath sung his song, the shades lower of eventide. So with the lotus hole I return home, and shut the double doors. Upon the wall the green lamp sheds its rays just as I go to sleep. The cover is yet cold, against the window patters the bleak rain. How strange! Why can I ever be that I feel so wounded at heart? Partly because spring I regret, partly because with spring I'm vexed. Regret for spring because it sudden comes, vexed for it sudden goes. For without warning, lo, it comes, and without asking, it doth fleet. Yesterday night, outside the hall, sorrowful songs burst from my mouth. For I found out that flowers decay, and that birds also pass away. The soul of flowers and the spirit of birds are both hard to restrain. Birds to themselves were left, in silence plunge, and flowers alone they blush. Oh, would that on my sides a pair of wings could grow, that to the end of heaven I may fly in the wake of flowers. Yea, to the very end of heaven, where I could find a fragrant grave. For better is it not, that an embroidered bag should hold my well-shaped bones, and that a heap of stingless earth should in its folds my winsome charms enshroud. For spotless once my frame did come, and spotless again it will go. Far better than that I, like filthy mire, should sink into some drain. Ye flowers are now faded and gone, and lo, I come to bury you. But as for me, what day I shall see death is not as yet divined. Here I am fain these flowers to inter, but humankind would laugh me as a fool. Who knows, who will, in years to come, commit me to my grave? Mark, and you will find the close of spring, and the gradual decay of flowers. Resemble faithfully the time of death of maidens ripe in years. In a twinkle, springtime draws to a close, and maidens wax in age. Flowers fade and maidens die, and of either not any more is known. After listening to these effusions, Bao Yu unconsciously threw himself down in a wandering frame of mind. But, reader, do you feel any interest in him? If you do, the subsequent chapter contains further details about him. End of section 6section 7 of the dream of the red chamber book 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the dream of the red chamber book 2 by chao shu ching translated by henry bancroft jolie chapter 28 part 1 jiang yu han lovingly presents a rubia scented silk sash. She Pao Chai blushingly covers her musk-perfumed string of red beads. Lin Dai Yu, the story goes, dwell after Ching Wen's refusal the previous night to open the door, under the impression that the blame lay with Pao Yu. The following day, which by another remarkable coincidence, happened to correspond with the season, when the god of flowers had to be feasted. The total ignorance of the true circumstances and the resentment as yet unspent, aroused again in her despondent thoughts, suggested by the decline of springtime, she consequently gathered a quantity of faded flowers and fallen petals, and went and interred them. Unable to check the emotion caused by the decay of the flowers, she spontaneously recited, after giving way to several loud lamentations, those verses which Bao Yu, she little thought, overheard from his position on the mount. At first, he did no more than nod his head, 
and heave signs, full of feeling. But when subsequently his ear caught, Here I am fain these flowers to inter, but humankind will laugh me as a fool. Who knows who will, in years to come, commit me to my grave. In a twinkle, springtime draws to an end, and maidens wax in age. Flowers fade and maidens die, and of either not any more is known. He unconsciously was so overpowered with grief that he threw himself on the mound, restoring the whole ground with the fallen flowers he carried in his coat, close to his chest, when the use flower-like charms and moonlight beauty he reflected, by and by likewise reach a time when they will vanish beyond any hope of recovery. Won't my heart be lacerated and my feelings be mangled? And extending, since Tai Yu must at length some day revert to a state when it will be difficult to find her. This reasoning to other persons, like Bao Chai, Xiang Ling, Zhe Ren, and the other girls, they too are equally liable to attain a state beyond the reach of human search. But when Bao Chai and all the rest have ultimately reached that stage, when no trace will be visible of them, where shall I myself be then? And when my own human form will have vanished, and gone, whither I know not yet, to what person, I wonder, will this place, this garden, and these plants revert. From one to a second, and from a second to a third, he thus pursued his reflections, backwards and forwards, until he really did not know how he could best, at this time and at such a juncture, dispel his fit of anguish. His state is adequately described by the shadow of a flower cannot err from the flower itself to the left or the right. The song of birds can only penetrate into the ear from the east or the west. Linda Yu was herself a prey to emotion and agitation, when unaware's sorrowful accents also struck her ear from the direction of the mound. Everyone, she cogitated, laughs at me for laboring under a foolish mania. But is there likely another fool besides myself? She then raised her head, and casting a glance about her, she discovered that it was Bao Yu. Chui eagerly cried Da Yu. I was wondering who it was. But is it truly this ruthless, hearted, and short-lived fellow? But the moment the two words short-lived dropped from her mouth, she sealed her lips, and Heaving a deep sigh, she turned herself round and hurriedly walked off. Bao Yu, meanwhile, remained for a time a prey to melancholy, but perceiving that Da Yu had retired, he at once realized that she must have caught sight of him and got out of his way, and as his own company afforded him no pleasure, he shook the dust off his clothes, rose to his feet, and descending the hill, he started for the Yihong court by the path by which he had come. But he espied Dai Yu walking in advance of him, and with rapid stride he overtook her. Stop a little, he cried. I know you don't care a rap for me, but I will just make one single remark, and from this day forward we'll part company. Dai Yu looked round, observing that it was Bao Yu, she was about to ignore him, hearing him, however, mention that he had only one thing to say. Please tell me what it is, she forthwith rejoined. Bao Yu smiled at her. If I pass two remarks, will you listen to me? Yes or no, he asked. At these words, Da Yu twisted herself round and beat a retreat. Bao Yu, however, followed behind. Since this is what we've come to now, he signed, what was the use of what existed between us in days gone by? As soon as Da Yu heard his exclamation, she stopped short impulsively, turning her face towards him. What about days gone by? she remarked. And what about now? Ai, ejaculated Bao Yu. 
When you got here in days gone by, wasn't I your playmate in all your romps and in all your fun? My heart may have been set upon anything, but if you wanted it, you could take it away at once. I may have been fond of any eatable, but if I came to learn that you two fancied it, I there and then put away what could be put away, in a clean place, to wait, miss, for your return. We had our meals at one table. We slept in one and the same bed. Whatever the servant girls could not remember, I reminded them of, for fear lest your temper, miss, should get ruffled. I flattered myself that cousins, who have grown up together from their infancy, as you and I have, would have continued, through intimacy or friendship, either would have done in peace and harmony until the end, so as to make it palpable that we are above the rest, but contrary to all my expectations, now that you, miss, have developed in body as well as in mind, you don't take the least heed of me. You lay hold instead of some cousin Bao or cousin Feng or other from here, there and everywhere and give them a place in your affections, while on the contrary you disregard me for three days at a stretch and decline to see anything of me for four. I have besides no brother or sister of the same mother as myself it's true there are a couple of them, but these, are you not forsooth aware, are by another mother. You and I are only children, so I ventured to hope that you would have reciprocated my feelings. But who'd have thought it? I've simply thrown away this heart of mine, and here I am with plenty of woes to bear, but with nowhere to go and utter them. While expressing these sentiments, Tears unexpectedly trickled from his eyes. When Lin Dai Yu caught with her ears his protestations and noticed with her eyes his state of mind, she unconsciously experienced an inward pang, and much against her will tears to besprinkled her cheeks. So drooping her head, she kept silent. Her manner did not escape Bao Yu's notice. I myself am aware, he speedily resumed, that I am worth nothing now, but however imperfect I may be, I could on no account presume to become guilty of any shortcoming with you, cousin. Were I to ever commit the slightest fault, your task should be either to tender me advice and warn me not to do it again, or to blow me up a little, or give me a few whacks and all this reproof I wouldn't take amiss. But no one would have ever anticipated that you wouldn't bother your head in the least about me, and that you would be the means of driving me to my wit's ends, and so much out of my mind and off my head, as to be quite at a loss how to act for the best. In fact, were death to come upon me, I would be a spirit driven to my grave by grievances. However much exalted bonces and eminent powers priests might do penance, they wouldn't succeed in releasing my soul from suffering. For it would still be needful for you to clearly explain the facts, so that I might at last be able to come to life. After lending him a patient ear, Dai Yu suddenly banished from her memory all recollection of the occurrences of the previous night. Well, in that case, she said, why did you not let a servant girl open the door when I came over? This question took Bao Yu by surprise. What prompts you to say this? he exclaimed. If I have done anything of the kind, may I die at once? Che, cried Dai Yu. It's not right that you should recklessly broach the subject of living or dying at this early morn. If you say yea, it's yea, and nay, it's nay. What use is there to utter such oaths? I didn't really see you come over, protested Bao Yu. Cousin Bao Chai, it was, who came and sat for a while and then left. After some reflection, Lin Dai Yu smiled. Yes, she observed. Your seven girls must, I fancy, have been too lazy to budge. Grumpy and in a cross-grained mood. This is probable enough. 
This is, I feel sure, the reason, answered Pao Yu. So when I go back, I'll find out who it was, call them to task, and put things right. Those girls of yours, continued Da Yu, should be given a lesson, but, probably speaking, it isn't for me to mention anything about it. The present insult to me is a mere trifle. But where tomorrow some Miss Bao, that is precious, or some Miss Bei, that is dual, or other to come, and where she to be subjected to insult, won't it be a grave matter? While she taunted him, she pressed her lips and laughed sarcastically. Pao Yu heard her remarks and felt both disposed to gnash his teeth with rage and to treat them as a joke. But in the midst of their colloquy, they perceived a waiting maid approach and invite them to have their meal. Presently, the whole body of inmates crossed over to the front. Miss inquired Madame Wong at the sight of Da Yu. Have you taken any of Dr. Bao's medicines? Do you feel any better? I simply feel so-so, replied Lin Da Yu. But Grandmother Jia recommended me to go on taking Dr. Wang's medicines. Mother, Bao Yu interposed. You have no idea that Cousin Lin's is an internal derangement. It's because she was born with a delicate physique that she can't stand the slightest cold. All she need do is to take a couple of doses of some decoction to dispel the chill. Yet it's preferable that she should have medicine in pills. The other day, said Madame Wong, the doctor mentioned the name of some pills, but I've forgotten what it is. I know something about pills, put in Pao Yu. He merely told her to take some pills or other called ginseng as a restorative of the system. That isn't it. Madame Wang demurred. The egg precious wholesome to mother pills, Pao Yu proceeded, or the left angelica or right angelica, if these also aren't the ones, they must be the egg flavor Raminia glutinosa pills. None of these, rejoined Madame Wang, for I remember well that there were the two words Jin Gan, that is, guardians in Buddhistic temples. I've never before, observed Pao Yu, clapping his hands, heard of the existence of Jingan pills. But in the event of there being any Jingan pills, there must, for a certainty, be such a thing as Pu Sa, that is Buddha, powder. At this joke, everyone in the whole room burst out laughing. Bao Tai compressed her lips and gave a smile. It must, I'm inclined to think, she suggested, did the Lord of Heaven strengthen the heart pills? Yes, that's the name, Madame Wang laughed. Why? Now I too have become muddle-headed. You're not muddle-headed, mother, said Bao Yu. It's the mention of Jin Gan and Buddhas which confused you. Stuff and nonsense, ejaculated Madame Wang. What you want again is your father to whip you? My father, Bao Yu laughed wouldn't whip me for a thing like this. Well, this being their name, resumed Madame Wang, you had better tell someone tomorrow to buy you a field. All these drugs, expostulated Bao Yu, are of no earthly use. Will you, mother, to give me 360 tails, I will concoct a supply of pills for my cousin, which I can certify will make her feel quite herself again before she has finished a single supply. What trash, cried Madame Wang. What kind of medicine is there so costly? It's a positive fact, smiled Bao Yu. This prescription of mine is unlike all others. Besides, the very names of those drugs are quaint and couldn't be illuminated in a moment. Suffice it to mention the placenta of the first child. 360 ginseng roots shaped like human beings, and studded with leaves. Four fat tortoises, full-grown polygonum moliforum, the core of the Pacama cocos, found on the roots of a fir tree of a thousand years old. Another species of medicines, they are not, I admit, out-of-the-way things, but they are the most excellent among that whole crowd of medicines. And were I to begin to give you a list of them, why? 
they take you all quite aback. The year before last, I at length let Xue Peng have this recipe, after he had made ever so many entreaties during one or two years. When, however, he got the prescription, he had to search for another two or three years and to spend over and above a thousand taels before he succeeded in having it prepared. If you don't believe me, mother, you are at liberty to ask cousin Bao Chai about it. At the mention of her name, Bao Chai laughingly waved her hand. I know nothing about it, she observed, nor have I heard anything about it. So don't tell your mother to ask me any questions. Really, said Madame Wang, smiling. Bao Chai is a good girl. She does not tell lies. Bao Yu, standing in the center of the room, upon hearing these words, he turned round sharply and clapped his hands. What I stated just now, he explained, was the truth, yet you maintain that it was all lies. As he defended himself, he casually looked round and caught sight of Lin Da Yu at the back of Bao Chai laughing with tight set lips and applying her fingers to her face to put him to shame. But Lady Feng, who had been in the inner rooms overseeing the servants laying the table, came out at once, as soon as she overheard the conversation. Brother Bao tells no lies, she smilingly chimed in. This is really a fact. Some time ago, cousin Xue Pang came over in person and asked me for pearls. And when I inquired of him what he wanted them for, he explained that they were intended to compound some medicine with, adding in an aggrieved way, that it would have been better hadn't he taken it in hand, for he never had any idea that it would involve such a lot of trouble. When I questioned him what the medicine was, he returned for answer that it was a prescription of brother Bao's, and he mentioned ever so many ingredients which I don't even remember. Under other circumstances, he went on to say, I would have purchased a few pearls, but what I absolutely wanted are such pearls as have been worn on the head, and that's why I come to ask you, cousin, for some. If, cousin, you've got no broken ornaments at hand, in the shape of flowers, why, those that you have on your head will do as well, and by and by I will choose a few good ones and give them to you, to wear. I had no other cause, therefore, than to snap a couple of twigs from some flowers I have made of pearls, and to let him take them away. One also requires a piece of deep red gauze, three feet in length of the best quality, and the pearls must be triturated to powder in a mortar. After each sentence expressed by Lady Feng, Bao Yu muttered an invocation to Buddha. The thing is as clear as sunlight now, he remarked. The moment Lady Feng had done speaking, Bao Yu put in his word. Mother, he added, you should know that this is a mere makeshift. For really, according to the letter of the prescription, these pearls and precious stones should, probably speaking, consist of such as had been obtained from some old grave and been worn as had ornaments by some wealthy and honorable person of bygone days. But how could one go now on this account and dig up graves and open tombs? Hence it is that such as are simply in use among living persons can equally well be substituted. Abi Tofu exclaimed Madame Wang after listening to him throughout. That will never do, and what an arduous job to uselessly settle oneself with, for even though there be interred in some graves people, who've been dead for several hundreds of years, it wouldn't be a propitious thing were the corpse turned topsy-turvy now and the bones abstracted, just for the sake of preparing some medicine or other. Bao Yu thereupon addressed himself to Dai Yu. Have you heard what was said or not? he asked. And is there, pray, any likelihood that Cousin Secunda would also follow in my lead and tell lies? While saying this, his eyes were, or bet his face was turned towards Lin Da Yu, fixed upon Bao Chai. Lin Da Yu pulled Madame Wang. You just listen to him, aunt, she observed, all because cousin Bao Chai would not accommodate him by lying. He appeals to me. Bao Yu has a great knack, Madame Wang said of 
dealing contemptuously with you, his cousin. Mother, Pao Yu smilingly protested. You are not aware how the case stands. When cousin Pao Chai lived at home, she knew nothing whatever about my elder cousin Xue Pang's affairs, and how much less now that she has taken up her quarters inside the garden. She, of course, knows less than ever about them. Yet Cousin Lin just now stealthily treated my statements as lies and put me to the blush. These words were still on his lips when they perceived a waiting maid from Dowager Lady Jia's apartment come in quest of Bao Yu and Lin Da Yu to go and have their meal. Lin Da Yu, however, did not even call Bao Yu, but forthwith, rising to her feet, she went along, dragging the waiting maid by the hand. Let's wait for Master Secundus, Mr. Bao, to go along with us, demurred the girl. He doesn't want anything to eat, Lin Da Yu replied. He won't come with us, so I will go ahead. So saying, she promptly left the room. I'll have my repast with my mother today, Bao Yu said. Not at all, Madam Wang remarked. Not at all. I'm going to fast today, so it's only right and proper that you should go and have your own. I'll also fast with you then, Bao Yu retorted. As he spoke, he called out to the servant to go back, and rushing up to the table, he took a seat. Madam Wang faced Bao Chai and her companions. You girls, she observed, had better have your meal, and let him have his own way. It's only right that you should go, Bao Chai smiled. Whether you have anything to eat or not, you should go over for a while to keep company to Cousin Nin, as she will be quite distressed and out of spirits. Who cares about her? Bao Yu rejoined. She'll get all right again after a time. Shortly, they finished their repast, but Bao Yu apprehended, in the first place, that his grandmother Jia would be solicitous on his account, and longed in the second to be with Lin Da Yu, so he hurriedly asked for some tea to rinse his mouth with. Cousin Secundus, Tan Chen and Si Chun interposed, with an ironic laugh. What's the use of the hurry scurry you are in the whole day long? Even when you are having your meals, or your tea, you are in this sort of fussy helter skelter. Make him hurry up and have his tea. Bao Chai chimed in smiling, so that he may go and look up his cousin Lin. He will be up to all kinds of mischief if you keep him here. Bao Yu drank his tea, then hastily leaving the apartment, he proceeded straightway towards the eastern court. As luck would have it, the moment he got near Lady Feng's court, he described Lady Feng standing at the gateway. While standing on the step and picking her teeth with an ear cleaner, she superintended about ten young servant boys removing the flower pots from place to place. As soon as she caught sight of Bao Yu approaching, she put on a smiling face. You come quite opportunely, she said. Walk in, walk in, and write a few characters for me. Bao Yu had no option but to follow her in. When they reached the interior of her rooms, Lady Feng gave orders to a servant to fetch a pen, ink slab, and paper. Forty rows of deep red ornamented satin, she began, addressing herself to Bao Yu. Forty rows of satin with dragons, a hundred rows of gauzes of every color, of the finest quality, four gold necklaces. What's this? Bao Yu shouted. It is neither a bill, nor is it a list of presents, and in what style shall I write it? Lady Feng remonstrated with him. Just you go on writing, she said, for in fact, as long as I can make out what it means, is all that is needed. Bao Yu at this response felt constrained to proceed with the writing. This over, Lady Feng put the paper by. As she did so, I've still something more to tell you, she smilingly pursued but I wonder whether you will accede to it or not. There is in your rooms a servant maid, Xiao Hong, by name, whom I would like to bring over into my service, and I will select several girls tomorrow to wait on you. Will this do? The servants in my quarters, answered Bao Yu, muster a large crowd, so that cousin 
you are at perfect liberty to send for any one of them who may take your fancy. What's the need, therefore, of asking me about it? If that be so, continued Lady Feng laughingly, I'll tell someone at once to go and bring her over. Yes, she can go and fetch her, agreed Pao Yu. While replying, he made an attempt to take his leave. Come back, shouted Lady Feng. I've got something more to tell you. Our venerable senior has sent for me, Pao Yu rejoined. If you have anything to tell me, you must wait till my return. After this explanation, he there and then came over to his grandmother, Jia's, on this side, where he found that they had already got through their meal. Have you had anything nice to eat with your mother? Old lady Jia asked. There was really nothing nice, Pao Yu smiled. Yet I managed to have a bowl of rice more than usual. Where's Cousin Lin? he then inquired. She's in the inner rooms, answered his grandmother. Pao Yu stepped in. He caught sight of a waiting maid, standing below, blowing into an iron, and two seven girls seated on the stove couch, making a chalk line. Tai Yu, with stooping head, was cutting out something or other with a pair of scissors she held in her hand. Pao Yu advanced further in. Oh, what's this that you are up to? He smiled. You have just had your rice, and do you bob your head down in this way? Why? In a short while, you will be having a headache again. Tai Yu, however, did not heed him in the least, but busied herself cutting out what she had to do. The corner of that piece of satin is not yet right, a serving girl put in. You had better iron it again. Tai Yu threw down the scissors. Why worry yourself about it, she said. It will get quite right after a time. But while Pao Yu was listening to what was being said, and was inwardly feeling in low spirits, he became aware that Pao Chai, Tan Chun, and the other girls had also arrived. After a short chat with Dowager Lady Cha, Pao Chai likewise entered the apartments to find out what her cousin Lin was up to. The moment she espied Lin Tai Yu engaged in cutting out something, you have, she cried, attained more skill than ever, for there you can even cut out clothes. This too, laughed Tai Yu sarcastically, is a mere falsehood, to hoodwink people with nothing more. I'll tell you a joke, replied Pao Chai, smiling. When I just now said that I did not know anything about that medicine, Cousin Pao Yu felt displeased. Who cares? shouted Lin Tai Yu. You'll get all right shortly. Our worthy grandmother wishes to play at dominoes, Pao Yu thereupon interposed, directing his remarks to Pao Chai. And there's no one there at present to have a game with her. So you'd better go and play with her. Have I come over now to play dominoes? promptly smiled Pao Chai, when she heard his suggestion. With this remark, she nevertheless at once quitted the room. It would be well for you to go, urged Lin Da Yu, for there is a tiger in here, and look out, he might eat you up. As she spoke, she went on with her cutting. Pao Yu perceived how both she was to give him any of her attention, and he had no alternative but to force a smile and to observe. We should also go for a stroll. It will be time enough by and by to continue your cutting. But Pao Yu would pay no heed whatever to him. Pao Yu addressed himself, therefore, to the servant girls. Who has taught her how to cut out these things? he asked. What does it matter who taught me how to cut? Tai Yu vehemently exclaimed. When she realized that he was speaking to the maids, it's no business of yours, Mr. Secundus. Pao Yu was then about to say something in his defense, when he saw a servant come in and report that there was someone outside who wished to see him. At this announcement, Pao Yu betook himself with alacrity out of the room. Amitabha observed Da Yu, turning outwards. It wouldn't matter to you if you found me dead on your return. On his arrival outside, Pao Yu discovered Bei Ming. You are invited, he said, to go to Mr. Feng's house. Upon hearing this message, Pao Yu knew well enough that it was about the project wooted the previous day 
and accordingly he told him to go and ask for his clothes, while he himself went at his steps into the library. Bei Ming came forthwith to the second gate and waited for someone to appear. Seeing an old woman walked out, Bei Ming went up to her. Our master Secundus, Mr. Bao, he told her, is in the study waiting for his outdoor clothes. So do go in, worthy dame, and deliver the message. It would be better, replied the old woman, if you did not echo your mother's absurdities. Our master Secundus, Mr. Bao, now lives in the garden, and all the servants who attend on him stay in the garden. And do you again come and bring the message here? At these words, Beiming smiled. You are quite right, he rejoined, in reproving me, for I have become quite idiotic. So saying, he repaired with quick step to the second gate on the east side, where, by a lucky hit, the young servant boys on duty were kicking marbles on the raised row. Beiming explained to them the object of his coming. A young boy thereupon ran in. After a long interval, he at length made his appearance, holding and folded in his arms a bundle of clothes, which he handed to Bei Ming, who then returned to the library. Bao Yu effected a change in his costume, and giving directions to saddle his horse, he only took along with him the four servant boys, Bei Ming, Zhu Yao, Xiang Rui, and Shou Er, and started on his way. He reached Feng Ji Ying's doorway by a short cut. A servant announced his arrival, and Feng Ziying came out and ushered him in. Here he discovered Xue Peng, who had already been waiting a long time, and several singing boys besides, as well as Jiang Yu Han, who played female roles, and Yue Er, a courtesan in the Jingxiang court. The whole company exchanged salutations. They next had tea. What you said the other day, smiled Bao Yu, raising his cup, about good fortune coming out of evil fortune, has preyed so much upon my mind, both by day and night, that the moment I received your summons, I hurried to come immediately. My worthy cousins, rejoined Feng Ying, smiling, you are all far too credulous. It's a mere hoax that I made use of the other day. For so much did I fear that you would be sure to refuse if I openly asked you to a drinking bout, that I thought it fit to say what I did. But your attendance today, so soon after my invitation, makes it clear, little though one would have thought it, that you have all taken it as pure gospel truth. This admission evoked laughter from the whole company. The wines were afterwards placed on the table, and they took the seats consistent with their grades. Feng Ying first and foremost called the singing boys and offered them a drink. Next, he told Yue Er to also approach and have a cup of wine. By the time, however, that Xue Pen had had his third cup, he of a sudden lost control over his feelings, and clasping Yue Er's hand in his, Do sing me, he smiled, that novel ballad of your own composition, and I will drink a whole jar full. Huh, will you? This appeal compelled Yuan to take up the guitar. She then sang, Lovers have I too. To set aside either I cannot bear. Where my heart longs for thee to come, it also yearns for him. Both are in form handsome and fair. The beauty to describe it would be hard. Just think, Nazlite, when at a silent hour we met in secret by the trellis, frame laden with roses white. One to his feelings stealthily was giving vent, when, lo, the other caught us in the act, and laying hands on us, there we three stood like litigants before the bar, and I had, verily, no word in answer for myself to give. At the close of her song, she laughed. Well now, she cried, down with that whole jar. Why, it isn't worth a jarvel, smiled Xue Pen at these words. Favor us with some other good sound. Listen to what I have to suggest, Bao Yu interposed, a smile on his lips. 
if you go on drinking in this reckless manner, we will easily get drunk and there will be no fun in it. I will take the lead and swallow a large cupful and put in force a new penalty. And any one of you who doesn't comply with it will be mulcted in ten large cupfuls in quick succession. Speedily rising from the banquet, he poured the wine for the company, Feng Ying, and the rest, meanwhile, exclaimed with one voice, Quite right, quite right. Bao Yu then lifted a large cup and drank it with one draught. We will now, he proposed, dilate on the four characters, sad, wounded, glad, and joyful. But while discoursing about young ladies, we will have to illustrate the four states as well. At the end of this recitation, we will have to drink the door cup over the wine, to sing an original and seasonable ballad, while over the hill taps, to make allusion to some object on the table, and devise something with some old poetic lines or ancient strolls from the four books or the five classics, or with some set phrases. Xue Peng gave him no time to finish. He was the first to stand up and prevent him from proceeding. I won't join you, so don't count me. This is, in fact, done in order to play tricks upon me. Yue, however, also rose to her feet and shoved him down into his seat. What are you in such a funk for? She laughed. You are fortunate enough to be able to drink wine daily. And can't you, forsooth, even come up to me? Yet I mean to recite, by and by, my own share, if you say what's right, well and good. If you don't, you'll simply have to swallow several cups of wine as a forfeit. And is it likely you'll die from drunkenness? Are you, pray, going now to disregard this rule and to drink instead ten large cups, besides going down to pour the wine? One and all clapped in applause. Well said, they shouted. After this, Xue Peng had no way out of it and felt compelled to resume his seat. End of section 7section 8 of the dream of the red chamber book 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the dream of the red chamber book 2 by Chiao shu ching translated by henry bancroft jolie chapter 28 part 2 they then heard Bao Yu recite, A girl is sad when her springtime of life is far advanced and she still occupies a vacant inner room. A girl feels wounded in her heart when she regrets having allowed her better half to go abroad and win a martyrdom. A girl is glad when looking in the mirror at the time of her morning toilette. She finds her color fair. A girl is joyful when time she sits on the frame of a gallows swing, clad in a thin spring gown. Having listened to him, Capital, one and all cried out in a chorus. Xue Peng alone raised his face, shook his head and remarked, It isn't good. He must be fined. Why should he be fined? demurred the party. Because, retorted Xue Peng, what he says is entirely unintelligible to me. So how can he not be fined? Yu gave him a pinch. Just you quietly think of yours, she laughed. For if by and by you are not ready, you also have to bear a fine. In due course, Bao Yu took up the guitar. He was heard to sing. When mutual thoughts arise, tears, blood-stained, endless drop, like Lento's song broadcast. In spring, in ceaseless bloom, nourish willows and flowers around the painted tower. Inside the gauze lactus, peaceful sleep flies, when after dark come wind and rain. Both newborn sorrows and long-standing griefs cannot from memory ever die. 
the enjayed fine rise and gold like drains they make hard to go down they choke the throat the lass has not the heart to desist gazing in the glass at her wan face nothing can from that knitted brow of hers those frowns dispel for heart she finds it patient to abide till the clepsydra will have run its course alas how fitly like the faint outline of a green hill which not can scream or like a green tinged stream which ever ceaseless throve onward far and wide when the song drew to an end his companions with one voice cried out excellent she Peng was the only one to find fault there is no meter in them he said pao yu quaffed the opening cup then seizing a pear he added while the rain strikes the pear blossom i firmly close the door and thus accomplished the requirements of the rule feng ji ying's turn came next a maid is glad he commenced when at her first confinement she gives birth to twins both sons a maid is joyful when on the sly she to the garden creeps crickets to catch a maid is sad when her husband some sickness gets and lies in a bad state a maiden is wounded at heart when a fierce wind blows down the tower where she makes her toilette concluding this recitation he raised the cup and sang thou art what one could aptly call a man but thou art endowed with somewhat too much heart how queer thou art cross-grained and impish shrewd a spirit too thou could not be more shrewd if all i say thou dost not think is true in secret just a minute search pursue for then thou'lt know if i love thee or not his song over he drank the opening cup and then observed the cock crows when the moon's rays shine upon the thatched inn after his observance of the rule followed Yu's turn a girl is said Yu began when she tries to divine on whom she will depend towards the end of life my dear child laughingly exclaimed the your worthy mr Shear still lives and why do you give way to fears don't confuse her remonstrated every one of the party don't muddle her a maiden is wounded at heart you have proceeded when her mother beats and scolds her and never for an instant doth deceased it was only the other day in the post Peng, that i saw your mother and that i told her that i would not have her beat you if you still go on babbling put in the company with one consent you'll be fined ten cups Xue Peng promptly administered himself a slap on the mouth how you lack the faculty of hearing he exclaimed you are not to say a word more a girl is glad you are then resumed when her lover cannot brook to leave her and return home a maiden is joyful when hushing the pan pipe and double pipe a strained instrument she thrums at the end of her effusion she at once began to sing this the third day of the third moon the nutmets bloom a maggot blow works hard to pierce into a flower but though it ceaseless bores it cannot penetrate so crouching on the buds its wing like rocks itself my precious pet my own dear little darling if i don't choose to open how can you steal in finishing her song she drank the opening cup after which she added the delicate peach blossom and thus complied with the exigencies of the rule next came she Peng. is it for me to speak now she Peng asked a maiden is sad but a long time elapsed after these words were uttered and yet nothing further was heard sad for what feng zi ying lovingly asked go on and tell us at once she Peng was much perplexed his eyes rolled about like a bell a girl is sad he hastily repeated but here again he coughed twice before he proceeded 
A girl is sad, he said, when she marries a spouse who is a libertine. This sentence so tickled the fancy of the company that they burst out into a loud fit of laughter. What amuses you so? shouted Xue Peng. Is it likely that what I say is not correct? If a girl marries a man who chooses to forget all words, how can she not feel sore at heart? But so heartily did they all laugh that their bodies were bent in two. What you say is quite right, they eagerly replied. So proceed at once with the rest. Xue Peng thereupon stared with vacant gaze. A girl is grieved, he added. But after these few words he once more could find nothing to say. What is she grieved about? they asked. When a huge monkey finds its way into the inner room, Xue Peng retorted. This reply set everyone laughing. He must be mocked, they cried. He must be mocked. The first one could anyhow be overlooked, but this line is more unintelligible. As they said this, they were about to pour the wine when Bao Yu smilingly interfered. The rhyme is all right, he observed. The master of the rules, Xue Peng remarked, approves it in every way. So what are you people fussing about? Hearing this, the company eventually let the matter drop. The two lines that follow are still more difficult, suggested Yu with a smile. So you had better let me recite for you. Fiddlesticks, exclaimed Xue Peng. Do you really fancy that I have no good ones? Just you listen to what I shall say. A girl is glad when in the bridal room she lies with flowery candles burning and she is loath to rise at morn. This sentiment filled one and all with amazement. How supremely excellent this line is, they ejaculated. A girl is joyful, Xue Peng resumed, during the consummation of wedlock. Upon catching this remark, the party turned their heads away and shouted, Dreadful, dreadful, but quick sing your song and have done. Forthwith, Xu Peng sang, A mosquito buzzes, hung, hung, hung. Everyone was taken by surprise. What kind of song is this? They inquired. But Xu Peng went on singing, Two flies buzz, wang, wang, wang. Enough, shouted his companions. That will do, that will do. Do you want to hear it or not? asked Xue Peng. This is a new kind of song, called the Hung Hung Air. But if you people are not disposed to listen, let me off also from saying what I have to say over the hill taps, and I won't then sing. We'll let you off, we'll let you off, answered one and all. So don't be hindering others. A maiden is said, Jiang Yu Han at once began. When her husband leaves home and never does return, a maiden is disconsolate. When she has no money to go and buy some ole crayon oil, a maiden is glad when the wick of the lantern forms two heads, like twin flowers, on one stem. A maiden is joyful when true conjugal peace prevails between her and her mate. His recital over, he went on to sing. How I love thee with those seductive charms of thine, heaven born. In truth, thou art like a living fairy from the usher skies. The spring of life we now enjoy. We are yet young in years. Our union is indeed a happy match. But lo, the Milky Way doth at its zenith soar. Hark to the drums which beat around in the watchtowers. So raise the silver lamp and let us soft under the nuptial curtain steel. Finishing the song, he drank the opening cup. I know, he smiled, few poetic quotations bearing on this sort of thing. By a stroke of good fortune, however, I yesterday conned a pair of antithetical scrolls. Of these, I can only remember just one line. But lucky enough for me, the object it refers to figures as well on this festive board. This said, he forthwith drained the wine and, picking up a butt of a diminutive variety of Olea Franchon, he recited, When the perfume of flowers wafts, that is, Jiren, 
itself into a man, he knows the day is warm. The company unanimously conceded that the rule had been adhered to. But Xue Peng once again jumped up. It's awful, awful. He bowed out boisterously. He should be fined. He should be made to pay a forfeit. There is no precious article was ever on this table. How is it then that you introduce precious things? There was nothing about precious things, Chang Yuhang vehemently explained. What are you still prevaricating? Xue Peng cried. Well, repeat it again. Chang Yuhan had no other cause but to recite the line a second time. Now, is not Jiren a precious thing? Xue Peng asked. If she isn't, what is she? And if you don't believe me, you ask him about it, pointing at the conclusion of this remark at Bao Yu. Bao Yu felt very uncomfortable. Rising to his feet, cousin, he observed, you should be fined heavily. I should be, I should be, Xue Peng shouted, and saying this, he took up the wine and poured it down his throat with one cup. Feng Ying, Jiang Yu Han, and their companions thereupon asked him to explain the allusion. Yu readily told them, and Jiang Yu Han hastily got up and pleaded guilty. Ignorance, the party said with one consent, does not amount to guilt. But presently Bao Yu quitted the banquet to go and satisfy a natural want, and Jiang Yuhan followed him out. The two young fellows halted under the eaves of the veranda, and Jiang Yuhan then recommenced to make ample apologies. Bao Yu, however, was so attracted by his handsome and genial appearance that he took quite a violent fancy to him, and squeezing his hand in a firm grip. If you have nothing to do, he urged, to let us go over to our place. I've got something more to ask you. Is this, there's in your worthy company someone called Qi Guan, with a reputation extending at present throughout the world. But unfortunately, I alone have not had the good luck of seeing him even once. This is really, rejoined Jiang Yuhan with a smile, my own infant name. This disclosure at once made Bao Yu quite exuberant. And stamping his feet, he smiled. How lucky! I'm in Lucky's way, he exclaimed. In very truth, your reputation is no idle report. But today is our first meeting, and what shall I do? After some thought, he produced a fan from his sleeve, and unloosening one of the jade pendants, he handed it to Qi Guan. This is a mere trifle, he said. It does not deserve your acceptance, Yet, it will be a small souvenir of our acquaintance today. Qi Quan received it with a smile. I do not deserve, he replied, such a present. How am I worthy of such an honor? But never mind, I've also got about me here a strange thing, which I put on this morning. It is brand new, yet, and will, I hope, suffice to prove to you a little of the feeling of esteem which I entertain for you. With these protestations, he raised his garment and, untying a deep red sash with which his nether clothes were fastened, he presented it to Bao Yu. This sash, he remarked, is an article brought as tribute from the queen of the Qingxiang kingdom. If you attach this round you in summer, your person will emit a fragrant perfume and it will not perspire. It was given to me yesterday by the prince of Beijing and it is only today that I put it on. To anyone else, I would certainly not be willing to present it, but Mr. Secundus, please do unfasten the one you have on and give it to me to bind round me. This proposal extremely delighted Bao Yu. With precipitate haste, he accepted his gift, and undoing the dark brown sash he wore, he surrendered it to Ji Guan. But both had just had time to adjust their respective sashes when they heard a loud voice say, Oh, I've caught you. And they perceived Xue Peng come out by leaps and bounds. Clutching the two young fellows, What do you, he exclaimed, leave your wine for and withdraw from the banquet. Be quick and produce those things and let me see them. 
There's nothing to see, rejoined the two young fellows with one voice. Xue Peng, however, would by no means fall in with their views, and it was only Feng Ziying who made his appearance on the scene who succeeded in dissociating him. So, resuming their seats, they drank until dark, when the company broke up. Bao Yu, on his return into the garden, loosened his clothes and had tea. But Zhe Ren noticed that the pendant had disappeared from his fan, and she inquired of him what had become of it. I must have lost it this very moment, Bao Yu replied. At bedtime, however, describing a deep red sash with spots like specks of blood attached around his waist, Zhe Ren guessed more or less the truth of what must have transpired. As you have such a nice sash to fasten your trousers with, Zhe Ren consequently said, you'd better return that one of mine. This reminder made the fact dawn upon Bao Yu that the sash has originally been the property of Zhe Ren, and that he should by right not have parted with it. But however much he felt his conscience smitten by remorse, he failed to see how he could very well disclose the truth to her. He could therefore only put on a smiling expression and add, I'll give you another one instead. Zhe Ren was prompted by his rejoinder to nod her head and sigh. I felt sure, she observed, that you'd go again and do these things. Yet you shouldn't take my belongings and bestow them on that low-bred sort of people. Can it be that no consideration finds a place in your heart? She then felt disposed to tender him a few more words of ammunition. But dreading, on the other hand, lest she should, by irritating him, bring the fumes of the wine to his head, she thought it best to also retire to bed. Nothing worth noticing occurred during that night. The next day, when she woke up at the break of day, she heard Bao Yu call out laughingly, Robbers have been here in the night. Are you not aware of it? Just you look at my trousers. Zhe Ren lowered her head and looked. She saw at a glance that the sash which Bao Yu had worn the previous day was bound round her own waist, and she at once realized that Bao Yu must have effected the change during the night, but promptly unbinding it. I don't care for such things, she cried. Quick, take it away. At the sight of her manner, Bao Yu has to coax her with gentle terms. This so disarmed Zhe Ren that she fell under the necessity of putting on the sash. But subsequently, when Bao Yu stepped out of the apartment, she at last pulled it off and throwing it away in an empty box. She found one of hers and fastened it round her waist. Bao Yu, however, did not in the least notice what she did, but inquired whether anything had happened the day before. Lady Secunda, Zhe Ren explained, dispatched someone and fetched Xiao Hong away. Her wish was to have waited for your return, but as I thought that it was of no consequence, I took upon myself to decide and sent her off. That's all right, rejoined Bao Yu. I knew all about it. There was no need for her to wait. Yesterday, resumed Zhe Ren, the imperial consort deputed the eunuch Sha to bring a hundred and twenty ounces of silver and to convey her commands that from the first to the third there should be offered in the Qing Shu temple thanksgiving services to last for three days and that theatrical performances should be given and oblations presented and to tell our senior master Mr. Jia Jin to take all the gentlemen and go and burn incense and worship Buddha. Besides this, she also sent presents for the Dragon Festival. Continuing, she bade a young servant maid produce the presents, which had been received the previous day. Then he saw two palace fans of the best quality, two strings of musk-scented beads, two rows of silk, as fine as the phoenix tail, and a superior mat worked with hibiscus. At the sight of these things, Bao Yu was filled with immeasurable pleasure, and he asked whether the articles brought to all the others were similar to his. The only things in excess of yours that our venerable mistress has, Jiren explained, consist of a scented jade scepter 
and a pillow made of agate, those of your worthy father and mother, our master and mistress, and of your aunt exceed yours by a scent scepter of jade. Yours are the same as Miss Bow's. Miss Lin's are like those of Mrs. Secunda, Tertia, and Quarter, who received nothing beyond a fan and several pearls, and none of all the other things. As for our senior lady, Mrs. Jia Zhu, and Lady Secunda, these two got each two rows of gauze, two rows of silk, two center bags, and two sticks of medicine. After listening to her enumeration, what's the reason of this? He smiled. How is it that Miss Lin's are not the same as mine, but that Miss Bao's instead are like my own? May not the message have been wrongly delivered? When they were brought out of the palace yesterday, Jiren rejoined, they were already divided in respective shares, and slips were also placed on them, so that how could any mistake have been made? Yours were among those for our dowager's ladies' apartments. When I went and fetched them, her venerable ladyship said that I should tell you to go there tomorrow at the fifth watch to return thanks. Of course, it's my duty to go over, Bao Yu cried at these words, but forthwith calling Ji Shao, take these to your Miss Lin. He told her, and say that I got them yesterday, and that she is at liberty to keep out of them any that take her fancy. Ji Shao expressed her obedience and took the things away. After a short time, she returned. Miss Lin says, she explained, that she also got some yesterday, and that you, Master Secundus, should keep yours. Hearing this reply, Bao Yu quickly directed a servant to put them away, but when he had washed his face and stepped out of doors, bent upon going to his grandmother's on the other side, in order to pay his obeisance, he caught sight of Lin Da Yu coming along towards him from the opposite direction. Bao Yu hurriedly walked up to her. I told you, he smiled, to select those you liked from my things. How is it you didn't choose any? Lin Da Yu had long before banished from her recollection the incident of the previous day which had made her angry with Bao Yu, and was only exercised about the occurrence of this present occasion. I'm not gifted with such extreme good fortune, she consequently answered, as to be able to accept them. I can't compete with Miss Bao, in connection with whom something or other about gold or about jade is mentioned. We are simply beings connected with the vegetable kingdom. The allusion to the two words gold and jade, aroused of a sudden much emotion in the heart of Bao Yu. If beyond what people say about gold or jade, he protested, the idea of any such things ever crosses my mind. May the heavens annihilate me, and may the earth extinguish me, and may I for ten thousand generations never assume human form. These protestations convinced Lin Da Yu that suspicion had been aroused in him, with all promptitude, she smiled and observed, They're all to no use. Why utter such oaths? When there's no rhyme or reason, who cares about any gold or any jade of yours? It would be difficult for me to tell you, to your face, all the secrets of my heart, Bao Yu resumed, but by and by you will surely come to know all about them. After the three, my old grandmother, my father and my mother, you, my cousin, hold the fourth place. And if there's be a fifth, I'm ready to swear another oath. You needn't swear any more, Lin Da Yu replied. I'm well aware that I, your younger cousin, have a place in your heart. But the thing is that at the sight of your elder cousin, you at once forget all about your younger cousin. This comes again from over suspicion, ejaculated Bao, for I'm not at all disposed that way. Well, resumed Lin Da Yu, why did you yesterday appeal to me when that Hosi Bao Chai would not help you by telling a story? Had it been I who had been guilty of any such thing? I don't know what you wouldn't have done again. But during the tether day, they espied Bao Chai approach from the opposite direction. So readily they beat a retreat. Bao Chai had distinctly caught sight of them, but pretending she had not seen them, she trudged on her way with lowered head and repaired into Madame Wang's apartment. 
After a short stay, she came to this side to pay Dowager's Lady Jia a visit. With her, she also found Pao Yu. Pao Chai ever made it a point to hold Pao Yu aloof, as her mother had in days gone, by mentioned to Madame Wong and her other relatives that the gold locket had been the gift of a bond, that she had to wait until such time as some suitor with Jade turn up before she could be given in marriage, and other similar confidences. But on discovery the previous day that Yuan Chun's presence to her alone resembled those of Bao Yu, she began to feel all the more embarrassed. Luckily, however, Bao Yu was so entangled in Lin Dai Yu's meshes and so absorbed in heart and mind with fond thoughts of his Lin Dai Yu that he did not pay the least attention to this circumstance. But she unawares now heard Bao Yu remark with a smile, Cousin Bao, let me see that string of scented beads of yours. By a strange coincidence, Bao Chai wore the string of beads round her left wrist, so she had no alternative when Bao Yu asked her for it than to take it off. Bao Chai, however, was naturally inclined to Onbon Puan, and it proved therefore no easy matter for her to get the beads off. And while Bao Yu stood by watching her snow white arm, feelings of admiration were quickly stirred up in his heart. With this arm attached to Miss Lin's person, he secretly pondered, I might possibly have been able to caress it. But it is, as it happens, part and parcel of her body. How I really do deplore this lack of good fortune. Suddenly he bethought himself of this secret of gold and jade, and he again scanned Bao Chai's appearance. At the sight of her countenance, resembling a silver bowl, her eyes limpid like water and almond-like in shape, her lips crimson, though not rouged, her eyebrows jack black, though not penciled, also of that fascination and grace which presented such a contrast to Lin Dai Yu's style of beauty. He could not refrain from falling into such a stupid reverie that though Bao Chai had got the string of beads off her wrist and was handing them to him, he forgot all about them and made no effort to take them. Bao Chai realized that he was plunged in abstraction and conscious of the awkward position in which she was placed, she put down the string of beads and, turning round, was on the point of betaking herself away when she perceived Lin Dai Yu standing on the doorstep, laughing significantly while biting a handkerchief she held in her mouth. You can't resist, Bao Chai said, a single puff of wind. And why do you stand there and expose yourself to the very teeth of it? Wasn't I inside the room? rejoined Lin Dai Yu with a cynical smile. But I came out to have a look as I heard a streak in the heavens. It turned out, in fact, to be a stupid white goose. A stupid white goose, repeated Bao Chai. Where is it? Let me also see it. As soon as I got out, answered Lin Dai Yu, it flew away with a duh sort of noise. While replying, she threw the handkerchief she was holding straight into Bao Yu's face. Bao Yu was quite taken by surprise. He was hit on the eye. Aya! he exclaimed. But, reader, do you want to hear the sequel? In that case, listen to the circumstances which will be disclosed in the next chapter. End of section 8. Section 9 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2 by Chiao Xu Qing, translated by Henry Bancroft Julie, Chapter 29, Part 1. A happy man enjoys a full measure of happiness, but still prays for happiness. A beloved girl is very much loved, but yet craves for more love. Bao Yu, so our story runs, was gazing vacantly when Da Yu, at a moment least expected, flung her handkerchief at him, which just hit him on the eyes, 
and frightened him out of his wits. Who was it? he cried. Lin Tai nodded her head and smiled. I would not venture to do such a thing, she said. It was a mere slip of my hand. As cousin Bao Chai wished to see the silly wild goose, I was pointing it out to her, when the handkerchief inadvertently threw out of my grip. Bao Yu kept on rubbing his eyes. The idea suggested itself to him to make some remonstrance, but he could not again very well open his lips. Presently, Lady Feng arrived. She then alluded, in the course of conversation, to the Thanksgiving service, which was to be offered on the first in the Qing Shu Temple, and invited Bao Chai, Bao Yu, Da Yu, and the other inmates with them to be present at the theatricals. Never mind, smiled Bao Chai. It's too hot. Besides, what place haven't I seen? I don't mean to come. It's cool enough over at their place, answered Lady Feng. There are also two storied buildings on either side, so we must all go. I'll send servants a few days before to drive all that herd of Taoist priests out, to sweep the upper stories, hang up curtains, and to keep out every single lover from the interior of the temple. So it will be all right like that. I've already told our Madam Wang that if you people don't go, I mean to go all alone. As I've been again in very low spirits these last few days, and as when theatricals come off at home, it's out of the question for me to look on with any peace and quiet. When Dowager Lady Cha heard what she said, she smiled. Well, in that case, she remarked, I'll go along with you. Lady Feng, at these words, gave a smile. Venerable ancestor, she replied, were you also to go, it would be ever so much better, yet I won't feel quite at my ease. Tomorrow, Daoja Lady Jia continued, I can stay in the two-storied building situated on the principal site, while you can go to the one on the side. You can then likewise dispense with coming over to where I shall be to stand on any ceremonies. Will this suit you or not? This is indeed, Lili Feng smiled, a proof of your regard for me, my worthy senior. Old Lady Jia at this stage faced Bao Chai. You two should go, she said. So should your mother. For if you remain the whole day long at home, you will again sleep your head off. Bao Chai felt constrained to signify her assent. Daoja Lady Jia then also dispatched domestics to invite Mrs. Xie, and on their way, they notified Madame Wang that she was to take the young ladies along with her. But Madame Wang felt, in the first place, in a poor state of health, and was, in the second, engaged in making preparations for the reception of any arrivals from Yuan Chun, so that she, at an early hour, sent word that it was impossible for her to leave the house. Yet, when she received old lady Jia's behest, she smiled and exclaimed, are her spirit still so buoyant and transmitted the message into the garden that any who had any wish to avail themselves of the opportunity were at liberty to go on the first, with their venerable senior as their chaperon. As soon as these tidings were spread abroad, everyone else was indifferent as to whether they went or not, but of those girls who, day after day, never put their foot outside the doorstep, which of them was not keen upon going, the moment they heard the permission conceded to them. Even if any of their respective mistresses were too lazy to move, they employed every expedient to induce them to go. Hence, it was that Li Kung Tai and the other inmates signified their unanimous intention to be present. Daoja Lady Jia at this grew more exultant than ever, and she issued immediate directions for servants to go and sweep and put things in proper order. But to all these preparations, there is no necessity of making detailed reference. Sufficient to relate that on the first day of the moon, carriages stood in a thick maze, and men and horses in close concourse at the entrance of the Yong Guo mansion. 
When the servants, the various managers, and other domestics came to learn that the imperial consort was to perform good deeds, and that Dowager Lady Cha was to go in person and offer incense, they arranged, as it happened, that the first of the moon, which was the principal day of the ceremonies, was in addition the season of the Dragon Boat Festival. All the necessary articles in perfect readiness and with unusual splendor. Shortly, old Lady Cha and the other inmates started on their way. The old lady sat in an official chair, carried by eight bearers, Widow Li, Lady Feng, and Mrs. Xie, each in a four-bearer chair, Bao Chai and Dai Yu, mounted together a curricle with green cover and pearl tassels, bearing the eight precious things. The three sisters, Ying Chun, Tang Jin, and Si Chun, got in a carriage with red wheels and ornamented hood, next in order, followed Dowager Lady Jia's waiting maids, Yuan Yang, Ying Wu, Wu Po, Zhen Zhu, Lin Da Yu's waiting maids, Ji Chun, Xue Yan, and Chun Xian, Bao Chai's waiting maids, Ying Er, and Wen Xing, Ying Chun's servant girls, Si Qi, and Xiu Ju, Tan Chun's waiting maids, Xi Shu, and Wei Mo, Si Chuan's servant girls, Yu Hua and Cai Ping, and Mrs. Jie's waiting maids, Tong Xi and Tong Gui. Besides these were joined to their retinue, Xiang Ling and Xiang Ling's servant girl, Jin Er, Mrs. Li's waiting maids, Zhu Yun and Bi Yue, Lady Feng's servant girls, Ping Er, Feng Er and Xiao Hong, as well as Madame Wang's two wedding maids, Jin Chuan and Cai Yun. Along with Lady Feng came a nurse carrying Da Zhe She drove in a separate carriage, together with a couple of seven girls, added also to the number of the suite, were matrons and nurses, attached to the various establishments, and the wives of the servants of the household, who were in attendance out of doors, their carriages, forming one black solid mass, therefore crammed the whole extent of the streets. Dowager Lady Jia and other members of the party had already proceeded a considerable distance in their chairs, and yet the inmates at the gate had not finished mounting their vehicles. This one shouted, I won't sit with you. Then one cried, You've crossed our mistress' bundle. In the carriages yonder, one screamed, You've pulled my flowers off. Another one nearer exclaimed, You've broken my fan. And they chatted and chatted and talked and laughed with such incessant volubility that Zhao Re's wife had to go backward and forward, calling them to task. Girls, she said, This is the street. The onlookers will laugh at you. But it was only after she had expostulated with them several times that any sign of improvement became at last visible. The van of the procession had long ago reached the entrance of the Qing Su Temple. Bao Yu rode on horseback. He preceded the chair occupied by his grandmother Jia. The throngs that filled the streets ranged themselves on either side. On their arrival at the temple, the sound of bells and the rattle of drums struck their ear. Forthwith appeared the head bonds Jia. A stick of incense in hand, his cloak thrown over his shoulders, he took his stand by the wayside at the head of a company of Taoist priests to present his greetings. The moment Dowager Lady Jia reached in her chair the interior of the main gate, she described the Laras and the Penates, the Lord presiding over that particular district, and the clay images of the various gods and she at once gave orders to halt. Jia Chen advanced to receive her acting as leader to the male members of the family. Lady Feng was well aware that Yuan Yang and the other attendants were at the back and could not overtake their old mistress, so she herself alighted from her chair to volunteer her services. She was about to hastily press forward and support her, when, by a strange accident, a young Taoist neophyte of twelve or thirteen years of age, who held the case containing scissors, 
with which he had been snuffing the candles burning in the various places, just seized the opportunity to run out and hide himself, when he unawares rushed head foremost into Lady Feng's arms. Lady Feng speedily raised her hand and gave him such a slap on the face that she made the young fellow reel over and perform a somersault. You boorish young bastard, she shouted. Where are you running to? The young Taoist did not even give a thought to picking up the scissors, but crawling up on to his feet again, he tried to scamper outside. But just at that very moment, Bao Chai and the rest of the young ladies were dismounting from their vehicles, and the matrons and women servants were closing them in so thoroughly on all sides that not a puff of wind or a drop of rain could penetrate. And when they perceived a Taoist neophyte come rushing headlong out of the place, they with one voice exclaimed, Catch him! Catch him! Beat him! Beat him! Olivia Jia overheard their cries. She asked with alacrity what the fuss was all about. Zha Zhen immediately stepped outside to make inquiries. Lady Feng then advanced, and propping up her old senior, she went on to explain to her that a young Taoist priest, whose duties were to snuff the candles, had not previously retired out of the compound, and that he was now endeavouring to recklessly force his way out. Be quick and bring the lad here, shouted Dao Zhe Lady Jia, as soon as she heard her explanation. But mind, don't frighten him. Children of mean families invariably get into the way of being spoiled by overindulgence. However could he have set eyes before upon such display as this? Were you to frighten him, he will really be much to be pitied, and won't his father and mother be exceedingly cut up? As she spoke, she asked Jia Zhen to go and do his best to bring him round. Jia Zhen felt under the necessity of going, and he managed to drag the lad into her presence. With the scissors still clasped in his hand, the lad fell on his knees and trembled violently. Dao Zhe Lady Jia bade Jia Zhen raise him up. There's nothing to fear, she said reassuringly. Then she asked him how old he was. The boy, however, could on no account give vent to speech. Poor boy once more exclaimed the old lady. And continuing, Brother Zhen, she added, Addressing herself to Zha Zhen, take him away and give him a few cash to buy himself fruit with, and to impress upon everyone that they are not to bully him. Zha Zhen signified his assent and led him off. During this time, old lady Zha, taking along with her the whole family party, paid her devotions in story after story, and visited every place. The young pages who stood outside watched their old mistress and the other inmates enter the second row of gates, but of a sudden they espied Jia Zhen went his way outwards, leading a young Taoist priest and calling the servants to come. Say, take him and give him several hundreds of cash and abstain from ill-treating him. At these orders, the domestics approached with hurried step and led him off. Jia Zhen then inquired from the terrace steps where the major dharma was. At this inquiry, the pages standing below called out in chorus, Major dharma, Lin Ji Xiao, ran over at once, while adjusting his hat with one hand and appeared in the presence of Jia Zhen. I bet this is a spacious place, Jia Zhen began. We muster a good concourse today, so you'd better bring into this court those servants will be of any use to you, and send over into that one those who won't, and choose a few from among those young pages to remain on duty, at the second gate and at the two side entrances, so as to ask for things and deliver messages. Do you understand me? Yes or no? The young ladies and ladies have all come out of town today, and not a single outsider must be permitted to put his foot in here. I understand, replied Lin Ji Xiao, hurriedly signifying his obedience. Next, he uttered several yeses. 
Now, proceeded Jargen, you can go on your way. But how is it? I don't see anything of Ronger, he went on to ask. This question was barely out of his lips when he caught sight of Ronger running out of the belfry. Look at him, shouted Jargen. Look at him. I don't feel hot in here, and yet he must go in search of a cool place. Spit at him, he cried to the family servants. The young pages were fully aware that Jargen's ordinary disposition was such that he could not brook contradiction. And one of the lads speedily came forward and sputtered in Jia Yong's face. But Jia Zhen still kept his gaze fixed on him. So the young page had to inquire of Jia Yong. Master doesn't feel hot here, and how is it that you, sir, have been the first to go and get cool? Jia Yong, however, dropped his arms and did not venture to utter a single sound. Jia Yuan, Jia Ping, Jia Qing, and the other young people overheard what was going on, and not only were they scared out of their wits, but even Jia Ling, Jia Ping, Jia Chuo, and their companions were stricken with intense fright, and one by one they quietly slipped down along the foot of the wall. What are you standing there for? Jia Zhen shouted to Jia Yong. Don't you yet get on your horse and gallop home and tell your mother that our venerable senior is here? with all the young ladies, and bid them come at once and wait upon them. As soon as Jia Yong heard these words, he ran out with hurried stride and called out repeatedly for his horse. Now he felt resentment, arguing with him himself. Who knows what he has been up to the whole morning, that he now finds faults with me. Now he went on to abuse the young servants, crying, Are your hands made fast? that you can't lead the horse round, and he felt inclined to bid a servant boy go on the errand, but fearing again lest he should subsequently be found out and be at a loss how to account for his conduct, he felt compelled to proceed in person. So mounting his steed, he started on his way. But to return to Jia Zhen, just as he was about to betaken himself inside, he noticed the Taoist Zhang who stood next to him, forced a smile. I'm not properly speaking, he remarked, on the same footing as the others, and should be in attendance inside. But as on account of the intense heat, the young ladies have come out of doors. I couldn't presume to take upon myself to intrude and ask what your orders, sir, are. But the dowager lady may possibly inquire about me, or may like to visit any part of the temple. So I shall wait in here. Jia Chen was fully cognizant that this Taoist priest, Chang, had, it is true, in past days, stood as a substitute for the Duke of the Rongguo mansion, but that the former emperor had, with his own lips, conferred upon him the appellation of the immortal being of the great unreal, that he held at present the seal of Taoist superior, that the reigning emperor had raised him to the rank of the pure man, that the princes, nowadays dukes, and high officials styled him the supernatural being, and he did not therefore venture to treat him with any disrespect. In the second place, he knew that he had paid frequent visits to the mansions, and that he had made the acquaintance of the ladies and young ladies. So when he heard his present remark, he smilingly rejoined, Do you again make use of such language amongst ourselves? One word more, and I will take that beard of yours and outroot it. Don't you yet come along with me inside? Ha ah, ah, ha! laughed the Taoist Zhang aloud as he followed Jia Chen in. Jia Chen approached Taoja Lady Jia. Bending his body, he strained a laugh. Grandfather Zhang, he said, has come in to pay his respects. Raise him up, old lady Jia vehemently called out. Jia Zhen lost no time in pulling him to his feet and bringing him over. The Taoist Jiang first indulged in loud laughter. Oh, Buddha of unlimited years, he then observed. Have you kept all right and in good health throughout, venerable senior? Have all the ladies and young ladies continued well? I haven't been for some time to your mansion to pay my obeisance. 
but you, my dowager lady, have improved more and more. Venerable immortal being, smiled old lady Jia, how are you? Quite well. Thanks to the ten thousand blessings he has enjoined from your hands, rejoined Jiang the Taoist. Your servant too continues pretty strong and hell. In every other respect, I have after all been all right, but I have felt much concern about Mr. Bao Yu. Has he been all right all the time? The other day on the 26th of the fourth moon, I celebrated the birthday of the heaven-pervading mighty king. Few people came and everything went off right and proper. I told them to invite Mr. Bao to come for a stroll, but how was it? They said that he wasn't at home. It was indeed true that he was away from home, remarked Dowager Lady Jia. As she spoke, she turned her head round and called Bao Yu. Bao Yu had, as it happened, just returned from outside where he had been to make himself comfortable, and with speedy step, he came forward. My respects to you, Grandfather Jiang, he said. The Taoist Jiang eagerly clasped him in his arms and inquired how he was getting on. Turning towards old lady Jia, Mr. Bao, he observed, has grown fatter than ever. Outwardly, his looks, replied Dowager Lady Jia, may be all right, but inwardly he is weak. In addition to this, his father presses him so much to study that he has again and again managed all through this bullying to make his child fall sick. The other day, continued Jiang the Taoist, I went to several places on a visit and saw characters written by Mr. Bao and verses composed by him, all of which were exceedingly good. So how is it that his worthy father still feels displeased with him and maintains that Mr. Bao is not very fond of his books? According to my humble idea, he knows quite enough. As I consider Mr. Bao's face, his bearing, his speech, and his deportment, he proceeded, heaving a sigh, what a striking resemblance I found in him to the former duke of the Yong mansion. As he uttered these words, tears rolled down his cheeks. At these words, old lady Jia herself found it hard to control her feelings. Her face became covered with the traces of tears. Quite so, she assented. I've had ever so many sons and grandsons, and not one of them betrayed the slightest resemblance to his grandfather, and this Bao Yu turns out to be the very image of him. What the former Duke of Yong Guo was like in appearance, Jiang, the Taoist went on to remark, addressing himself to Jia Chen, you gentlemen and your generation were, of course, needless to say, not in time to see for yourselves. But I fancy that even our senior master and our master secundus have but a faint recollection of it. This said, he burst into another loud fit of laughter. The other day, he resumed, I was at someone's house, and there I met a young girl, who is this year in her fifteenth year, and verily gifted with a beautiful face, and I bethought myself that Mr. Bao must also have a wife found for him. As far as looks, intelligence, and mental talents, extraction and family standing go, this maiden is a suitable match for him. But as I didn't know what your venerable ladyship would have to say about it, your servant did not presume to act recklessly, but waited until I could ascertain your wishes before I took upon myself to open my mouth with the parties concerned. Some time ago, responded Dowager Lady Jia, a bonze explained that it was ordained by destiny that this child shouldn't be married at an early age, and that we should put things off until he grew somewhat in years before anything was settled. But, mark my words now, pay no regard as to whether she be of wealthy and honourable stock or not. The essential thing is to find one whose looks make her a fit match for him, and then come at once and tell me. For even admitting that the girl is poor, all I shall have to do will be to bestow on her a few ounces of silver. But fine looks and a sweet temperament are not easy things, to come across. When she had done speaking, Lady Feng was heard to smilingly interpose. Grandfather Chang, aren't you going to change the talisman of recorded name of our daughter? The other day, lucky enough for you, you had again the great cheek to send someone to ask me for some satin of gosling yellow color. I gave it to you, for had I not, I was afraid lest your old face 
should have been made to feel uneasy. Ha ah, ah, ha! roared the tower's chan. Just see how my eyes must have grown dim. I didn't notice that you, my lady, were in here, nor did I express one word of thanks to you. The talisman of recorded name is ready long ago. I meant to have sent it over the day before yesterday, but the unforeseen visit of the empress to perform meritorious deeds upset my equilibrium and made me quite forget it. But it's still placed before the gods, and if you will wait, I will go and fetch it. Saying this, he rushed into the main hall. Presently, he returned with a tea tray in hand, on which was spread a deep red satin cover, brocaded with dragons. In this, he presented the charm. Da Jie's nurse took it from him. But just as the Taoist was on the point of taking Da Jie in his embrace, Lady Feng remarked with a smile, It would have been sufficient if you carried it in your hand. And why use a tray to lay it on? My hands aren't clean, replied the Taoist Chang. So how could I very well have taken hold of it? A tray therefore make things much cleaner. When you produced that tray just now, laughed Lady Feng, you gave me quite a start. I didn't imagine that it was for the purpose of bringing the charm in. It really looked as if you were disposed to beg donation of us. This observation sent the whole company into a violent fit of laughter. Even Jia Zhen could not suppress a smile. What a monkey, Dowager Lady Jia exclaimed, turning her head round. What a monkey you are. Aren't you afraid of going down to that hell where tongues are cut off? I've got nothing to do with any man whatever, rejoined Lady Feng laughing. And why does he time and again tell me that it's my bounden duty to lay up a store of meritorious deeds, and that if I'm remiss, my life will be short? Jam, the Taoist, indulged in further laughter. I brought out, he explained, the tray so as to kill two birds with one stone. It wasn't, however, to beg for donations. On the contrary, it was in order to put in it the jade, which I meant to ask Mr. Bao to take off, so as to carry it outside and let all those Taoist friends of mine, who come from far away, as well as my neophytes and the young apprentices, see what it's like. Well, since that be the case, and the old lady Jia, why do you, at your age, try your strength by running about the whole day long? Take him at once along and let them see it. But were you to have caught him in there, wouldn't it have saved a lot of trouble? Your venerable ladyship, resumed Jiang, the Taoist, isn't aware that though I be, to look at, a man of eighty, I, after all, continue, thanks to your protection, my Dowager Lady, quite hell and strong. In the second place, there are crowds of people in outer rooms, and the smells are not agreeable. Besides, it's a very hot day, and Mr. Bao couldn't stand the heat, as he is not accustomed to it. So, were he to catch any disease from the filthy odors, it would be a grave thing. After these forebodings, old Lady Jia accordingly desired Bao Yu to unclasp the jade of spiritual perception and to deposit it in the tray. The Taoist, Zhang, carefully ensconced it in the folds of the wrapper, embroidered with dragons, and left the room, supporting the tray with both his hands. During this while, Dowager Lady Jia and the other inmates devoted more of their time in visiting the various places, but just as they were on the point of going up the two-storied building, they heard Jia Jin shout, Grandfather Jiang has brought back the jade. As he spoke, the tower's Jiang was seen advancing up to them, the tray in hand, the whole company, he smiled, were much obliged to me. They think Mr. Bao's jay really lovely. None of them have, however, any suitable gifts to bestow. These are religious articles used by each of them in propagating the doctrines of reason. But they are all only too ready to give them as congratulatory presents. If Mr. Bao, you don't fancy them for anything else, just keep them to play with or to give away to others. Dowager Lady Jia, at these words, looked into the tray. She discovered that its contents consisted of gold signets and jade rings or scepters, implying, may you have your wishes accomplished in everything, or 
may you enjoy peace and health from year to year. That the various articles were strung with pearls or inlaid with precious stones, worked in jade or mounted in gold, and that they were in all from thirty to fifty. What nonsense you are talking, she then exclaimed. Those people are all divines, and where could they have rummaged up these things? But what need is there from any such presents? He may, on no account, accept them. These are intended as a small token of their esteem, responded Jan, the Taoist, smiling. Your servant cannot therefore venture to interfere with them. If your venerable ladyship will not keep them, will you make it patent to them that I am treated contemptuously? and unlike what one should be, who has joined the order through your household. Only when old lady Jia heard these arguments did she direct a servant to receive the presents. Venerable senior, Bao Yu smilingly chimed in, after the reasons advanced by grandfather Jiang, we cannot possibly refuse them, but I bet I feel disposed to keep these things, they are of no avail to me, so would it not be well where a servant told to carry the tray and to follow me out of doors, that I may distribute them to the poor? You are perfectly right in what you say, smiled Tao Zhu Lady Jia. The Taoist Jiang, however, went on speedily to use various arguments to dissuade him. Mr. Bao, he observed, your intention is, it is true, to perform charitable acts, but though you may aver that these things are of little value, you will nevertheless find among them several articles you might turn to some account. Were you to let the beggars have them? Why? They will, first of all, be none the better for them, and next, it will, contrary wise, be tantamount to throwing them away. If you want to distribute anything among the poor, why don't you do out cash to them? Put them by, promptly shouted Bao Yu after this rejoinder. And when evening comes, Take a few cash and distribute them. These directions given, Jiang, the Taoist, retired out of the place. End of section 9. Section 10 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two, by Chiao Shu Qing, translated by Henry Bancroft Jolly, Chapter Twenty Nine, Part Two. Dowager Lady Jia and her companions thereupon walked upstairs and sat in the main part of the building. Lady Feng and her friends adjourned into the eastern part while the waiting maids and servants remained in the western portion and took their turns in waiting on their mistresses. Before long, Jia Zhen came back. The place, he announced, had been chosen by means of slips picked out before the guard. The first one on the list is the record of the white snake. Of what kind of old story does the record of the white snake treat? Only the Jia inquired. The story above Han Gao Zhu, replied Jia Zhen, killing a snake and then ascending the throne. The second plate is the bed covered with ivory tablets. Has this been assigned to second place? asked Daozhi Lady Jia. Yet never mind, for as the gods will it us, there is no help then not to demur. But what about the third play? She went on to inquire. The Nanke dream is the third, Jia Chen answered. This response elicited no comments from Daozhi Lady Jia. Jia Chen therefore withdrew downstairs and betook himself outside to make arrangements for the offerings to the gods, for the paper money and eatables that had to be burned, and for the theatricals about to begin. So we will leave him without any further allusion and take up our narrative with Bao Yu. Sitting himself upstairs next to old lady Jia, he called to a servant girl to fetch the tray of presents given to him a short while back, and putting on his own trinket of jade, he fumbled about with the things for a bit and picking up one by one. He handed them to his grandmother to admire, but 
old lady Cha espied among them a unicorn made of pebbleless gold with kingfisher feathers inserted, and eagerly extending her arm, she took it up. This object, she smiled, seems to me to resemble very much one I've seen worn also by the young lady of some household or other of ours. Senior cousin, Xie si Xiang Yun, chimed in Bao Chai, a smile playing on her lips, has one, but it's a trifle smaller than this. Is it indeed Yu Er? Who has it? exclaimed old lady Jia. Now that she lives in our house, remarked Bao Yu, how is it that even I haven't seen anything of it? Cousin Bao Chai, rejoined Tan Chen laughingly, has the power of observation. No matter what she sees, she remembers. Lin Dai Yu gave a sardonic smile. As far as other matters are concerned, she insinuated, her observation isn't worth speaking of. Whereas she's extra observant is in articles people may wear about their persons. Bao Chai, upon catching this sneering remark, at once turned her head round and pretended she had not heard. But as soon as Bao Yu learned that Qi Xiang Yong possessed a similar trinket, he speedily picked up the unicorn and hid it in his breast, indulging at the same time in further reflection, yet fearing lest people might have noticed that he kept back that particular thing the moment he discovered that Xi Xiang Yong had one identical with it. He fixed his eyes intently upon all around while clutching it. He found, however, that not one of them was paying any heed to his movements, except Lin Da Yu, who, while gazing at him, was nodding her head, as if with the idea of expressing her admiration. Bao Yu therefore at once felt inwardly ill at ease, and pulling out his hand, he observed, addressing himself to Da Yu, with an assumed smile, This is really a fine thing to play with. I'll keep it for you, and when we get back home, I'll pass a ribbon through it for you to wear. I don't care about it, said Lin Da Yu, giving her head a sudden twist. Well, continued Bao Yu laughingly, if you don't like it, I can't do otherwise than keep it myself. Saying this, he once again thrust it away, but just as he was about to open his lips to make some other observation, he saw Mrs. Yao, the spouse of Jia Zhen, arrive along with the second wife recently married by Jia Rong, that is, his mother and her daughter-in-law, to pay their obeisance to Daoja Lady Jia. What do you people rush over here for again? Old Lady Jia inquired. I came here for a turn, simply because I had nothing to do. But no sooner was this inquiry concluded than they heard a messenger announce that someone had come from the house of General Feng. The family of Feng Ziying had, it must be explained, come to learn the news that the inmates of the Jia mansion were offering a thanksgiving service in the temple. And without loss of time, they got together presents of pigs, sheep, candles, tea, and eatables, and sent them over. The moment Lady Feng heard about it, she hastily crossed to the main part of the two-storied building. Ay ya, she ejaculated, clapping her hands and laughing. I never expected anything of the sort. We merely said that we ladies were coming for a leisurely stroll, and people imagined that we were spreading a sumptuous altar with lantern viands, and came to bring us offerings. But it's all our old lady's fault for putting it about. Why, we haven't even got any slips of paper with tips ready. She had just finished speaking when she perceived two matrons who acted as housekeepers in the Feng family walk upstairs. But before the Feng servants could take their leave, presents likewise arrived in quick succession from Chao, the vice president of the board. In due course, one lot of visitors followed another. For as everyone got wind of the fact that the Jia family was having Thanksgiving services, and that the ladies were in the temple, distant and close relatives, friends, old friends, and acquaintances all came to present their contributions. So much so that Daoja Lady Jia began at this juncture to feel sorry that she had ever let the cat out of the bag. 
This is no regular fasting, she said. We simply have come for a little change, and we should not have put anyone to any inconvenience. Although, therefore, she was to have remained present all day at the theatrical performance, she promptly returned home soon after noon, and the next day she felt very loath to go out of doors again. By striking the wall, we have also stirred up dust, Lady Feng argued. Why we have already put those people to the trouble, so we should only be too glad today to have another outing. But as when Dowager Lady Jia interviewed the Taoist Zhang the previous day, he made allusion to Pao Yu and canvassed his engagement. Pao Yu experienced, little as one would have thought it, much secret displeasure during the whole of that day. And on his return home, he flew into a rage and abused Chang, the rationalistic priest, for harboring designs to try and settle a match for him. At every breath and at every word, he resolved that henceforward he would not set eyes again upon the Tao's Chang. But no one but himself had any idea of the reason that actuated him to absent himself. In the next place, Lin Tai-yu began also, on her return the day before, to ail from a touch of the sun. So the grandmother was induced by these two considerations to remain firm in her decision not to go. When Lady Feng, however, found that she would not join them, she herself took charge of the family party and set out on the excursion. But without descending to particulars, let us advert to Bao Yu. Seeing that Lin Da Yu had fallen ill, he was so full of solicitude on her account that he even had little thought for any of his meals, and not long elapsed before he came to inquire how she was. Da Yu, on her part, gave way to fear lest anything should happen to him, and she tried to reassure him. Just go and look at the place, she therefore replied. What's the use of boxing yourself up at home? Bao Yu was, however, not in a very happy frame of mind on account of the reference to his marriage made by Jiang, the Taoist, the day before. So when he heard Lin Da Yu's utterances, if others don't understand me, he mused, it's anyhow excusable, but has she too begun to make fun of me? His heart smarted in consequence under the sting of a mortification a hundred times keener than he had experienced up to that occasion. Had he been with anyone else, it would have been utterly impossible for her to have brought into play feelings of such resentment. But as it was no other than Da Yu who spoke the words, the impression produced upon him was indeed different from that left in days gone by, when others employed similar language. Unable to curb his feelings, he instantaneously lowered his face. My friendship with you has been of no avail, he rejoined. But never mind, patience. This insinuation induced Lin Da Yu to smile a couple of sarcastic smiles. Yes, your friendship with me has been of no avail, she repeated. For how can I compare with those whose manifold qualities make them fit matches for you? As soon as this sneer fell on Bao Yu's ear, he drew near to her. Are you by telling me this, he asked, straight to her face, deliberately bent upon invoking imprecations upon me that I should be annihilated by heaven and extinguished by earth? Lin Da Yu could not for a time fathom the import of his remarks. It was, Bao Yu then resumed, on account of this very conversation that I yesterday swore several oaths. And now, would you really make me repeat another one? But were the heavens to annihilate me, and the earth to extinguish me, what benefit would you derive? This rejoinder reminded Da Yu of the drift of the conversation on the previous day. And as indeed she had on this occasion framed in words those sentiments which should not have dropped from her lips, she experienced both annoyance and shame, and she tremulously observed, If I entertain any deliberate intention to bring any harm upon you, may I too be destroyed by heaven and exterminated by earth. But what's the use of all this? 
I know very well that the allusion to marriage made yesterday by Jiang, the Taoist, fills you with dread, lest he might interfere with your choice. You are inwardly so irate that you come and treat me as your malignant influence. Pao Yu, the fact is, had ever since his youth developed a peculiar kind of mean and silly propensity. Having moreover from tender infancy grown up side by side with Dai Yu, their hearts and their feelings were in perfect harmony. More, he had recently come to know to a great extent what was what, and had also filled his head with the contents of a number of corrupt books and licentious stories of all the eminent and beautiful girls that he had met to in the families of either distant or close relatives or of friends, not one could reach the standard of Lin Da Yu. Hence, it was that he commenced from an early period of his life to foster sentiments of love for her. But as he could not very well give utterance to them, he felt time and again, sometimes elated, sometimes vexed and wound to exhaust every means to secretly subject her heart to a test. Lin Da Yu happened, on the other hand, to possess in like manner a somewhat silly disposition, and she too frequently had recourse to feigned sentiments to feel her way, and as she began to conceal her true feelings and inclinations and to simply dissimulate, and he to conceal his true sentiments and wishes and to dissemble, the two unrealities thus blended together constituted eventually one reality. But it was hardly to be expected that trifles would not be the cause of tiffs between them. Thus it was that in Pao Yu's mind at this time prevailed the reflection that were others unable to read my feelings, it would anyhow be excusable. But is it likely that you cannot realize that in my heart and in my eyes there is no one else besides yourself? But as you were not able to do anything to dispel my annoyance, but made use instead of the language you did to laugh at me and to gag my mouth, it's evidence that, though you hold at every second and at every moment a place in my heart, I don't, in fact, occupy a place in yours. Such was the construction attached to her conduct by Bao Yu. Yet he did not have the courage to tax her with it. If really I hold a place in your heart, Linda Yu again reflected, why do you, or bet what's said about gold and jade being a fit match, attach more importance to this perverse report and think nothing of what I say? Did you, when I so often broach the subject of this gold and jade, behave as if you, rarely, had never heard anything about it? I would then have seen that you treat me with preference and that you don't harbor the least particle of a secret design. But how is it that the moment I allude to the topic of gold and jade, you at once lose all patience? This is proof enough that you are continuously pondering over that gold and jade, and that as soon as you hear me speak to you about them, you apprehend that I shall once more give way to conjectures and intentionally pretend to be quite out of temper with the deliberate idea of cajoling me. These two cousins had, to all appearances, once been of one and the same mind. But the many issues which had sprung up between them brought about a contrary result and made them of two distinct minds. I don't care what you do, everything is well, Bao Yu further argued, so long as you act up to your feelings. And if you do, I shall be ever only too willing to even suffer immediate death for your sake. Whether you know this or not doesn't matter, it's all the same. Yet, were you to just do as my heart would have you, you afford me a clear proof that you and I are united by close ties and that you are no stranger to me. Just you mind your own business, Linda Yu on her side cogitated. If you will treat me well, I will treat you well. And what need is there to put an end to yourself for my sake? Are you not aware that if you kill yourself, I will also kill myself? But this demonstrates that you don't wish me to be near to you, and that you really want that I should be distant to you. It will thus be seen that the desire by which they were both actuated to 
to strive and draw each other close and ever closer became contrarywise, transformed into a wish to become more distant. But as it is no easy task to frame into words the manifold secret thoughts entertained by either, we will now confine ourselves to a consideration of their external manner. The three words, a fine match, which Pao Yu heard again Lin Da Yu pronounced, proved so revolting to him that his heart got full of disgust, and he was unable to give utterance to a single syllable. Losing all control over his temper, he snatched from his neck the jade of spiritual perception, and clenching his teeth, he spitefully dashed it down on the floor. What rubbishy trash, he cried. I'll smash you to atoms and put an end to the whole question. The jade, however, happened to be of extraordinary hardness, and did not, after all, sustain the slightest injury from this single fall. When Pao Yu realized that it had not broken, he forthwith turned himself round to get the trinket with the idea of carrying out his design of smashing it. But Tai Yu divined his intention and soon started crying. What's the use of all this? she demurred. And why, pray, do you better that dumb thing about? Instead of smashing it, wouldn't it be better for you to come and smash me? But in the middle of their dispute, Ji Zhuan, She Yan, and the other maids promptly interfered and quieted them. Subsequently, however, they show how deliberately bent Pao Yu was upon breaking the jade, and they vehemently rushed up to him to snatch it from his hand. But they failed in their endeavors, and perceiving that he was getting more troublesome than he had ever been before, they had no alternative but to go and call Zhe Yun. Zhe Yun lost no time in running over and succeeded at length in getting hold of the trinket. I'm smashing what belongs to me, remarked Bao Yu with a cynical smile. And what has that to do with you people? Zhe Yun noticed that his face had grown quite sallow from anger, that his eyes had assumed a totally unusual expression, and that he had never hitherto had such a fit of ill temper, and she hastened to take his hand in hers and to smilingly expostulate with him. If you had a tiff with your cousin, she said, it isn't worth while flinging this down. Had you broken it, how would her heart and face have been able to bear the mortification? Linda Yu shed tears and listened the while to her remonstrances. Yet these words, which so corresponded with her own feelings, made it clear to her that Bao Yu could not even compare with Zhe Ren and wounded her heart so much more to the quick that she began to weep aloud. But the moment she got so vexed, she found it hard to keep down the potion of Polactus and the decoction for counteracting the effects of the sun she had taken only a few minutes back, and with a wretch she brought everything up. Ji Zhuan immediately pressed to her side and used her handkerchief to stop her mouth with, but a mouthful succeeded mouthful, and in no time the handkerchief was soaked through and through. Sharon then approached in a hurry and tapped her on the back. You may of course give way to displeasure, Ji Zhuan argued, but you should, after all, take good care of yourself, miss. You have just taken the medicines and felt the better for them, and here you now begin vomiting again, and all because you have had a few words with our master Secundus. But should your complaint break out afresh, how would Mr. Bao bear the blow? The moment Bao Yu caught this advice, which accorded so thoroughly with his own ideas, he found how little Dai Yu could hold her own with Ji Zhuan. And perceiving how flushed Dai Yu's face was, how her temples were swollen, how while sobbing she panted, and how while crying she was suffused with perspiration and betrayed signs of extreme weakness, he began as the sight of her condition to reproach himself. I shouldn't, he reflected, have bandied words with her. For now that she's got into this frame of mind, I mayn't even suffer in her stead. The self-reproaches, however, which gnawed his heart, made it impossible for him to refrain from tears, much as he fought against them. 
Zhe Ren saw them both crying, and while attending to Bao Yu, she too unavoidably experienced much soreness of heart. She nevertheless went on rubbing Bao Yu's hands, which were icy cold. She felt inclined to advise Bao Yu not to weep, but fearing again lest, in the first place, Bao Yu might be inwardly aggrieved and nervous, in the next, lest she should not be dealing rightly by Bao Yu, she thought it advisable that they should all have a good cry, as they might then be able to leave off. She herself therefore also melted into tears. As for Ji Zhuan, at one time she cleaned the expectorated medicine, at another she took up a fan and gently fanned Dai Yu. But at the sight of the trio plunged in perfect silence, and of one and all sobbing for reasons of their own, grief, much though she did to struggle against it, mastered her feelings too, and producing a handkerchief, she dried the tears that came to her eyes. So there stood four inmates, face to face, uttering not a word, and indulging in weeping. Shortly, Zhe Ren made a supreme effort, and smilingly said to Bao Yu, If you don't care for anything else, you should at least have shown some regard for those tassels strung on the jade, and not have wrangled with Miss Lin. Da Yu heard these words, and mindless of her indisposition, she rushed over and snatching the trinket. She picked up a pair of scissors, lying close at hand, bent upon cutting the tassels. Zhe Ren and Ji Zhuan were on the point of wrestling it from her, but she had already managed to mangle them into several pieces. I have, sobbed Da Yu, wasted my energies on them for nothing. For he doesn't prize them. He's certain to find others to string some more fine tassels for him. Zhe Ren promptly took the jade. Is it worthwhile going on in this way? She cried. But this is all my fault for having blabbered just now what should have been left unsaid. Cut it, if you like, chimed in Bao Yu, addressing himself to Dai Yu. I will on no account wear it, so it doesn't matter a rap. But while all they minded inside was to create this commotion, they little dreamt that the old matrons had described Dai Yu whip bitterly and vomit copiously, and Bao Yu again dashed his jade on the ground, and that not knowing how far the excitement might not go, and whether they themselves might not become involved, they had repaired in a body to the front, and reported the occurrence to Dowager Lady Jia and Madame Wang their object being to try and avoid being themselves implicated in the matter. Their own mistress and Madame Wang, seeing them make so much of the occurrence as to rush with precipitate haste to bring it to their notice, could not in the least imagine what great disaster might not have befallen them. And without loss of time, they betook themselves together into the garden and came to see what the two cousins were up to. Jiren felt irritated and harbored resentment against Ji Zhuan. Unable to conceive what business she had to go and disturb their old mistress and Madame Wang, but Ji Zhuan, on the other hand, presumed that it was Zhe Ren who had gone and reported the matter to them, and she too cherished angry feelings towards Zhe Ren. Dowager Lady Jia and Madame Wang walked into the apartment they found Bao Yu on one side saying not a word, Lin Dai Yu on the other uttering not a sound. What's up again? they asked, but throwing the whole blame upon the shoulders of Ji Ren and Ji Zhuan. Why is it? they inquired, that you have not diligence in your attendance on them. They now start a quarrel. And don't you exert yourself in the least to restrain them? Therefore, with obloquy and hard words, they rated the two girls for a time in such a way that none of them could put in a word by way of reply, but felt compelled to listen patiently. And it was only after Dao Lady Jia had taken Bao Yu away with her that things quieted down again. One day passed, then came the third of the moon. This was Zhe Peng's birthday. So in their house, a banquet was spread and preparations made for a performance and to these the various inmates of the Jia mansion went. 
But as Pao Yu had so hurt Tai Yu's feelings, the two cousins saw nothing whatever of each other, and conscience stricken, despondent, and unhappy as he was at this time, could he have had any inclination to be present at the place? Hence it was that he refused to go on the pretext of indisposition. Lin Tai Yu had got a couple of days back, but a slight touch of the sun and naturally there was nothing much to matter with her. When the news, however, reached her that he did not intend to join the party, if with his weakness for wine and for theatricals, she pondered within herself, he now chooses to stay away instead of going. Why? That quarrel with me yesterday must be at the bottom of it all. If this isn't the reason, well then it must be that he has no wish to attend, as he sees that I'm not going either. But I should on no account have cut the tassels from that jade, for I feel sure he won't wear it again. I shall therefore have to strain some more on to it before he puts it on. On this account, the keenest remorse gnawed her heart. Tao Lady Jia saw well enough that they were both under the influence of temper. We should avail ourselves on this occasion, she said to herself, to go over and look at the place. And as soon as the two young people come face to face, everything will be squared. Contrary to her expectations, neither of them would volunteer to go. This so exasperated their old grandmother that she felt vexed with them. In what part of my previous existence could an old sufferer like myself, she exclaimed, have incurred such retribution that my destiny is to come across these two troublesome new-fledged foes? Why, not a single day goes by without their being instrumental in worrying my mind. The proverb is indeed correct, which says that people who are not enemies are not brought together. But shortly my eyes shall be closed, this breath of mine shall be snapped, and those two enemies will be free to cause trouble even up to the very skies. For as my eyes will then lose the power of vision, and my heart will be void of concern, it will really be nothing to me. But I couldn't very well stifle this breath of life of mine. While inwardly a prey to resentment, she also melted into tears. These words were brought to the ears of Bao Yu and Dai Yu. Neither of them had hitherto heard the adage, people who are not enemies are not brought together. So when they suddenly got to know the line, it seemed as if they had apprehended abstraction. Both lowered their heads and meditated on the subtle sense of the saying. But unconsciously a stream of tears rolled down their cheeks. They could not, it is true, get a glimpse of each other, Yet, as the one was in the Xiaoxiang Lodge, standing in the breeze, bedewed with tears, and the other in the Yi Hong Court, facing the moon and heaving deep sighs, was it not, in fact, a case of two persons living in two distinct places, yet with feelings emanating from one and the same heart? Zheren consequently tendered advice to Bao Yu. You are a million times to blame, she said. It's you who are entirely at fault. For when some time ago the pages in the establishment wrangled with their sisters, or when husband and wife fell out, and you came to hear anything about it, you blew up the lads and called them fools for not having the heart to show some regard to girls. And now here you go and follow their lead. But tomorrow is the fifth day of the moon, a great festival, and will you two still continue like this, as if you were very enemies? If so, our venerable mistress will be the more angry, and she certainly will be driven sick. I advise you, therefore, to do what's right by suppressing your spite and confessing your fault, so that we should all be on the same terms as hitherto. You here will then be all right, and so will she over there. Bao Yu listened to what she had to say, but whether he fell in with her views or not is not yet ascertained. Yet, if you, reader, choose to know, we will explain in the next chapter. End of section 10
Section 11 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Min. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2, by Cao Xueqin. Translated by Henry Bancroft Jolie. Chapter 30, Part 1. Bao Chai avails herself of the excuse afforded her by a fan to administer a couple of wraps, while Chun Ling traces, in an absent frame of mind, the outlines of the character Chang, a looker on appears on the scene. Ling Tai Yu herself, for we will now resume our narrative, was also ever since her tiff with Bao Yu full of self condemnations. Yet, as she did not see why she should run after him, she continued, day and night, as despondent as she would have been had she lost something or other belonging to her. Zijun surmised her sentiments. As regards what happened the other day, she advised her, you were after all, miss, a little too hasty, for if others don't understand that temperaments of Bao Yu's, have you and I surely also no idea about it? Besides, haven't there been already one or two rows on account of that very jade? Tui! exclaimed Tai Yu, have you come on behalf of others to find fault with me, but however was I hasty? Why did you, smiled Zijian, take the scissors and cut that tassel when there was no good reason for it? So isn't Bao Yu less to blame than yourself, miss? I've always found his behaviors towards you, miss, without a fault. It's all the touchy dispositions of yours which make you so often perverse, that induces him to act as he does. Ling Dayu had every wish to make some suitable reply, when she heard someone calling at the door. Zijuan discerned the tone of voice. This sounds like Bao Yu's voice, she smiled. I expect he's come to make his apologies. I won't have anyone open the door, Dayu cried at these words. Here you are in the wrong again, miss, Zijuan observed. How will it ever do to let him get a sunstroke and come to some harm on a day like this, and under such a scorching sun? Saying this, she speedily walked out and opened the door. It was indeed Bao Yu. While ushering him in, she gave him a smile. I imagined, she said, that you would never again put your foot inside our door, Master Secondus, but here you are, once more and quite unexpectedly. You have by dint of talking, Bao Yu laughed, made much ado of nothing, and why shouldn't I come when there's no reason for me to keep away? Were I even to die, my spirit too will come a hundred times a day. But is cousin quite well? She is, replied Zijian, physically all right, but mentally her resentment is not quite over. I understand, continued Bao Yu with a smile, but resentment, for what? With this inquiry, he wended his steps inside the apartment. He then caught sight of Ling Da Yu reclining on a bed in the act of crying. Dai Yu had not, in fact, shed a tear, but hearing Bao Yu breaking upon her, she could not help feeling upset. She found it impossible, therefore, to prevent her tears from rolling down her cheeks. Bao Yu assumed a smiling expression and drew near the bed. Cousin, are you quite well again? he inquired. Dai Yu simply went on drying her tears and made no reply of any kind. Bao Yu approached the bed and sat on the edge of it. I know, he smiled, that you are not vexed with me. But had I not come, third parties would have been allowed to notice my absence, and it would have appeared to them as if we had had another quarrel. And had I to wait until they came to reconcile us, would we not, by that time, become perfect strangers? It would be better, supposing you wish to beat me or blow me up, that you should please yourself and do so now. But whatever you do, don't give me the cold shoulder. Continuing, he proceeded to call her my dear cousin for several tens of times. Dai Yu had resolved not to pay any more heed to Bao Yu. When Xu, however, now heard Bao Yu urge, don't let us allow others to know anything about our having had a quarrel, as it will look as if we had become thorough strangers, it once more became evident to her from this single remark that she was really dearer and nearer to him than any of the other girls. 
so she could not refrain from saying sobbingly, "You needn't have come to chaff me. I couldn't presume henceforward to be on friendly terms with you, Master Secundus. You should treat me as if I were gone." At these words, Bao Yu gave way to laughter. "Where are you off to?" he inquired. "I'm going back home," answered Dai Yu. "I'll go along with you then," smiled Bao Yu. "But if I die," asked Dai Yu. "Well, if you die," rejoined Bao Yu. I'll become a bones. The moment Dai Yu caught this reply, she hung down her head. "You must, I presume, be bent upon dying," she cried. "But what stuff and nonsense is this you are talking? You've got so many beloved elder and younger cousins in your family, and how many bodies will you have to go and become boneses when by and by they all pass away? But tomorrow I'll tell them about this to judge for themselves what your motives are." Bao Yu was himself aware of the fact that this rejoinder had been recklessly spoken, and he was seized with regret. His face immediately became suffused with blushes. He lowered his head and had not the courage to utter one word more. Fortunately, however, there was no one present in the room. Tai Yu stared at him for ever so long with eyes fixed straight on him, but losing control over her temper, "Ai!" she shouted, "Can't you speak?" Then, when she perceived Bao Yu reduced to such straits as to turn purple, she clenched her teeth and spitefully gave him on the forehead a fillip with her finger. "Huh!" <laughs> she cried, gnashing her teeth. "You, this!" But just as she had pronounced these two words, she heaved another sigh and, picking up her handkerchief, she wiped her tears. Bao Yu treasured at one time numberless tender things in his mind. Which he meant to tell her, but feeling also, while he smarted under the sting of self-reproach for the indiscretion he had committed, Tai Yu gave him a rap. He was utterly powerless to open his lips, much though he may have liked to speak. So he kept on sighing and snivelling to himself, with all these things therefore to work upon his feelings. He unwillingly melted into tears. He tried to find his handkerchief to dry his face with. But unexpectedly, discovering that he had again forgotten to bring one with him, he was about to make his coat sleeve answer the purpose. When Tai Yu, albeit her eyes were watery, noticed at a glance that he was going to use the brand new coat of grey-coloured gauze he wore, and while wiping her own, she turned herself round and seized a silk kerchief thrown over the pillow, and thrust it into Bao Yu's lap. But without saying a word, she screened her face and continued sobbing. Bao Yu saw the handkerchief she threw, and hastily snatching it, he wiped his tears. Then, drawing nearer to her, he put out his hand and clasped her hand in his, and smilingly said to her, "You've completely lacerated my heart, and do you still cry? But let's go. I'll come along with you and see our venerable grandmother." Tai Yu thrust his hand aside. Who wants to go hand in hand with you? She cried. Here we grow older day after day, but we're still so full of brazen-faced effrontery that we don't even know what right means. But scarcely had she concluded before she heard a voice say aloud, "They are all right." Bao Yu and Tai Yu were little prepared for the surprise, and they were startled out of their senses. Turning around to see who it was, they caught sight of Lady Feng, running in. Laughing and shouting, our old lady, she said, is over there giving way to anger against heaven and earth. She would insist upon my coming to find out whether you were reconciled or not. There's no need for me to go and see. I told her, they will before the expiry of three days be friends again of their own accord. Our venerable ancestor, however, called me to account and maintained that I was lazy. So here I come. But my words have in very deed turned out true. I don't see why you two should always be wrangling. For three days you are on good terms, and for two on bad. You've become more and more like children, and here you are now, hand in hand, blubbering. But why did you again yesterday become like black-eyed fighting cocks? Don't you yet come with me to see your grandmother and make an old lady like her set her mind at ease a bit? While reproaching them, she clutched Dai Yu's hand and was trudging away. When Dai Yu. Turned her head round and called out for her servant girls, but not one of them was in attendance. 
What do you want them for again? Lady Feng asked. I'm here to wait on you. Still speaking, she pulled her along on their way, with Bao Yu following in their footsteps. Then, making their exit out of the garden gate, they entered Dowager Lady Jia's suite of rooms. I said that it was superfluous for anyone to trouble. Lady Feng smiled, as they were sure of themselves to become reconciled. But you, dear ancestor, so little believed it that you insisted upon my going to act the part of mediator. Yet when I got there, with the intentions of inducing them to make it up, I found them, though one did not expect it, in each other's company, confessing their faults and laughing and chatting just like a yellow eagle clutching the feet of a kite, where those two hanging on to each other. So where was the necessity for anyone to go? These words evoked laughter from everyone in the room. Bao Chai, however, was present at the time, so Ling Daiyu did not retort, but went and ensconced herself in a seat near her grandmother. When Bao Yu noticed that no one had anything to say, he smilingly addressed himself to Bao Chai. On cousin Xue Pan's birthday, he remarked, "I happened again to be unwell, so not only did I not send him any presents, but I failed to go and knock my head before him. Yet cousin knows nothing about my having been ill." And it would seem to him that I had no wish to go, and that I brought forward excuses so as to avoid paying him a visit. If tomorrow you find any leisure, cousin, do therefore explain matters for me to him. This is too much punctiliousness," smiled Bao Chai. "Even had you insisted upon going, we wouldn't have been so arrogant as to let you put yourself to the trouble, and how much less when you were not feeling well." You two are cousins and are always to be found together the whole day. If you encourage such ideas, some estrangement will, after all, arise between you. Cousin, continued Bao Yu smilingly, you know what to say, and so long as you are lenient with me, all will be all right. But how is it? He went on to ask that you haven't gone over to see the theatricals. I couldn't stand the heat, rejoined Bao Chai. I looked on while two plays were being sung. But I found it so intensely hot that I felt anxious to retire. But the visitors not having dispersed, I had to give as an excuse that I wasn't feeling up to the mark, and so came away at once. Bao Yu, at these words, could not but feel ill at ease. All he could do was to feign another smile. It's no wonder, he observed, that they compare you, cousin, to Yang Guifei, for she was too fat and afraid of hot weather. Hearing this, Bao Chai involuntarily flew into a violent rage. Yet, when about to call him to task, she found that it would not be nice for her to do so. After some reflections, the color rushed to her cheeks. Smiling ironically twice, "I may resemble," she said, "Yang Guifei, but there's not one of you young men, whether senior or junior, good enough to play the part of Yang Guozhong." While they were bandying words, a servant girl. Jiang Er lost sight of her fan and laughingly remarked to Bao Chai, "It must be you, Miss Bao, who have put my fan away somewhere or other, dear mistress. Do let me have it." "You'd better be mindful," rejoined Bao Chai, shaking her finger at her. "With whom have I ever been up to jokes that you come and suspect me? Have I hated to laughed and smirked with you? There's that whole lot of girls. Go and ask them about it." At his suggestions, Jiang Er made her escape. The consciousness then burst upon Bao Yu that he had again been inconsiderate in his speech, in the presence of so many persons, and he was overcome by a greater sense of shame than when, a short while back, he had been speaking with Ling Da Yu. Precipitately turning himself round, he went therefore and talked to the others as well. The sight of Bao Yu poking fun at Bao Chai gratified Da Yu immensely. She was just about to put in her word and also seized the opportunity of chaffing her, but as Jiang Er unawares asked for her fan and Bao Chai added a few more remarks, she at once changed her purpose. Cousin Bao Chai, she inquired, "What two plays did you hear?" Bao Chai caught the expressions of gratification in Dai Yu's countenance and concluded that she had, for a certainty, heard the raillery recently indulged in by Bao Yu. And that it had fallen in with her own wishes, and hearing her also suddenly asked the question she did, she answered with a significant laugh. What I saw was Li Kui blows up Song Jiang and subsequently again tender his apologies. 
Pao Yu smiled. "How is it?" he said. That with such wide knowledge of things new as well as old, and such general informations as you possess, you aren't even up to the name of a play, and that you've come out with such a whole string of words. Why, the real name of the play is, carrying a birch and begging for a punishment. Is it truly called carrying a birch and begging for punishment? Pao Chai asked with love. But you people know all things new and also are able to understand the import of carrying a birch and begging for punishment. As for me, I have no idea whatever what carrying a birch and begging for punishment implies. One sentence was scarcely ended when Pao Yu and Da Yu felt guilty in their consciences, and by the time they heard all she said, they were quite flushed from shame. Lady Feng did not, it is true, fathom the gist of what had been said. But at the sight of the expression betrayed on the faces of the three cousins, she readily got an inkling of it. On this broiling hot day, she inquired, laughing also, "Who still eats raw ginger?" None of the party could make out the import of her insinuations. "There's no one eating raw ginger," they said. Lady Feng intentionally then brought her hands to her cheeks, and rubbing them, she remarked with an air of utter astonishment. Since there's no one eating raw ginger, how is it that you're all so fiery in the face? Hearing this, Pao Yu and Dai Yu waxed more uncomfortable than ever. So much so that Pao Chai, who meant to continue the conversations, did not think it nice to say anything more when she saw how utterly abashed Pao Yu was and how changed his manner. Her only cause was, therefore, to smile and hold her peace. And as the rest of the inmates had not the faintest notions of the drift of the remarks exchanged between the four of them, they consequently followed her lead and put on a smile. In a short while, however, Bao Chai and Lady Feng took their leave. You've also tried your strength with them, Dai Yu said to Bao Yu laughingly, but they are far worse than I. Is everyone as simple in mind and dull of tongue as I am as to allow people to say whatever they like? Pao Yu was inwardly giving way to that unhappiness which had been occasioned by Pao Chai's touchiness. So when he also saw Dai Yu approach him and taunt him, displeasure keener than ever was aroused in him. A desire then exerted itself to speak out his mind to her, but dreading lest Dai Yu should he in one of her sensitive moods, he, needless to say, stifled his anger and straightway left the apartment in a state of mental depressions. End of chapter thirty, part one. Section twelve of the Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wen Rou Yi, Singapore. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two, by Cao Xueqing, translated by Henry Bancroft Jolly, Chapter Thirty, Part Two. It happened to be the season of the greatest heat. Breakfast time too was already past, and masters as well as servants were, for the most part, under the influence of the latitude for lengthy days. As Pao Yu therefore strolled from place to place, his hand behind his back, he heard not so much as the call of a crow, issuing out of his grandmother's compound on the near side. He wended his steps westward, and crossed the passage on which Lady Feng's quarters gave. As soon as he reached the entrance of her court, he perceived the door ajar. But aware of Lady Feng's habit of taking during the hot weather a couple of hours sister at noon, he did not feel it a convenient moment to intrude. Walking accordingly through the corner door, he stepped into Madame Wang's apartment. Here he discovered several waiting maids, dozing with their needlework clasped in their hands. Madame Wang was asleep on the cool couch in the inner rooms. Jing Chuan Er was sitting next to her, massaging her legs, but she too was quite drowsy, 
and her eyes were all array. Pao Yu drew up to her with gentle treat. The moment, however, was he unfastened the pendants from the earrings she wore. Jing Chuan opened her eyes, and realized that it was no one than Pao Yu. Are you feeling so worn out? He smilingly remarked in a low tone of voice. Jing Chuan pursed up her lips, and gave him a smile, then waving her hands so as to bid him quit the room, she again closed her eyes. Pao Yu, at the sight of her, felt considerable affection for her, and unable to tear himself away, so quietly stretching his head forward, and noticing that Madame Wang's eyes were shut. He extracted from a purse suspended about his person, one of the scented snow for moistening mouth pills, with which it was full, and placed it on Jing Chuan's lips. Jing Chuan, however, did not open her eyes, but simply held the pill in her mouth. Bao Yu then approached her and took her hand in his. "I ask you of your mistress," he gently observed, smiling. And you and I will live forever. To this, Jing Chuan said not a word. If that won't do, Bao Yu continued, "I'll wait for your mistress to wake and appeal to her at once." Jing Chuan distended her eyes wide, and pushed Bao Yu off. "What's the hurry?" she laughed. "A gold hairpin may fall into the well, but if it's yours, it'll remain yours only." Is it possible that you don't even see the spirit of this proverb? But I'll tell you a smart thing. Just you go into the small court on the east side, and you will find for yourself what Mister Jia Huan and Cai Yu are up to. Let them be up to whatever they like," smiled Bao Yu. "I shall simply stick to your side." But he then saw Madame Wang twist herself around, get up, and give a slap. To Jing Chuan on her mouth, you mean wench! She exclaimed, abusing her, while she pointed her finger at her. It's you, and the like of you, who corrupt these fine young fellows with all the nice things you teach them. The moment Bao Yu perceived Madame Wang rise, he bolted like a streak of smoke. Jing Chuan, meanwhile, felt half of her face as hot as fire. Yet she did not dare utter one word of complaint. The various waiting maids soon came to hear that Madame Wang had awoke, and they rushed in in a body. Go and tell your mother, Madame Wang thereupon said to Yu Chuan, to fetch your elder sister away. Jing Chuan at this words speedily fell on her knees, with tears in her eyes. I won't venture to do it again, she pleaded. If you, madam, wish to flog me or to scold me, do so at once, and as much as you like. But don't send me away. You will thus accomplish an act of heavenly grace. I've been in attendance on your ladyship for about ten years, and if you now drive me away, will I be able to look at any one in the face? Though Madame Wang was a generous, tender-hearted person. And had at no time raised her hand to give a single blow to any servant girl. She, however, when she accidentally discovered Jing Chuan behave on this occasion in this barefaced manner, a manner which had all her lifetime been most reprehensible to her, was so overcome by passion that she gave Jing Chuan just one slap and spoke to her a few sharp words. And albeit Jing Chuan indulged in solicitous entreaties, she would not, on any account, keep her in her service. At length, Jing Chuan's mother, Dame Bai, was sent for to take her away. Jing Chuan therefore had to conceal her disgrace, suppress her resentment, and quit the mansion. But without any further reference to her, we are now take up our story with Bao Yu. As soon as he saw Madame Wang awake, his spirits were crushed. All along, he hastily made his way into the Daguan Garden. Here, his attention was attracted by the ruddy sun, shining in the zenith. 
the shade of the trees extending far and wide, the song of the cicadas filling the air, and by a perfect stillness, not even broken by the echo of a human voice. By the instant he got near the trellis with the cinnamon roses, the sound of sobs fell on his ear. Doubts and surmises crept into Pao Yu's mind. So halting at once, he listened with intentness. Then, actually, he discerned someone on the off side of the trellis. This was the fifth moon. The season when the flowers and the foliage of the cinnamon roses were in full bloom, furtively peeping through an aperture in the fence, Pao Yu saw a young girl squatting under the flowers and digging the ground with a hairpin she held in her hand. As she dug, she silently gave way to tears. Can it be possible, mused Pao Yu, that this girl too is stupid? Can she also be following Ping Er's example, and come to enter flowers? Why, if she's likewise really borrowing flowers? He afterwards went on to smilingly reflect. This can aptly be termed. Dong Shi tries to imitate a frown, but not only is what she does not original, but it is despicable to boot. You needn't. He meant to shout out to the girl, at the conclusion of this train of thought. Try and copy Miss Ling's example. But before the words had issued from his mouth, he luckily scrutinized her a second time, and found that the girl's features were quite unfamiliar to him. That she was no menial, and that she looked like one of the twelve singing maids, who are getting up the days. He could not, however, make out what roles she filled: scholars, girls, old men, women, or buffoons. Pao Yu quickly put out his tongue and stopped his mouth with his hand. How fortunate! He wordly soliloquized, "That I did not make any relentless remark. It was all because of my inconsiderate talk on the last two occasions that Ping Er got angry with me, and that Pao Cha felt hurt." And had I now given them offence also, I would have been in a still more awkward fix. While wrapped in these thoughts, he felt much annoyance at not being able to recognise who she was. But on further minute inspection, he noticed that this maiden, with contracted eyebrows, as beautiful as the hills in spring. Frowning eyes as clear as the streams in autumn, a face with transparent skin, and a slim waist was elegant and beautiful, and almost the very image of Lin Daiyu. Pao Yu could not, from the very first, make up his mind to wrench himself away, but as he stood gazing at her in a doltish mood, he realized that. Although she was tracing on the ground with the gold hairpin, she was not digging a hole to bury flowers in, but was merely delineating characters on the surface of the soil. Pao Yu's eyes followed the hairpin from first to last, as it went up and as it came down. He watched each dash, each dot, and each hook. He counted the strokes; they numbered eighteen. He himself then set to work and sketched with his finger on the palm of his hand the lines in their various directions and in the order they had been traced a few minutes back, so as to endeavour to guess what the character was. On completing the sketch, he discovered the moment he came to reflect that it was the character Qiang in the combination Qiang Wei. Representing cinnamon roses, she too, pondered Pao Yu, must have been bent upon writing verses, or supplying some line or other, and at the sight now of the flowers, the idea must have suggested itself to her mind, or it may very likely be that having spontaneously devised a couplet, she got suddenly elated and began.
for fear it should slip from her memory, to trace it on the ground so as to turn the rhythm. Yet there's no thing. Let me see, however, what she's going to write next. While cogitating, he looked once more. Though the girl was still tracing, but tracing up or tracing down, it was ever the character Tian. When he gazed again, it was still the self-same Tian, the one inside the fence fell, in fact, from an early stage into a foolish mood. And no sooner was one Tian finished than she started with another, so that she had already written several tens of them. The one outside gazed and gazed, until he unwittingly also got into the same foolish mood. Intent with his eyes upon following the movements of the pin, in his mind he communed thus with his own thoughts: This girl must, for a certainty, have something to say or some unspeakable, momentous secret, that she goes on like this. But if outwardly she behaves in this wise, who knows what anguish she may and suffer at heart? And yet, with a frame to all appearances so very delicate, how could she ever resist much inward anxiety? Woe is me that I am unable to transfer some part of her burden onto my own shoulders. In midsummer, cloudy and bright weather, uncertain, a few specks of clouds suffice to bring about rain. Of a sudden, a cold blast swept by. And tossed about by the wind, fell a shower of rain. Pao Yu perceived that the water trickling down the girl's head saturated her gauze attire in no time. It's pouring, Pao Yu debated within himself. And how can a frame like hers resist the burns of such a squall? Unable, therefore, to restrain himself, he vehemently shouted, "Leave off writing!" Sea is pouring. You're wet through. The girl caught his words, and was frightened out of her wits. Raising her head, she at once descried something, one or other, standing beyond the flowers and calling out to her, "Leave up writing. It's pouring." But as Pao Yu was firstly of handsome appearance. And that, secondly, the luxuriant abundance of flowers and foliage screamed with their thoughts, thick laden with leaves, the upper and lower part of his person, just leaving half of his countenance exposed to view. The maiden simply jumped at the conclusion that he must be a servant girl, and never for a moment dreamed that it might be Pao Yu. Many thanks, sister. For recalling me to my senses, she consequently smiled. Yet, is there forsooth anything outside there to protect you from the rain? This single remark proved sufficient to recall Pao Yu to himself. With an exclamation of "Aya," he at length became conscious that his whole body was cold as ice. Then, dropping his head, he realized that his own person too was drenched. This will never do," he cried, and with one breath he had to run back into the Yi Hong Court. His mind, however, continued much exercised about the girl, and she had nothing to shelter her from the rain. As the next day was the Dragon Ball Festival, Wen Guan and the other singing girls, twelve in all, were given a holiday, so they came into the garden and amused themselves. By roaming everywhere and anywhere, as luck would have it, the two girls, Bao Guan, who filled the role of young man, and Yu Guan, who represented young woman, were in the Yi Hong Court, enjoying themselves with Xi Ren, when rain set in and they were prevented from going back. So in a body, they stopped off the rain to allow the water to accumulate in the yard. Then catching those that could be caught, and driving those that had to be driven, they laid hold of a few of the green-headed ducks, variegated marsh birds, and coloured mandarin ducks, and tying their wings, they let them loose in the court to disport themselves. Closing the court, 
Xi Ren and her playmates stood together under the veranda and enjoyed the fun. Bao Yu therefore found the entrance shut. He gave a rap at the door, but as everyone inside was bent upon laughing, they naturally did not catch the sound. And it was only after he had called and called and made a noise by thumping at the door that they at last heard. Imagining, however, that Bao Yu could not be coming back at that hour, Xi Ren shouted, laughing, "Who sits now knocking at the door? There's no one to go and open." It's I," rejoined Bao Yu. "It's Miss Bao Chai's tone of voice," added She Yue. "Nonsense!" cried Qing Wen. "What would Miss Bao Chai come over to do at such an hour?" "Let me go," chimed in Xi Ren, and they threw the figure in the door. And if we can open, we'll open, for we mustn't let her go back wet through. With these words. She came along the passage to the doorway. On looking out, she espied Bao Yu dripping like a chicken drenched with rain. Seeing him in this plight, Xi Ren felt solicitous as well as amused. With alacrity, she flung the door wide open, laughing so heartily that she was doubled in two. "How could I ever have known?" she said, clapping her hands. That you had returned, sir. Yet how is that you run back in this high rain? Bao Yu had, however, been feeling in no happy frame of mind. He had fully resolved within himself to administer a few kicks to the person who came to open the door. So as soon as it was unbarred, he did not try to make sure who he was. But under the presumption that it was one of the servant girls, he raised his leg and gave her a kick on the side. "Aiya!" ejaculated Xi Ren. Bao Yu nevertheless went on to abuse. "You mean things!" he shouted. "It's because I've always treated you so considerately that you don't respect me in the last, and you now go to the length of making a laughing stock of me." As he spoke, he lowered his head. Then, catching sight of Xi Ren, in tears he realized that he had kicked the wrong person. "Hello," he said, pompously smiling. "Is it you who've come? Where did I kick you?" Xi Ren had never, previous to this, received even a harsh word from him. When therefore she, on this occasion, Unexpectedly, saw Bao Yu gave her a kick in a fit of anger, and what made it worse, in the presence of so many people, shame, resentment, and bodily pain overpowered her, and she did not, in fact, for a time know where to go and hide herself. She was then about to give rein to her displeasure, but the reflection that Bao Yu could not have kicked her intentionally. Obliged her to suppress her indignation. Instead of kicking, she remarked, "Don't you yet go and change your clothes?" Bao Yu walked into the room. As he did so, he smiled. "Up to the age I've reached," he observed. "This is the first instance on which I've ever so thoroughly lost control over my temper as to strike anyone." And. Contrary to all my thoughts, it's you that happened to come in my way. Xi Ren, while patiently enduring the pain, effected the necessary change in his attire. I've been here from the very first," she simultaneously added, smilingly. So, in all things, whether large or small, good or bad, it has naturally fallen to my share to bear the brunt. But not to say another word about your assault on me. Why, tomorrow you'll indulge your hand and start beating others. I did not strike you intentionally just now," retorted Bao Yu. "Who ever said," rejoined Xi Ren, "that you did it intentionally? It has ever been the duty of the tribe of servant girls to open and shut the doors, yet they've got into the way of being obstinate." And have long ago become such an abomination 
that people's teeth itch to revenge themselves on them. They don't know, besides, what fear means. So had you first assured yourself that it was they and given them a kick, a little intimidating would have done them good. But I'm at the bottom of the mischief that happened just now, for not calling those upon whom it devolves to come and open for you. During the course of their conversation, the rain ceased, and Bao Guan and Yu Guan had been able to take their leave. Xi Ren, however, experienced such intense pain in her side, and felt such inward vexation, that at supper she could not put a morsel of anything in her mouth. When in the evening, as the time came for her to have her bath, she discovered. On divesting herself of her clothes, a bluish bruise on her side of the size of a saucer, and she was very much frightened. But as she could not very well say anything about it to anyone, she presently retired to rest. But twitches of pain made her involuntarily moan in her dreams, and groan in her sleep. Bao Yu did, it is true, not hurt her with any maladies. But when he saw Xi Ren so listless and restless, and suddenly heard her groan in the cold of the night, he realized how severely he must have kicked her. So getting out of bed, he gently seized the lantern and came over to look at her. But as soon as he reached the side of her bed, he perceived Xi Ren expectorate with a rage, a whole mouthful of phlegm. Oh me! She gasped as she opened her eyes. The presence of Bao Yu startled her out of her wits. What are you up to? She asked. You gone in your dreams, answered Bao Yu. So I must have kicked you hard. Do let me see. My hand feels giddy, said Xi Ren. My throat foul and sweet. Throw the light on the floor. At these words. Bao Yu actually raised the lantern. The moment he cast the light below, he discerned a quantity of fresh blood on the floor. Bao Yu was seized with consternation. Dreadful was all he could say. At the sight of the blood, Xi Ren's heart too partly waxed cold. But reader, the next chapter will reveal in sequel. If you really have any wish to know more about them, end of section twelve. Recording by Wen Rou Yi, Singapore. Section thirteen of the Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer. Please visit LibriVox.org. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two, by Chao Shuqing, translated by Henry Bancroft Jolie, Chapter Thirty One, Part One. Bao Yu allows the girl Qing Wen to tear his fan, so as to afford her amusement. A wedding proves to be the result of the descent of a unicorn. But to proceed, when she saw on the floor the blood she had brought up, Jiren immediately grew partly cold. What she had often heard people mention in past days, that the lives of young people who expectorate blood are uncertain, and that although they may live long, they are, after all, mere rags, flashed through her mind. The remembrance of this saying at once completely scattered. To the winds, the wish she had all along cherished, of striving for honor, and of being able to boast of glory, and from her eyes unwittingly ran down streams of tears. When Bao Yu saw her crying, his heart was seized with anguish. Was it that preys on your mind? He consequently asked her. Jiren strained every nerve to smile. There's no rhyme or reason for anything," she replied. "So what can it be? 
Ah Wu's intention was to there and then give orders to the servant to warm some white wine and to ask them for a few Li Dong pills compounded with goat's blood. But Zhe Ren clasped his hand tight. My troubling you is of no matter, she smiled. But were I to put ever so many people to inconvenience, they will bear me a grudge for my impudence. Not a soul, it's clear enough, knows anything about it now. But were you to make such a bustle as to bring it to people's notice, you'll be in an outward fix, and so will I. The proper thing, therefore, is for you to send a page tomorrow to request Dr. Wang to prepare some medicine for me. When I take this, I shall be all right. And as neither any human being nor spirit will thus get wind of it, won't it be better? Pao Yu found her suggestion so full of reason that he thought himself obliged to abandon his purpose. So approaching the table, he poured a cup of tea and came over and gave it to Jiren to rinse her mouth with. Aware, however, as Jiren saw that Pao Yu himself was not feeling at ease in his mind. She was on the point of bidding him not to wait upon her, but convinced that he would once more be certain not to accede to her wishes, and that the others would, in the second place, have to be disturbed, she deemed it expedient to humor him. Leaning on the coach, she was consequently allowed Pao Yu to come and attend to her. As soon as the fifth watch struck, Pao Yu, unmindful of combing or washing, hastily put on his clothes and left the room. And sending for Wang Jiren, he personally questioned him with all minuteness about her ailment. Wang Jiren asked how it had come about. It's simply a bruise, nothing more, he said. And forthwith, he gave him the names of some pills and medicines and told him how they were to be taken and how they were to be applied. Pao Yu committed every detail to memory, and on his return into the garden, the treatment was needless for us to explain, taken in hand in strict compliance with the directions. This was the day of the Dragon Boat Festival. Cattail and Artemisia were put over the doors. Tiger charms were suspended on every bank. At noon, Madame Wong got a banquet ready, and to this midday feast, she invited the mother, daughter, and the rest of the members of the Xie household. Pao Yu noticed that Pao Chai was in such low spirits that she would not even speak to him, and concluded that the reason was to be sought in the incident of the previous day. Madame Wang, seeing Pao Yu in a sullen humor, jumped at the surmise that it must be due to Jin Chuan's affair of the day before. And so ill at ease did she feel that she heeded him less than ever. Lin Da Yu detected Bao Yu's apathy and presumed that he was out of sorts for having given umbrage to Bao Chai, and her manner likewise assumed a listless air. Lady Feng had, in the course of the previous evening, been told by Madame Wang what had taken place between Bao Yu and Jin Chuan, and when she came to know that Madame Wang was in an unhappy frame of mind, she herself did not venture to chat or laugh, but at once regulated her behavior to suit Madame Wang's mood. So the lack of animation became more than ever perceptible, for the good cheer of Yin Chun and her sisters was also damped by the sight of all of them down in the mouth. The natural consequence, therefore, was that they all left after a very short stay. Lin Da Yu had a natural predilection for retirement. She did not care for social gatherings. Her notions, however, were not entirely devoid of reason. She maintained that people who gathered together must soon part, that when they came together, they were full of rejoicing. But did they not feel lonely when they broke up? That since this sense of loneliness gave rise to children, it was consequently preferable not to have any gatherings. The flowers afforded an apt example. When they opened, they won people's admiration. But when they faded, 
they added to the feeling of vexation, so that better were it if they did not blossom at all. To this cause, therefore, must be assigned the fact that when other people were glad, she, on the contrary, felt unhappy. Pao Yu's disposition was such that he simply yearned for frequent gatherings, and looked forward with sorrow to the breaking up which must too soon come round. As for flowers, he wished them to bloom repeatedly, and was haunted with the dread of their dying in a little time. Yet, albeit manifold anguish fell to his share, when banquets drew to a close and flowers began to fade, he had no alternative but to practice resignation. On this account was it that, when the company cheerlessly broke up from the present feast, Lin Da Yu did not mind the separation, and that Bao Yu experienced such melancholy and depression that on his return to his apartment, he gave way to deep groans and frequent sighs. Ching Wen, as it happened, came to the upper quarters to change her costume. In an unguarded moment, she let her fan slip out of her hand and dropped on the ground. As it fell, the bones were snapped. You stupid thing, Bao Yu exclaimed, sighing. What are don'ts? What next will you be up to by and by? When, in a little time, you get married and have a home of your own, will you forsooth still go on in this happy-go-lucky careless sort of way? Master Secundus, replied Ching Wen with a sardonic smile, your temper is of late dreadfully furious, and time and again it leaks out on your very face. The other day you even beat Zhe Ren, and here you are again now finding fault with us. If you feel disposed to kick or strike us, you are at liberty, sir, to do so at your pleasure. But for a fan to slip on the ground is an everyday occurrence. How many of those crystal jars and Galenian bowls were smashed the other time? I don't remember. And yet you were not seen to fly into a tendril. And now, for a fan, do you distress yourself so? What's the use of it? If you dislike us, well, pack us off and select some good girls to serve you. And we will quietly go away. Won't this be better? This rejoinder so exasperated Bao Yu that his whole frame trembled violently. You needn't be in a hurry, he then shouted. There will be a day of parting by and by. Zhe was on the other side, and from an early period, she listened to the conversation between them. Hurriedly crossing over, What are you up to again? she said to Bao Yu. Why, there is nothing to put your monkey up. I'm perfectly right in my assertion that when I'm away for any length of time, something is sure to happen. Ching Wen heard these remarks. Sister, she interposed, smiling ironically. Since you've got the gift of the gap, you should have come at once. You would then have spared your master's fit of anger. It's you who have from bygone days up to the present waited upon master. We've never had anything to do with attending on him. And it's because you have served him so faithfully that he repaid you yesterday with a cake on the stomach. But who knows what punishment mayn't be in store for us? Who aren't fit to wait upon him decently? At these insinuations, Jiren felt both incensed and ashamed. She was about to make some response, but Bao Yu had worked himself into such another passion as to get quite yellow in the face and she was obliged to ring in her temper. Pushing Ching Wen, Dear sister, she cried, you had better be off for a stroll. It's really we who are to blame. The very mention of the word we made it certain to Ching Wen that she implied herself and Bao Yu, and thus unawares more fuel was added again to her jealous notions. Giving way to several loud smiles, full of irony, I can't make out, she insinuated, who you may mean, but don't make me blush on your account. Even those devilish planks of yours can't hoodwink me. How and why is it that 
you've started styling yourself as we. Properly speaking, you haven't as yet so much as attained the designation of a miss. You're simply no better than I am. And how is it then that you presume so high as to call yourself we? Jiren's face grew purple from shame. The fact is, she reflected, that I've said more than I should. As one and all of you are ever bearing her malice, Bao Yu simultaneously observed, I'll actually raise her tomorrow to a higher status. Zhe Yun quickly snatched Bao Yu's hand. She's a stupid girl, she said. What's the use of arguing with her? What's more, you have so far borne with them and overlooked ever so many other things more grievous than this. And what are you up to today? If I am really a stupid girl, repeated Jing Wen, smiling sarcastically, am I a fit person for you to hold converse with? Why, I am purely and simply a slave girl. That's all. Are you, after all, cried Jiren at these words, bickering with me or with Master Secundus? If you bear me a grouch, you'd better then address your remarks to me alone. I bet it isn't right that you should kick up such a hullabaloo in the presence of Mr. Secundus. But if you have a spite against Mr. Secundus, you shouldn't be shouting so boisterously as to make thousands of people know all about it. I came in a few minutes back, merely for the purpose of setting matters right, and of urging you to make up your quarrels so that we should all be on a safe side. And here I have the unlucky fate of being set upon by you, miss. Yet you neither seem to be angry with me, nor with Mr. Secundus, but armed, cap as you appear to be. What is your ultimate design? I won't utter another word, but let you have your say. While she spoke, she was hurriedly wending her way out. You needn't raise your dander, Bao Yu remarked to Ching Wen. I've guessed the secret of your heart, so I'll go and tell mother that as you've also attained a certain age, she should send you away. Will this please you, yes or no? This allusion made Ching Wen unwittingly feel again wounded at heart. She tried to conceal her tears. Why should I go away, she asked, if even you be so prejudiced against me as to try and devise means to pack me off, you won't succeed. I never saw such brawling, Bao Yu exclaimed. You are certainly bent upon going. I might as well therefore let mother know so as to bundle you off. While addressing her, he rose to his feet and was intent upon trudging off at once. Jiren lost no time in turning round and impeding his progress. Were well, you off too, she cried. I'm going to tell mother, answered Bao Yu. It's no use whatever, Jiren smiled. You may be in real earnest to go and tell her, but aren't you afraid of putting her to shame? If even she positively means to leave, you can very well wait until you two have got over this bad blood. And when everything is past and gone, it won't be any too late for you to explain, in the course of conversation, the whole case to our lady, your mother. But if you now go in hot haste and tell her, as if the matter were an urgent one, won't you be the means of making our mistress give way to suspicion? My mother, demurred Bao Yu, is sure not to entertain any suspicions. As all I will explain to her is that she insists upon leaving. When did I ever insist upon going? So, Ching Wen, you fly into a rage. And then you have recourse to threats to intimidate me. But you are at liberty to go and say anything you like. For as I would knock my brains out against the wall, I won't get a life out of this door. This is indeed strange, exclaimed Bao Yu. If you won't go, What's the good of all this fuss? I can't stand this bowling. So it will be a riddance if you would get out of the way. Saying this, he was resolved upon going to report the matter. Jiren found herself powerless to dissuade him. She had in consequence no other resource but to fall on her knees. Bi Hen, Chou Wen, Xie Yue, 
and the rest of the waiting maids had realized what a serious aspect the dispute had assumed, and not a sound was to be heard to fall from their lips. They remained standing outside, listening to what was going on, when they now overheard Jiren making solicitous entreaties on her knees. They rushed into the apartment in a body, and with one consent, they prostrated themselves on the floor. Bao Yu at once pulled Jiren up. Then, with a sign, he took a seat on the bed. Get up, he shouted to the body of girls, and clear out. What would you have me do? he asked, addressing himself to Jiren. His heart of mine has been rent to pieces, and no one has any idea about it. While speaking, tears of a sudden rolled down his cheek. At the sight of Bao Yu weeping, Jiren also melted into a fit of crying. Jing Wen was standing by them with watery eyes. She was on the point of reasoning with them when a spying Lin Da Yu stepped into the room. She speedily walked out. On a grand holiday like this, remonstrated Lin Da Yu, smiling. How is it that you are sniveling away and all for nothing? Is it likely that high words have resulted all through that dumpling contest? Bao Yu and Lin Da Yu blurted out laughing. You don't tell me, cousin Secundus, Lin Da Yu put in, but I know all about it, even though I have asked no questions. Now she spoke, and now she patted Jiren on the shoulder. My dear sister-in-law, she smiled, just you tell me. It must surely be that you two have had a quarrel. Confide in me, your cousin, so that I might reconcile you. Miss Lin rejoined Jiren, pushing her off. What are you fussing about? I'm simply one of our servant girls. You are therefore rather erratic in your talk. You say that you are only a servant girl, smilingly replied Tai Yu, and yet I treat you like a sister-in-law. Why do you, Bao Yu chimed in, give her this abusive epithet? But however much she may make allowance for this, can she, when there are so many others who tell idle tales on her account, put up with your coming and telling her all you have said? Miss Lin, smiled Jiren, you are not aware of the purpose of my heart. Unless my breath fails and I die, I shall continue in his service. If you die, remarked Lin Da Yu, smiling, what will others do, I wonder? As for me, I shall be the first to die from crying. Were you to die, added Bao Yu laughingly, I shall become a bonze. You better be a little more sober-minded, laughed Jiren. What's the good of coming out with all these things? Lin Da Yu put out two of her fingers and puckered up her lips. Up to this, she laughed, it's become a bonze thrice. Henceforward, I'll try and remember how many times you make up your mind to become a Buddhist priest? This reminded Bao Yu that she was referring to a remark he had made on a previous occasion. But smiling to himself, he allowed the matter to drop. After a short interval, Lin Da Yu went away. A servant then came to announce Mr. Xie wanted to see him, and Bao Yu had to go. The purpose of this visit was in fact to invite him to a banquet, and as he could not very well put forward any excuse to refuse, he had to remain till the end of the feast before he was able to take his leave. The result was that, on his return in the evening, he was to a great extent under the effect of wine. With bustling step, he wended his way into his own court. Here, he perceived that the cool coach with a back to it had already been placed in the yard, and that there was someone asleep on it. Prompted by the conviction that it must be Jiren, Bao Yu seated himself on the edge of the couch. As he did so, he gave her a push, and inquired whether her sore place was any better. But thereupon he saw the occupant turn herself round and exclaim, What do you come again to irritate me for? Bao Yu at a glance, realized that it was not Jiren, but Jing Wen. Bao Yu then clutched her and compelled her to sit next to him. Your disposition, he smiled, 
has been more and more spoiled through indulgence. When you let the fan drop this morning, I simply made one or two remarks, and out you came with that long rigmarole. Had you gone for me, it wouldn't have mattered. But you also dragged in Jiren, who only interfered with very good intention of inducing us to make it up again. But ponder now, ought you to have done it? Yes or no? With this intense heat, remonstrated Ching Wen, why do you pull me and toss me about? Should any people see you, what would they think? But this person of mine isn't meet to be seated in here. Since you yourself know that it isn't meet, replied Bao Yu with a smile, why then were you sleeping here? To this taunt, Ching Wen had nothing to say, but she spread out into fresh laughter. It was all right, she retorted, during your absence, but the moment you come, it isn't meet for me to stay. Get up and let me go and have my bath. Jiren and Xie Yue have both had theirs, so I'll call them here. I have just had again a good deal of wine, remarked Bao Yu laughingly. So a wash will be good for me, and since you have not had your bath, you had better bring the water, and let's both have it together. No, no, smiled Ching Wen, waving her hand. I cannot presume to put you to any trouble. Sir, I still remember how when Bi Hen used to look after your bath, you occupied fully two or three hours. What you were up to during that time, we never knew. You could not very well walk in. When you had, however, done washing, and we entered your room, we found the floor so covered with water that the legs of the bed were soaking, and the matting itself a regular pool. Nor could we make out what kind of washing you have been having. And for days afterwards, we had a laugh over it. But I have neither any time to get the water ready, nor do I see the need for you to have a wash along with me. Besides, today is chilly, and as you have had a bath only a little while back, you can very well just now dispense with one. But I'll draw a basin of water for you to wash your face and to shampoo your head with. Not long ago, Yuan Yang sent you a few fruits. They were put in that crystal bowl, so you'd better tell them to bring them to you to taste. Well, in that case, laughed Bao Yu. You needn't also have a bath. Just simply wash your hands and bring the fruit and let's have some together. I'm so shaky, smiled Ching Wen, that even fans slip out of my hands. And how could I fetch the fruit for you? Were I also to break the dish, it would be still more dreadful. If you want to break it, break it, smiled Bao Yu. These things are only intended for general use. You like this thing, I fancy that? Our respective tastes are not identical, the original use of that fan, for instance, was to fan one's self with. But if you choose to break it for fun, you were quite at liberty to do so. The only thing is, when you get angry, don't make it the means of giving vent to your temper. Just like those selfers. They are really meant for serving things in. But if you fancy that kind of sound, then deliberately smash them. That will be all right. But don't, when you are in high dudgeon, avail yourself of them to air your resentment. That's what one would call having a fancy for a thing. Ching Wen greeted his words with a smile. Since that be so, she said, bring me your fan and let me tear it. What most takes my fancy is tearing. Upon hearing this, Bao Yu smilingly handed it to her. Ching Wen, in point of fact, took it over and with a crash she rent it in two. Close upon this, the sound of crash upon crash became audible. Bao Yu was standing next to her. How nice the noise is, he laughed. Tear it again, and make it sound a little more. But while he spoke, Xie Ye was seen to walk in. Don't, she smiled, be up to so much mischief. Bao Yu, however, went up to her and, snatching her fan also from her hand, he gave it to Ching Wen. Ching Wen took it and there and then likewise broke it in two. Both he and she then had
at a hearty laugh. What do you call this? Xie Yu expostulated. Do you take my property and make it the means of distracting yourselves? Open the fan box, shouted Pao Yu, and choose one and take it away. What? Are they such fine things? In that case, ventured Xie Yu, fetch the fans and let her break as many as she can. Won't that be nice? Go and bring them at once, Pao Yu laughed. I won't be up to any such tomfoolery, Xie Yu demurred. She hasn't snapped her hands, so bid her go herself and fetch them. I'm feeling tired, interposed Ching Wen as she lovingly leaned on the bed. I'll therefore tear some more tomorrow again. An orator says, at about you with a smile, that a thousand ounces of gold cannot purchase a single laugh. What can a few fans cost? After moralizing, he went on to call Zhe Ren. Zhe Ren has just finished the necessary change in her dress, so she stepped in, and a young serving girl, Jia Hui, crossed over and picked up the broken fans. Then they all sat and enjoyed the cool breeze, but we can well dispense with launching into any minute details. End of section 13section 14 of the dream of the red chamber book 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the dream of the red chamber book 2 by Chiao shu ting translated by henry bancroft jolie chapter 31 part 2 on the morrow noon found madame wang xue bao chai lin dai yu and the rest of the young ladies congregated in Dowager Lady Jia's suite of rooms. Someone then brought the news that Miss Xi had arrived. In a little time they perceived Xi Xiang Yun make her appearance in the court at the head of a bevy of waiting maids and married women. Bao Tai, Dai Yu, and her other cousins quickly ran down the steps to meet her and exchange greetings. But with what fervor girls of tender years who unite some day after a separation of months need not, of course, be explained. Presently she entered the apartment, paid her respects, and inquired how they all were. But after this conventional interchange of salutations, old Lady Jia pressed her to take off her outer garments as the weather was so close. Xi Xiang Yin lost no time in rising to her feet and loosening her clothes. I don't see why, Madame Wang thereupon smiled, you wear all these things. It's entirely at Aunt Secunda's bidding, retorted Xi Xiangyun, that I put them on. Why, would anyone of her own accord wear so many things? Aunt, interposed Bao Chai, who stood by with a smile, you are not aware that what most delights her in the matter of dress is to don other people's clothes. Yes, I remember how, during her stay here in the third and fourth moons of last year, she used to wear cousin Bao's pelisses. She even put on his shoes and attached his frontlets as well around her head. At a casual glance, she looked the very image of cousin Bao. What was superfluous was that pair of earrings of hers. As she stood at the back of that chair, she so thoroughly took in our venerable ancestor that she kept on shouting, Pao Yu, come over. Mind the tassels suspended on that lamp, for if you shake the dust off, it may get into your eyes. But all she did was to laugh. She did not budge. And it was only after everyone found it hard to keep their countenance that our worthy senior also started laughing. You do look well in male habiliments. She said to her. What about that? cried Lin Dai Yu. Why, she had scarcely been here with us a couple of days in the first moon of last year, when we sent and fetched her that we had a fall of snow. You venerable senior and her maternal aunt had on that day, I remember so well, just returned from worshipping the images of our ancestors. And a brand new deep red felt wrapper of yours, dear grandmother, had been lying over there. 
when suddenly it disappeared. But lo, she it was who had put it on. Being, however, too large and too long for her, she took a couple of handkerchiefs and fastened them round her waist. She was then trudging into the back court with the seven girls to make snowmen when she tripped and fell flat in front of the train and got covered all over with mud. As she narrated this incident, everyone recalled the circumstances to mind and had a good laugh. Dame Jo, Pao Yu smilingly inquired of Nurse Jo, is your young lady always as fond of pranks as ever or not? Nurse Jo then also gave a laugh. Pranks are nothing, Yin Chun smiled. What I do detest is her fondness for tittle-tattle. I've never seen anyone who, even when asleep, goes on chatter-chatter, now laughing and now talking, as she does. Nor can I make out where she gets all those idle yawns of hers. I think she's better of late, in the post Madame Wang. The other day some party or other came and they met, so she is to have a mother-in-law very soon. And can she still be comporting herself like that? Are you going to stay today? Elder Lady Jia then asked, or going back home? Nurse Jo smiled. Your venerable ladyship has not seen what an amount of clothes we have brought, she replied. We mean, of course, to stay a couple of days. Is Cousin Bao Yu not at home? inquired Xiang Yun. There's she's again. She doesn't think of others, remarked Bao Chai, smiling significantly. She only thinks of her cousin Bao Yu. They are both so fond of lies. This proves that she hasn't yet got rid of that spirit of mischief. You are all now grown up, observed old lady Jia, and you shouldn't allude to infant names. But while she was chiding them, they noticed Bao Yu arrive. Cousin Yuan, have you come? He smiled. How is it that you wouldn't come the other day when someone was dispatched to fetch you? It's only a few minutes, Madame Wang said, since our venerable senior called that one to task. And now here he comes and refers to names and surnames. Your cousin Bao, ventured Lin Dai Yu, has something good, which he has been waiting to give you. What good thing is it? asked Xiang Yun. Will you believe what she says? observed Bao Yu laughingly. But how many days is it that I have not seen you, and you have grown so much taller? Is cousin Jiren all right? inquired Xiang Yun. She's all right, answered Bao Yu. Many thanks for your kind thought of her. I've brought something nice for her, resumed Xiang Yun. Saying this, she produced her handkerchief, tied into a knot. Was this something nice? asked Bao Yu. Wouldn't it have been better if you brought her a couple of those rings with streaked stones of the kind you sent the other day? Why? What's this? exclaimed Xiang Yun, laughing, opening as she spoke the handkerchief. On close scrutiny, they actually found four streaked rings, similar to those she had previously sent, tied up in the same packet. Look here, Lin Dai Yu smiled. What a girl she is. Had you went sending that fellow the other day to bring ours, given him these also to bring along with him, wouldn't it have saved trouble? Instead of that, here you fussily bring them yourself today. I presumed that it was something out of the way again. But is it really only these things? In very truth, you are a mere don'ts. It's you who behave like a don'ts now. Shi Xiang Yun smiled. I'll speak out here and let everyone judge for themselves who is the don'ts. The servant, deputed to bring the things to you, had no need to open his mouth and say anything. For as soon as they were brought in, it was of course evident, at a glance, that they were to be presented to you young ladies. But had he been the bearer of these things for them, I would have been under the necessity of explaining to him which was intended for this serving girl and which for that. Had the messenger had his wits about him, well and good. But had he been at all stupid, he wouldn't have been able to remember so much as the names of the girls. He would have made an awful mess of it, and talked a lot of nonsense. So instead of being of any use, he would have even muddled higgity piggity your things. Had a female servant been dispatched, it would have been all right. But as it happened, 
a servant boy was again sent the other day, so how could he have mentioned the names of the wedding girls? And by my bringing them in person to give them to them, doesn't it make things clearer? As she said this, she put down the four rings. One is for Sister Jiren, she continued. One is for Sister Yuan Yang, one for Sister Jin Chuan Er, and one for Sister Ping Er. They are only for these four girls. But would the servant boys, two forsooth, have remembered them so clearly? At these words, the whole company smiled. How really clear, they cried. This is what it is to be able to speak, Pao Yu put in. She doesn't spare anyone. Hearing this, Lin Dai Yu gave a sardonic smile. If she didn't know how to use her tongue, she observed, would she deserve to wear that unicorn of gold? While speaking, she rose and walked off. Luckily, everyone did not hear what she said. Only Xia Bao Chai pursed up her lips and laughed. Bao Yu, however, had overheard her remark, and he blamed himself for having once more talked in a heedless manner. Unawares, his eye espied Bao Chai much amused, and he too could not suppress a smile. But at the sight of Bao Yu in laughter, Bao Chai hastily rose to her feet and withdrew. She went in search of Dai Yu to have a chat and laugh with her. After Yu had tea, old lady Jia thereupon said to Xiang Yun, You'd better rest a while and then go and see your sisters-in-law. Besides, it's cool in the garden, so you can walk about with your cousins. Xiang Yun expressed her assent, and collecting the three rings, she wrapped them up and went and lay down to rest. Presently, she got up with the idea of paying visits to Lady Feng and her other relatives. Followed by a whole bevy of nurses and waiting maids, she repaired into Lady Feng's quarters on the off side. She bandied words with her for a while, and then coming out, she betook herself into the garden of Broad Vista and called on Li Gong Chai. But after a short visit, she turned her steps towards the Yi Hong court to look up Jai Ren. You people needn't, she said, turning her head round. Come along with me. You may go and see your friends and relatives. It will be quite enough if you simply leave Chui Lu to wait upon me. Hearing her wishes, each went her own way in quest of aunts or sisters-in-law. There only remained but Xiang Yun and Chui Lu. How is it, inquired Chui Lu, that these lotus flowers have not yet opened? The proper season hasn't yet arrived, rejoined Xi Xiang Yun. They too continued Chui Lu, resemble those in our pond. They are double flowers. These here, remarked Xiang Yun, are not however up to ours. They have over there, observed Chui Lu, a pomegranate tree with four or five branches joined one to another, just like one story raised above another story. What trouble it must have caused them to wear. Flowers and plants, suggested Xi Xiang Yun, are precisely like the human race. With sufficient vitality, they grow up in a healthy condition. I can't credit these words, replied Chu Lu, twisting her face around. If you maintain that they are like human beings, how is it that I haven't seen any person with one head growing over another? This rejoinder evoked a smile from Xiang Yun. I tell you not to talk, she cried. But you will insist upon talking. How do you expect people to be able to answer everything you say? All things, whether in heaven or on earth, come into existence by the cooperation of the dual powers, the male and female. So all things, whether good or bad, novel or strange, and all those manifold changes and transformations arise entirely from the favorable or adverse influence exercised by the male and female powers. And though some things seldom seen by mankind might come to life, the principle at work is, after all, the same. In the face of these arguments laughed Chui Lu. Everything, from old till now, from the very creation itself, embodies a certain proportion of the yin and yang principles. You stupid thing exclaimed Xiang Yun, smiling. The more you talk, the more stuff and nonsense falls from your lips. 
What about everything embodying a certain proportion of the principles yin and yang? Besides, the two words yin and yang are really one word, for when the yang principle is exhausted, it becomes the yin, and when the yin is exhausted, it becomes yang. And it isn't that. As the exhaustion of the yin, another yang comes into existence. And that, as the exhaustion of the yang, a second yin arises. This trash is sufficient to kill me, ejaculated Chu Lu. What are the yin and yang? Why? They are without substance or form. But pray, miss, tell me what sort of things this yin and yang can be. The yin and yang explained Xiang Yun are no more than spirits, but anything affected by their influence at once assumes form. The heavens, for instance, are yang, and the earth is yin. Water is yin, and fire is yang. The sun is yang, and the moon yin. Quite so, quite so, cried out Chi Lu. Much amused by these explanations, I have at length attained perception. It isn't strange, then, that people invariably call the sun Tai Yang, while astrologers keep on speaking of the moon as Tai Yin Xin, or something like it. It must be on account of this principle. Ami Tuo Fu laughed Xiang Yun. You have at last understood. All these things possess the Yin and Yang. That's all right, Chu Lu put in. But is there any likelihood that all those mosquitoes Fleas, and worms, flowers, herbs, bricks, and tiles have in like manner anything to do with the yin and yang. How don't they? exclaimed Xiang Yun. For example, even the leaves of that tree are distinguished by yin and yang. The side which looks up and faces the sun is called yang, while that in the shade and looking downwards is called yin. Is it really so? ejaculated Chi Lu upon hearing this, while she smiled and nodded her head. Now I know all about it, but which is yang and which yin in these fans we are holding? This side, the front, is yang, answered Xiang Yun, and that, the reverse, is yin. Chi Lu went on to nod her head and to laugh. She felt inclined to apply her questions to several other things, but as she could not fix her mind upon anything in particular, she all of a sudden drooped her head, catching sight of the pendant in gold, representing a unicorn, which Xiang Yun had about her person. She forthwith made allusion to it. This, miss, she said smiling, cannot likely also have any yin and yang. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air proceeded Xiang Yun, are the cockbirds yang and the henbirds yin. The females of beasts are yin and the males yang. So how is there none? Is this male or is this female? inquired Chi Lu. Chui, exclaimed Xiang Yun. What about male and female? Here you are with your nonsense again. Well, never mind about that, added Chi Lu. But how is it that all things have yin and yang, and that we human beings have no yin and no yang? Xiang Yun then lowered her face. You low bred thing, she exclaimed. But it's better for us to proceed on our way, for the more questions you ask, the nicer they get. What's there in this that you can't tell me? asked Chui Lu. But I know all about it. So there's no need for you to keep me on pins and needles. Shang Yun blurted out laughing. What do you know? She said. That you, miss, are Yang, and that I'm Yin, answered Chi Liu. Shang Yun produced her handkerchief, and while screening her mouth with it, burst out into a loud fit of laughter. What I say must be right for you to laugh in this way, Chi Liu observed. Perfectly right, perfectly right. Acquiesced Xiang Yun. People say, continued Chi Lu, that masters are Yang and that servant girls are Yin. Don't I even apprehend this primary principle? You apprehend it thoroughly, responded Xiang Yun laughingly. But while she was speaking, 
she espied, under the trellis with the cinnamon roses, something glistening like gold. Do you see that? What is it? Xiang Yun asked, pointing at it. Hearing this, Tui Liu hastily went over and picked up the object. While scrutinizing it, she observed with a smile, Let us find out whether it's yin or yang. So saying, she first laid hold of the unicorn belonging to Xi Xiang Yun and passed it under inspection. Xi Xiang Yun longed to be shown what she had picked up, but Tui Liu would not open her hand. It's a precious gem, she smiled. You mayn't see it. Miss, where can it be from? How very strange it is. I've never seen anyone in here with anything of the kind. Give it to me and let me look at it, retorted Xiang Yun. Chui Lu stretched out her hand with a dash. Yes, miss, please look at it, she laughed. Xiang Yun raised her eyes. She perceived at a glance that it was a golden unicorn, so beautiful and so bright, and so much larger and handsomer than the one she had on. Xiang Yun put out her arm and, taking the gem in the palm of her hand, she fell into a silent reverie and uttered not a word. She was quite absent-minded when suddenly Bao Yu appeared in the opposite direction. What are you two? he asked, smiling, doing here in the sun. How is it you don't go and find Zhe Ren? Xi Xiang Yun precipitately concealed the unicorn. We were just going, she replied. So let us all go together. Conversing, they in the company went the steps into the Yi Hong court. Zhe Ren was leaning on the balustrade at the bottom of the steps. Her face turned to the breeze. Upon unexpectedly seeing Xiang Yun arrive, she with alacrity rushed down to greet her and taking her hand in hers. They cheerfully canvassed the events that had transpired during the separation while they entered the room and took a seat. You should have come earlier, Bao Yu said. I've got something nice and was only waiting for you. Saying this, he searched and searched about his person. After a long interval, ay uh, he ejaculated. Have you perchance put that thing away? He eagerly asked Zhe Ren. What thing? inquired Zhe Ren. The unicorn, explained Bao Yu. I got the other day. You have daily worn it about you, and how is it you asked me? remarked Zhe Ren. As soon as her answer fell on his ear, Bao Yu clapped his hands. I've lost it, he cried. Where can I go and look for it? There and then he meant to go and search in person, but Xi Xiang Yun heard his inquiries and concluded that it must be he who had lost the gem. When did you two, she promptly smiled, get a unicorn? I got it the other day after ever so much trouble, rejoined Bao Yu. But I can't make out when I can have lost it. I've also become quite addle-headed. Fortunately, smiled Xi Xiang Yun, it's only a sort of a toy. Still, are you so careless? While speaking, she flung open her hand. Just see, she laughed. Is it this or not? As soon as he saw it, Bao Yu was seized with unwanted delight. But reader, if you care to know the cause of his delight, peruse the explanation contained in the next chapter. End of section 14。section 15 of the Dream of the Red Chamber, book two。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Yu Qing in Singapore. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two, by Cao Xueqing. Translated by Henry Bancroft Jolly. Chapter Thirty Two, Part One. Xi Ren and Xiang Yun tell their secret thoughts. Dai Yu is infatuated with living Bao Yu. While trying to conceal her sense of shame and injury, Jing Chuan is driven by her impetuous feelings to seek death. But to resume our narrative, at the sight of the unicorn, Bao Yu was filled with intense delight. So much so that he forthwith put out his hand and made a grab for it. 
Lucky enough, it was you who picked it up, he said, with a face beaming with smiles. But when did you find it? Fortunately, it was only this, rejoined Shi Shangming, laughing. If you by and by also lose your seal, will you likely banish it at once from your mind, and never make an effort to discover it? After all, smiled Bao Yu, the loss of a seal is an ordinary occurrence, but had I lost this, it would have deserved to die. Shi Ren then poured a cup of tea and handed it to Shi Xiangyun. Miss Xinya, she remarked smilingly, I heard that you had occasion the other day to be highly pleased. Shi Xiangyun flushed crimson. She went on drinking her tea and did not utter a single word. Here you are again, full of shame, Shi Ren smiled. But do you remember when we were living about ten years back in those warm rooms on the west side? And you confided in me one evening. You didn't feel any shame then. And how is it you blush like this now? Do you still speak about that? exclaimed Shi Xiangming laughingly. You and I were then great friends. But when our mother subsequently died, and I went home for a while, how is it you were at once sent to be with my cousin Secundus, and that now I've come back, you don't treat me as you did once? Are you yet harping on this? retorted Xi Ren, putting on a smile. Why, at first, you used to coax me with a lot of endearing terms to comb your hair and to wash your face, to do this and that for you. But now that you've become a big girl, you assume the manner of a young mistress towards me. And as you put on these airs of a young mistress, how can I ever presume to be on a familiar footing with you? Lo mi tuo fo, cried Shi Xiangmin. What a false accusation! If I be guilty of anything of the kind, may I at once die? Just see what a broiling hot day this is, and yet, as soon as I arrived, I felt bound to come and look you up first. If you don't believe me, well, ask Luyar. And while at home, when I did not at every instant say something about you... Scarcely had she concluded that Xi Ren and Bao Yu tried to soothe her. We were only joking, they said, but you've taken everything again as gospel. What, are you still so impetuous in your temperament? You don't say, argued Shi Xiaoyun, that your words are hard things to swallow, but contrarywise, call people's temperaments impetuous. As she spoke, she unfolded her handkerchief, and, producing a ring, she gave it to Xi Ren. Xi Ren did not know how to thank her enough. When, she consequently smiled, you sent those to your cousin the other day, I got one also, and here you yourself bring me another today. It's clear enough, therefore, that you haven't forgotten me. This alone has been quite enough to test you. As for the ring itself, what is its worth? But it's a token of the sincerity of your heart. Who gave it to you? inquired Shi Xiangyun. Miss Bao let me have it, replied Xi Ren. I was under the impression, remarked Shi Xiaomi with a sigh, that it was as present from Cousin Lin. But is it really Cousin Bao that gave it to you? When I was at home, I day after day found myself reflecting that among all these cousins of mine, there wasn't one able to compare with Cousin Bao. So excellent is she. How I do regret that we are not the offspring of one mother. For could I boast of such a sister of the same flesh and blood as myself, it wouldn't matter, though, I had lost both father and mother. While indulging in these regrets, her eyes got quite red. Never mind, never mind, interposed Bao Yu. Why need you speak of these things? If I do allude to this, answered Shi Xiangyun, what does it matter? I know that weak point of yours. You're in fear and trembling, lest your cousin Lin should come to hear what I say, and get angry with me again for eulogizing cousin Bao. Now, isn't it this, eh? Ch! laughed Xi Ren, who was standing by her. Miss Yun, she said, now that you've grown up to be a big girl, you've become more than ever open-hearted and outspoken. When I contend smiled Bao Yu, that it is difficult to say a word to any one of you, I am indeed perfectly correct. My dear cousin, observed Shi Xiangyun laughingly, don't go on in that strain. You'll provoke me to displeasure. 
When you are with me, all you are good for is to talk and talk away. But were you to catch a glimpse of Cousin Lin, you would once more be quite at a loss to know what best to do. Now, enough of your jokes, urged Siren. I have a favour to crave of you. What is it? vehemently inquired Shi Xiangyun. I've got a pair of shoes, answered Xiren, for which I've stuck the padding together, but I'm not feeling up to the mark these last few days, so I haven't been able to work at them. If you have any leisure, do you finish them for me. This is indeed strange, exclaimed Shi Xiangyun. Putting aside all the skillful workers engaged in your household, you have besides some people for doing needlework, and others for tailoring and cutting. And how is it you appeal to me to take your shoes in hand? Were you to ask any one of those men to execute your work, you could very well refuse to do it. Here you are in another stupid mood, laughed Shiren. Can it be that you don't know that our sewing in these quarters mayn't be done by these needleworkers? At this reply, it at once dawned upon Shi Xiangyun that the shoes must be intended for Bao Yu. Since that be the case, she in consequence smiled, I'll work them for you. There's however one thing. I'll readily attend to any of yours, but I will have nothing to do with any for other people. There you are again, laughed Xiren. Who am I to venture to trouble you to make shoes for me? I'll tell you plainly, however, that they are not mine. But no matter whose they are, it is anyhow I will be the recipient of your favour. That is sufficient. To speak the truth, rejoined Shi Xiangyun, you've put me to the trouble of working. I don't know how many things for you. The reason why I refuse on this occasion should be quite evident to you. I can't nevertheless make it out, answered Xi Ren. I heard the other day, continued Shi Xiangyun, a sardonic smile on her lip, that while the fan case I had worked was being held and compared with that of someone else, it too was slashed away in a fit of high dudgeon. This reached my ears long ago, and do you still try to dupe me by asking me again to now to make something more for you? Have I really become a slave to you people? As to what occurred the other day, hastily explained Bao Yu, smiling, I positively had no idea that the thing was your handiwork. He never knew that you'd done it, Siren also laughed. I deceived him by telling him that there had been off late some capital hands at needlework outside, who could execute any embroidery with surpassing beauty, and that I had asked them to bring a fan case so as to try them and to see whether they could actually work well or not. He at once believed what I said, but as he produced this case and gave it to this one and that one to look at, he somehow or other, I don't know how, managed again to put someone's back up and she cut it into two. On his return, however, he bade me hurry the men to make another, and when I, at length I explained to him that it had been worked by you, he felt, I can't tell you, what keen regret. This is getting stranger and stranger, said Shi Xiangyun. It wasn't worth the while for Miss Lin to lose her temper about it. But as she plies the scissors so admirably, why, you might as well tell her to finish the shoes for you. She couldn't, replied Siren, for besides other things, our venerable lady is still in fear and trembling, lest she should tie herself in any way. The doctor likewise says that she will continue to enjoy good health so long as she is carefully looked after, so who would wish to ask her to take them in hand? Last year, she managed to just get through a scented bag after a whole year's work. But here we've already reached the middle of the present year, and she hasn't yet taken up any needle or thread. In the course of their conversation, a servant came and announced that the gentleman who lived in the Xinlong Street had come. Our master, he added, bids you, Mr. Secundus, come out and greet him. As soon as Bao Yu heard this announcement, he knew that Jia Yuchun must have arrived. But he felt very unhappy at heart. Xiren hurried to go and bring his clothes. Bao Yu, meanwhile, put on his boots, but as he did so, he gave way to resentment. Why, there's father, he soliloquized, to sit with him. That should be enough. 
and must he, on every visit he pays, insist upon seeing me? It is, of course, because you've such a knack for receiving and entertaining visitors that Mr. Jia Zheng will have you go out," laughingly interposed Shi Xiangling from one side, as she waved her fan. "Is it father's doing?" Bao Yu rejoined. "Why, it's himself who asks that I should be sent for to see him." When a host is courteous, visitors come often," smiled Xiangling. "So it's surely because you possess certain qualities, which have won his regard, that he insists upon seeing you." "But I am not what one would call courteous," demurred Bao Yu. "I am, of all coarse people, the coarsest. Besides, I do not choose to have any relations with such people as himself." He regained that unchangeable temperament of yours," laughed Xiang Yun. "But you are a big fellow now, and you should at least, if you loath to study and go and pass your examinations for a provincial graduate or metropolitan graduate, have frequent intercourse with officers and ministers of state, and discuss those varied attainments which one acquires in an official career, so that you also may be." Able in time to have some idea about matters in general, and that when by and by you've made friends, they may not see you spending the whole day long in doing nothing than loafing in our midst up to every imaginable mischief. Miss exclaimed Bao Yu after this harangue, "Play, go and sit in some other girl's room, for mind one like myself may contaminate a person who knows so much of attainments and experience as you do." Miss ventured Siren, "Drop this at once." Last time, Miss Bao too tendered him this advice, but without troubling himself as to whether people would feel uneasy or not, he simply came out with an ejaculation of "Hi," and rushed out of the place. Miss Bao hadn't meanwhile concluded her say, so when she saw him fly, she got so full of shame that, flushing scarlet, she could neither open her lips nor hold her own counsel. But lucky for him, it was only Miss Bao. Had it been Miss Lin, there's no saying what row there may not have been again, and what tears may not have been shed. Yet the very mention of all she had to tell him is enough to make people look up to Miss Bao with respect. But after a time, she also betook herself away. I then felt very unhappy, as I imagined that she was angry. But contrary to all my expectations, she was by and by just the same as ever. She is, in very truth, long-suffering and indulgent. This other party, contrariwise, became quite distant to her, little though one would have thought it of him. And as Miss Bao perceived that he had lost his temper, and didn't choose to heed her. She subsequently made I don't know how many apologies to him. Did Miss Lin ever talk such trash? Exclaimed Pao Yu. Has she ever talked such stuff and nonsense? It would have long ago become chilled towards her. What you say is all trash, Xu Ren and Xiang Ming remarked with one voice, while they shook their heads to and fro and smiled. Lin Dai Yu, the fact is, was well aware that now that Xu Xiang Ming was staying in the mansion. Bao Yu too was certain to hasten to come and tell her all about the unicorn he had got. So she thought to herself, in the foreign traditions and wild stories introduced here of late by Bao Yu, literary persons and pretty girls are, for the most part, brought together in marriage through the agency of some trifling but ingenious knick-knack. These people either have miniature ducks or phoenixes. Jade necklaces or gold pendants, fine handkerchiefs or elegant sashes, and they have, through the instrumentality of such trivial objects, invariably succeeded in accomplishing the wishes they entertained throughout their lives. When she recently discovered, by some unforeseen way, that Bao Yu had likewise a unicorn, she began to apprehend lest he should make this circumstance a pretext to create an estrangement with her, and indulge with Shi Xiangming as well in various free and easy flirtations and fine doings. She therefore quietly crossed over towards her opportunity and take such action as would enable her to get an insight into his and her sentiments. Contrary, however, to all her calculations, no sooner did she reach her destination 
Then she overheard Shi Xiangyun dilate on the topic of experience, and Pao Yu go on to observe, Cousin Lin has never indulged in such stuff and nonsense. Had she ever uttered any such trash, it would have become chilled even towards her. This language suddenly produced in Lin Daiyu's mind both surprise as well as delight, sadness as well as regret. Delight at having indeed been so correct in her perception that he whom she had ever considered in the light of a true friend had actually turned out to be a true friend. Surprise, because, she said to herself, he has, in the presence of so many witnesses, displayed such partiality as to speak in my praise, and has shown such affection and friendliness for me as to make no attempt whatever to shock suspicion. Regret, for since, she pondered, you are my intimate friend, you could certainly well look upon me too as your intimate friend, and if you and I be real friends, why need there be any more talk about gold and jade? But since there be that question of gold and jade, you and I should have such things in our possession. Yet why should this ball try step in again between us? Sad, because, she reflected, my father and mother departed life at an early period, and because I have, in spite of the secret engraven on my heart and imprinted on my bones, not a soul to act as a mentor to me. Besides, off late, I continuously feel confusion creep over my mind, so my disease must already have it gradually developed itself. The doctors further state that my breath is weak, my blood is poor, and that they dread lest consumption should declare itself. So despite that sincere friendship I foster for you, I cannot, I fear, last for very long. You are, I admit, a true friend to me, but what can you do for my unfortunate destiny? Upon reaching this point in her reflections, she could not control her tears, and they rolled freely down her cheeks, so much so that when about to enter and meet her cousins, she experienced such utter lack of zest that, while drying her tears, she turned round and went at her steps back in the direction of her apartments. End of section 15. Recording by Cao Yuqing in Singapore. Section 16 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cao Yuqing in Singapore. The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2, by Cao Xueqing. Translated by Henry Bancroft Jolie. Chapter 32, Part 2. Pao Yu, meanwhile, had hurriedly got into his new costume. Upon coming out of doors, he caught sight of Lin Daiyu, walking quietly ahead of him engaged, to all appearances, in wiping tears from her eyes. With rapid stride, he overtook her. Cousin Lin, he smiled, where are you off to? How is it that you're crying again? Who has once more hurt your feelings? Ling Dai turned her head round to look, and seeing that it was Pao Yu, she at once forced a smile. Why should I be crying, she replied, when there is no reason to do so? Look here, observed Pao Yu smilingly. The tears in your eyes are not dry yet, and do you still tell me a fib? Saying this, he could not check an impulse to raise his arm and wipe her eyes, but Ling Dai speedily withdrew several steps backward. Are you again bent, she said, upon compassing your own death? Then why do you knock your hands and kick your feet about in this wise? While intent upon speaking, I forgot, smiled Pao Yu, all about propriety and gesticulated, yet called inadvertently, but walk here I whether I die or live. To die would, after all, added Ling Dai Yu, be for you of no matter, but you will leave behind some gold or other, and a unicorn too or other, and what should they do? This insinuation was enough to plunge Pao Yu into a fresh fit of exasperation. Hastening up to her, Do you still give vent to such language? he asked. Why, it's really tantamount to invoking imprecations on me. What, are you yet angry with me? This question recalled to Ling Dai Yu's mind the incidents of a few days back, 
and a pang of remorse immediately gnawed her heart for having been again so indiscreet in her speech now don't you distress your mind she observed hastily smiling i verily said that i shouldn't yet what is there in this to make your veins protrude and to so provoke you as to bedew your whole face with perspiration while reasoning with him she felt unable to repress herself and approaching him she extended her hand and wiped the perspiration from his face pao yu gazed intently at her for a long time do you set your mind at ease he at length observed at this remark lin dai yu felt quite nervous what is there to make my mind uneasy she asked after a protracted interval i can't make out what you are driving at tell me what's this about making me easy or uneasy pao yu heaved a sigh don't you truly fathom the depth of my words he inquired why do you mean to say that i've throughout made such poor use of my love for you as not to be able to even define your feelings well if so it's no wonder that you daily lose your temper on my account i actually don't understand what you mean by easy or uneasy lin dai yu replied my dear girl urged pao yu nodding and sighing don't be making a fool of me for if you can't make out these words not only have i ever uselessly lavished affection upon you but the regard with which you have always treated me has likewise been entirely of no avail and it's mostly because you won't set your mind at ease that your whole frame is riddled with disease had you taken things easier a bit this ailment of yours too wouldn't have grown worse from day to day these words made lin dai yu feel as if she had been blasted by thunder or struck by lightning but after carefully weighing them within herself they seemed to her far more fervent than any that might have emanated from the depth of her own heart and thousands of sentiments in fact thronged together in her mind but though she had every wish to frame them into language she found it a hard task to pronounce so much as half a word all she therefore did was to gaze at him with vacant stare pao yu fostered innumerable thoughts within himself but unable in a moment to resolve from which particular one to begin he too absently looked at tai yu thus it was that the two cousins remained for a long time under the spell of a deep reverie an ejaculation of pai was the only sound that issued from lin dai yu's lips and while tears streamed suddenly from her eyes she turned herself round and started on her way homeward pao yu jumped forward with alacrity and dragged her back my dear cousin he pleaded do you stop a bit let me tell you just one thing after that you may go what can you have to tell me exclaimed lin dai yu who while wiping her tears extricated her hand from his grasp i know she cried all you have to say as she spoke she went away without even turning her head to cast a glance behind her as pao yu gazed at her receding figure he fell into abstraction he had in fact quitted his apartments a few moments back in such precipitate hurry that he had omitted to take a fan with him and xi ren fearing lest he might suffer from the heat promptly seized one and rang to find him and give it to him but upon casually raising her head she espied lin dai yu standing with him after a time dai yu walked away and as he still remained where he was without budging she approached him you left she said without even taking a fan with you happily i noticed it and so hurried to catch you up and bring it to you but pao yu was so lost in thought that as soon as he caught xi ren's voice he made a dash and clasped her in his embrace without so much as trying to make sure who she was my dear cousin he cried i couldn't hitherto muster enough courage to disclose the secrets of my heart but on this occasion i shall make bold and give utterance to them for you i'm quite ready to even pay the penalty of death i have too for your sake brought ailments upon my whole frame it's in here 
but I haven't ventured to breathe it to any one. My only alternative has been to bear it patiently, in the hope that when it got all right, I might then perchance also recover. But whether I sleep or whether I dream, I never, never forget you. These declarations quite dumbfounded Xi Ren. She gave way to incessant apprehensions. All she could do was to shout out, "O、oh、spirits! O、oh、heaven! O、oh、Buddha! He's compassing my death!" Then, pushing him away from her, "What is it you're saying?" she asked. "May it be that you are possessed by some evil spirit? Don't you quick yet get yourself off!" This brought Pao Yü to his senses at once. He then became aware that it was Xi Ren. And that she had come to bring him a fan, Pao Yu was overpowered with shame. His whole face was suffused with scarlet, and snatching the fan out of her hands, he bolted away with rapid stride. When Xi Ren meanwhile saw Pao Yu effect his escape, Lin Tai Yu, she pondered, must surely be at the bottom of all he said just now. But from what one can see, it will be difficult in the future. To obviate the occurrence of some unpleasant mishap, it's sufficient to fill one with fear and trembling. At this point in her cogitations, she involuntarily melted into tears. So agitated was she, while she secretly exercised her mind how best to act, so as to prevent this dreadful calamity. But while she was lost in this maze of surmises and doubts, Pao Ch'ai unexpectedly appeared from the offside. What? She smilingly exclaimed, "Are you dreaming away in a hot, broiling sun like this?" Xi Ren, at this question, hastily returned her smile. "Those two birds," she answered, "were having a fight, and such fun was it that I stopped to watch them." Where is Cousin Bao off to now, in such a hurry, got up in that fine attire? Asked Bao Ch'ai. "I just caught sight of him as he went by. I meant to have called out and stopped him." But as he, of late, talks greater rubbish than ever, I didn't challenge him, but let him go past. Our master, rejoined Xi Ren, sent for him to go out. Ai ya! Hastily exclaimed Pao Ch'ai, as soon as this remark reached her ears. What does he want him for, on a scolding day like this? Might he not have thought of something and got so angry about it as to send for him to give him a lecture? If it isn't this. Added Xi Ren, laughing, "Some visitor must, I presume, have come, and he wishes him to meet him." With weather like this, smiled Pao Ch'ai, even visitors afford no amusement. Why don't they, while this fiery temperature lasts, stay at home, where it's much cooler, instead of gadding about all over the place? Could you tell them so? Smiled Xi Ren. What was that girl Xiang Yun doing in your quarters? Pao Ch'ai then asked. She only came to chat with us on irrelevant matters," Syria replied, smiling. "But did you see the pair of shoes I was pacing the other day? Well, I meant to ask her tomorrow to finish them for me." Bao Ch'ai, at these words, turned her head round, first on this side and then on the other, seeing that there was no one coming or going. "How is it," she smiled, "that you, who have so much gumption, don't ever show any respect for people's feelings?" I've been off late keeping an eye on Miss Wing's manner, and from what I can glean from the various rumors afloat, she can't be, in the slightest degree, her own mistress at home. In that family of theirs, so little can they stand the burden of any heavy expenses that they don't employ any needlework people, and ordinary everyday things are mostly attended to by their ladies themselves. If not. Why is it that every time she has come to us on a visit, and she and I have had a chat, she at once broached the subject of their being in great difficulties at home, the moment she perceived that there was no one present? Yet, whenever I went on to ask her a few questions about their usual way of living, her very eyes grew red, while she made some indistinct reply. But as for speaking out, she wouldn't. But when I consider the circumstances in which she is placed, for she has certainly had the misfortune of being left, from her very infancy, without father and mother, the very sight of her is too much for me, and my heart begins to bleed within me. Quite so, quite so," 
observed Siren, clapping her hands after listening to her throughout. It isn't strange, then, if she let me have the ten butterfly knots I asked her to tie for me, only after so many days, and if she said that they were coarsely done, but that I should make the best of them and use them elsewhere, and that if I wanted any nice ones, I should wait until by and by when she came to stay here, when she would work them neatly for me. What you've told me now reminds me that, as she had found it difficult to find an excuse when we appealed to her, she must have had to slave away, who knows how much, till the third watch in the middle of the night. What a stupid thing I was! Had I known this sooner, I would never have told her a word about it. Last time, continued Bao Chai, she told me that when she was at home, she had ample to do, that she kept busy as late as the third watch, and that, if she did the slightest stitch of work for any other people, the various ladies belonging to her family did not like it. But as it happens, explained Xi Ren, that mulish-minded and perverse-tempered young master of ours won't allow the least bit of needlework, no matter whether small or large, to be made by those persons employed to do sewing in the household. And as for me, I have no time to turn my attention to all these things. Why mind him? laughed Bao Chan. Simply get someone to do the work and finish. How could one bamboozle him? resumed Xi Ren. Why, he'll promptly find out everything. Such a thing can't even be suggested. The only thing I can do is to quietly slave away. That's all. You shouldn't work so hard, smiled Bao Chai. What do you say to my doing a few things for you? Are you in real earnest? ventured Xi Ren, smiling. Well, in that case, it is indeed a piece of good fortune for me. I'll come over myself in the evening. But before she could conclude her reply, she of a sudden noticed an old matron come up to her with precipitate step. Where does the report come from? she interposed, that Miss Ting Chuang er has gone for no rhyme or reason and committed suicide by jumping into the well. This bit of news startled Xi Ren. Which Ting Chuang er is it? she speedily inquired. Where are two Ting Chuang ers to be found? rejoined the old matron. It is the one in our mistress, Madame Wan's apartments, who was the other day sent away for something or other, I don't know what. On her return home, she raised her groans to the sky and shed profuse tears, but none of them worried their minds about her, until, who would have thought it, they could see nothing of her. A servant, however, went just now to draw water, and he says that while he was getting it from the well in the southeast corner, he caught sight of a dead body, and that he hurriedly called men to his help, and that when they fished it out, they unexpectedly found that it was she, but that though they bustled around trying to bring her round, everything proved of no avail. This is odd, Bao Chai exclaimed. The moment Xi Ren heard the tidings, she shook her head and moaned, at the remembrance of the friendship which had ever existed between them. Tears suddenly trickled down her cheeks, and as for Bao Chai, she listened to the account of the accident, and then hastened to Madame Wang's quarters to try and afford her consolation. Xi Ren, during this interval, returned to her room, but we will leave her without further notice, and explain that when Bao Chai reached the interior of Madame Wang's home, she found everything plunged in perfect stillness. Madame Wang was seated all alone in the inner chamber indulging her sorrow. With such difficulties did Bao Chai experience to allude to the occurrence that her only alternative was to take a seat next to her. Where do you come from? asked Madame Wang. I come from inside the garden, answered Bao Chai. As you come from the garden, Madame Wang inquired, did you see anything of your cousin Bao Yu? I saw him just now. Bao Chai replied, Go out, dressed up in his fineries. But where he has gone to, I don't know. Have you perchance heard of any strange occurrence? asked Madame Wang, while she nodded her head and sighed. Why, Jing Chuan jumped into the well and committed suicide. How is it that she jumped into the well when there was nothing to make her do so? 
Bauchan inquired. This is indeed a remarkable thing. The fact is, proceeded Madame Wang, that she spoiled something the other day, and in a sudden fit of temper, I gave her a slap and sent her away, simply meaning to be angry with her for a few days, and then bring her in again. But who could have ever imagined that she has such a resentful temperament as to go and drown herself in a well? And is not this all my fault? It's because you're such a kind-hearted person, and smiled Pao Chai, that such ideas cross your mind. But she didn't jump into the well when she was in the tantrum. So what must have made her do so was that she had to go and live in the lower quarters. Or she might have been standing in front of the well, and her foot slipped, and she fell into it. While in the upper rooms, she used to be kept under restraint, so when this time she found herself outside, she must, of course, have felt the wish to go strolling all over the place in search of fun. How could she have ever had such a fiery disposition? But even admitting that she had such a temper, she was, after all, a stupid girl to do as she did, and she doesn't deserve any pity. In spite of what you say, said Madame Wang, shaking her head to and fro, I really feel unhappy at heart. You shouldn't, aunt. Distress your mind about it. Bao Chai smiled. Yet, if you feel very much exercised, just give her a few more tales than you would otherwise have done, and let her be buried. You'll thus carry out to the full feelings of a mistress towards her servant. I just now gave them fifty tales for her, pursued the Madame Rong. I also meant to let them have some of your cousin's new clothes to enshroud her in. Who'd have thought it? None of the girls had, strange coincidence, any newly made articles of clothing, and there were only that couple of birthday suits for Cousin Lin's. But as her Cousin Lin has ever been such a sensitive child, and has always too suffered and ailed, I thought it would be unpropitious for her, if her clothes were also now handed to people to wrap their dead in, after she had been told that they were given her for her birthday. So I ordered a tailor to get a suit for her as soon as possible. Had it been an any other servant girl, I could have given her a few tales and have finished. But Ding Chuang er was, albeit a servant maid, nearly as dear to me as if she had been a daughter of mine. Saying this, tears unwittingly ran down from her eyes. Aunt, vehemently exclaimed Pao Chai, what earthly use is it? of hiring a tailor just now to prepare clothes for her. I have a couple of suits I made the other day, and wanted safe trouble were I to go and bring them for her. Besides, when she was alive, she used to wear my old clothes. And what's more, our figures are much alike. What you say is all very well, rejoined Madame Wang. But can it be that it isn't distasteful to you? Compose your mind, urged Bao Chai with a smile. I have never paid any heed to such things. As she spoke, she rose to her feet and walked away. Madame Wang then promptly called two servants. Go and accompany Miss Pao, she said. In a brief space of time, Bao Chai came back with her clothes and discovered Bao Yu seated next to Madame Wang, all melted in tears. Madame Wang was reasoning with him. At the sight of Bao Chai, she at once desisted. When Bao Chai saw them go on in this way, and came to weigh their conversation, and to scan the expression on their countenances, she immediately got a pretty correct insight into their feelings. But presently, she handed over the clothes, and Madame Wang sent for Jing Chuang's mother to take them away. But, reader, you'll have to pursue the next chapter for further details. End of section 16 Recording by Cao Yuxing in Singapore. Section 17 of The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book 2. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cao Yuting in Singapore. 
The Dream of the Red Chamber, Book Two by Cao Xueqin, translated by Henry Bancroft Dolly, Chapter Thirty Three. A brother is prompted by ill feeling to wag his tongue a bit. A depraved son receives heavy blows with a rattan cane. Madame Wan, for we shall now continue our story, sent for Jing Chuan's mother. On her arrival, she gave her several hairpins and rings, and then told her that she could invite several Buddhist priests as well to read the prayers necessary to release the spirit from purgatory. The mother prostrated herself and expressed her gratitude. After which, she took her leave. Indeed, Bao Yu, on his return from entertaining Yu Sun, heard the tidings that Jing Chuang had been instigated by a sense of shame to take her own life, and he at once fell a prey to grief. So much so that when he came inside and was again spoken to and admonished by Madame Wan, he could not utter a single word in his justification. But as soon as he perceived Bao Chai make her appearance in the room, he seized the opportunity to scamper out in precipitate haste. Whither he was trudging, he himself had not the least idea. But throwing his hands behind his back and drooping his head against his chest, he gave way to sighs. While with slow and listless step he turned towards the hall, scarcely, however, had he rounded the screen wall which stood in front of the doorway, when, by a strange coincidence, he ran straight into the arms of someone, who was unawares approaching from the opposite direction, and was just about to go towards the inner portion of the compound. Hello, the person was heard to cry out as he stood still. Bao Yu sustained a dreadful start. Raising his face to see, he discovered that it was no other than his father. At once, he unconsciously drew a long breath and adopted the only safe course of dropping his arms against his body and standing on one side. "Why are you?" exclaimed Jia Zhong, drooping your head in such a melancholy mood and indulging in all these moans. When Yu Sun came just now and he asked to see you, you only put in your appearance after a long while. But though you did come, you were not in the least disposed to chat with anything like cheerfulness and animation. You behaved as you ever do, like a regular fool. I detected then in your countenance a certain expression of some hidden hankering and sadness, and now again here you are groaning and sighing. Does all you have not suffice to please you? Are you still dissatisfied? You've no reason to be like this. So why is it that you go on in this way? Bao Yu had ever, it is true, shown a glib tongue, but on the present occasion he was so deeply affected by Jing Chuan's fate and vexed at not being able to die that very instant and follow in her footsteps, that although he was now fully conscious that his father was speaking to him, he could not, in fact, lend him an ear, but simply stood in a timid and nervous mood. Jia Zhong noticed that he was in a state of trembling and fear, not as ready with an answer as he usually was, and his sorry plight somewhat incensed him, much though he had not at first borne him any ill feeling. But just as he was about to chide him, a messenger approached and announced to him, "Someone has come from the mansion of Imperial Prince Zhong Shun, and wishes to see you, sir." At this announcement, surmises sprang up in Jia Zhong's mind. Hitherto, he secretly mused. I've never had any dealings with the Zhongshu Mansion, and why is it that someone is dispatched here today? As he gave way to these reflections, "Be quick!" he shouted, and asked him to take a seat in the pavilion, while he himself precipitately entered the inner room and changed his costume. When he came out to greet the visitor, he discovered that he was the senior officer of the Zhongshu Mansion. After the exchange of the salutations prescribed by the rites, they sat down and tea was presented. But before Jia Zhong had had time to start a topic of conversation, the senior officer anticipated him and speedily observed, "Your humble servant does not pay this visit today to your worthy mansion on his own authority, but entirely in compliance with instructions received, as there is a favor that I have to beg of you. I make bold to trouble you, esteemed sir, on behalf of His Highness, to take any steps you might deem suitable." And if you do, not only will His Highness remember your kindness, but even I, your humble servant, and my colleagues will feel extremely grateful to you. Jia Zheng listened to him, but he could not, nevertheless, get a clue of what he was driving at. 
promptly returning his smile he rose to his feet you come sir he inquired at the instance of his royal highness but what i wonder are the commands you have to give me i hope you will explain them to your humble servant worthy sir in order to enable him to carry them out effectively the senior officer gave a sardonic smile there's nothing to carry out he said all you venerable sir have to do is to utter one single word and the whole thing will be effected there is in our mansion a certain qi guan who plays the part of the young ladies he hitherto stayed quietly in the mansion but for the last three or five days or so no one has seen him return home search has been instituted in every locality yet his whereabouts cannot be discovered but throughout these various inquiries eight out of the ten tenths of the inhabitants of the city have with one consent asserted that he was he has of late been on very friendly terms with that honourable son of yours who was born with the jade in his mouth this report was told your servant and his colleagues but as your worthy mansion is unlike such residences as we can take upon ourselves to enter and search with impunity we felt under the necessity of laying the matter before our imperial master had it been any of the other actors his highness also said i wouldn't have minded if every one hundred of them had disappeared but this xi guan has always been so ready with part repartee so respectful and trustworthy that he has thoroughly won my aged heart and i could never do without him he entreats you therefore worthy sir to in your turn plead with your illustrious scion and request him to let xi guan go back in order that the feelings which prompt the prince to make such earnest supplications may in the first place be satisfied and that in the next your mean servant and his associates may be spared the fatigue of toiling and searching at the conclusion of this appeal he promptly made a low bow as soon as jia zhong found out the object of his errand he felt both astonishment and displeasure with all promptitude he issued directions that pao yu should be told to come out of the garden Bao Yu had no notion whatever why he was wanted, so speedily he hurried to appear before his father. What a regular scoundrel you are! Jia Zhong exclaimed. Is it enough that you won't read your books at home, but will you also go in for all these lawless and wrongful acts? That Xi Guan is a person whose present honourable duties are to act as an attendant on his highness, the prince of Zhongshun and how extremely heedless of propriety must you be to have enticed him without good cause to come away and thus have now brought calamity upon me these reproaches plunged Bao in a dreadful state of consternation with alacrity he said by way of reply i really don't know anything about the matter to what do after all the two words xi guan refer i wonder still less besides am i aware what entice can imply as he spoke he started crying but before jia zhong could open his mouth to pass any further remarks young gentleman he heard the senior officer interpose with a sardonic smile you shouldn't conceal anything if he be either hidden in your home or if you know his whereabouts divulge the truth at once so that less trouble could fall to our lot than otherwise would and will we not then bear in mind your virtue, worthy scion? I positively don't know, Bao Yu time after time maintained. There must, I fear, be some false rumour abroad, for I haven't so much as seen anything of him. The senior officer gave two loud smiles, full of derision. There's evidence at hand, he rejoined. So if you compel me to speak out before your venerable father, won't you young man have to suffer the consequences but as you assert that you don't know who this person is how is it that that red sash has come to be attached to your waist when pao yu caught this allusion he suddenly felt quite out of his senses he stared and gaped while within himself he argued how has he come to hear anything about this 
but since he knows all these secret particulars, I cannot, I expect, put him off in other points. So wouldn't it be better for me to pack him off, in order to obviate his blubbering anything more? Sir, he consequently remarked aloud, how is it that despite your acquaintance with all these minute details, you have no inkling of his having purchased a house? Are you ignorant of an essential point like this? I've heard people say that he is, at present, staying in the eastern suburbs, at a distance of twenty li from the city walls, at some place or other called Zetanbao, and that he has bought there several acres of land and a few houses. So I presume he is to be found in that locality, but of course there's no saying. According to your version, smiled the senior officer, as soon as he heard his explanation, he must for a certainty be there. I shall therefore go and look for him. If it's there, well and good. But if not, I shall come again and request you to give me further directions. These words were still on his lips when he took his leave and walked off with hurried step. Jia Zheng was by this time stirred up to such a pitch of indignation that his eyes stared aghast, and his mouth opened in bewilderment. And as he escorted the officer out, he turned his head and bade Pao Yun not budge. I have, he said, to ask you something on my return. Straight away, he then went to see the officer off. But just as he was turning back, he casually came across Jia Huan and several servant boys running wildly about in a body. Quick, bring him here to me, shouted Jia Zheng to the young boys. I want to beat him. Jia Huan, at the sight of his father, was so terrified that his bones mollified and his tendons grew weak, and promptly lowering his head, he stood still. What are you running about for? Jia Zheng asked. These menials of yours do not mind you, but go who knows where and let you roam about like a wild horse. Where are the attendants who wait on you at school? he cried. When Jia Huan saw his father in such a dreadful rage, he availed himself of the first opportunity to try and clear himself. I wasn't running about just now, he said, but as I was passing by the side of the well, I caught sight, for in that well a servant girl was drowned, and of a human head that large, a body that swollen, floating about in really a frightful way, and I therefore hastily rushed past. Jia Zheng was thunderstruck by this disclosure. There's been nothing up, so who has gone and jumped into the well? he inquired. Never has there been anything of the kind in my house before. Ever since the time of our ancestors, servants have invariably been treated with clemency and consideration. But I expect that I must of late have become remiss of my domestic affairs, and that the managers must have arrogated to themselves the right of domineering, and so been the cause of bringing about such calamities as violent deaths and disregard of life. Were these things to reach the ears of people outside, what will become of the reputation of our seniors? Cause Dalian and Lai Da here, he shouted. The servant lads signified their obedience with one voice. They were about to go and summon them when Jia Huan hastened to press forward. Grasping the lapel of Jia Zheng's coat and clinging to his knees, he knelt down. Father, why need you be angry? he said. Excluding the people in Madame Wan's rooms, this occurrence is entirely unknown to any of the rest, and I have heard my mother mention. At this point, he turned his head and cast a glance in all four quarters. Jia Zheng guessed his meaning and made a sign with his eyes. The young boys grasped his purpose and drew far back on either side. Jia Huan resumed his confidences in a low tone of voice. My mother, he resumed, told me that when Brother Bao Yu was, the other day, in Madame Wan's apartments, he seized her servant maid, Xing Chuan, with the intent of dishonouring her. That, as he failed to carry out his design, he gave her a thrashing, which so exasperated Xing Chuan that she threw herself into the well and committed suicide. Before, however, he could conclude his account, Jia Zheng had been incensed to such a degree that his face assumed the colour of silver paper. Bring Bao Yu here, he cried. While uttering these orders, he walked into the study. If anyone does again today come to dissuade me, 
he vociferated. I shall take this official hat and sash my home and private property and surrender everything at once to him to go and bestow them upon Bao Yu. For if I cannot escape blame with a son like the one I have, I mean to shave this scanty trouble-laden hair about my temples and go in search of some unsullied place where I can spend the rest of my days alone. I shall thus also avoid the crime of heaping above insult upon my predecessors and below of having given birth to such a rebellious son. At the sight of Jia Zheng in this exasperation, the family companions and attendants speedily released that Bao Yu must once more be the cause of it, and the whole posse hastened to withdraw from the study, biting their fingers and putting their tongues out. Jia Zheng panted with excitement. He stretched his chest out and sat bolt upright on a chair. His whole face was covered with the traces of tears. Bring Bao Yu! Bring Bao Yu! he shouted consecutively. Fetch a big stick, bring a rope and tie him up. Close all the doors. If anyone does communicate anything about it in the inner rooms, well, I'll immediately beat him to death. The servant boys felt compelled to express their obedience with one consent, and some of them came to look after Bao Yu. As for Bao Yu, when he heard Jia Zheng enjoin him not to move, he forthwith became aware that the chances of an unpropitious issue outnumbered those of a propitious one. But how could he have had any idea that Jia Huan as well had put in his word? There, he still stood in the pavilion, revolving in his mind how he could get someone to speed inside and deliver a message for him. But as it happened, not a soul appeared. He was quite at a loss to know where even Bei Ming could be. His longing was at its height when he perceived an old nurse come on on the scene. The sight of her exalted Bao Yu just as much as if he had obtained pearls or gems, and hurriedly approaching her, he dragged her and forced her to halt. Go in, he urged, at once, and tell him that my father wishes to beat me to death. Be quick, be quick, for it's urgent, there's no time to be lost. But first and foremost, Bao Yu's excitement was so intense that he spoke with indistinctness. In the second place, the old nurse was, as luck would have it, dull of hearing, so that she did not catch the drift of what he said, and she misconstrued the two words. It's urgent, for the two representing him jumped into the well, readily smiling therefore. If she wants to jump into the well, let her do so, she said. What's there to make you fear, Master Secundus? A go out, pursued Bao Yu in despair, on discovering that she was deaf, and tell my page to come. What's there left unsettled, rejoined the owners. Everything has been finished long ago. A tip has also been given them. So how is it things are not settled? Bao Yu fidgeted with his hands and feet. He was just at his wit's ends when he espied Jia Zheng's servant's boys come up and press him to go out. As soon as Jia Zheng caught sight of him, his eyes got quite red. Without even allowing himself any time to question him about his gadding about with actors and the presents he gave them on the sly during his absence from home, or about his playing the truant from school and lewdly importuning his mother's maid during his day at home, he simply shouted, Gag his mouth and positively beat him till he dies. The servant boys did not have the boldness to disobey him. They were under the necessity of seizing Bao Yu, of stretching him on a bench, and of taking a heavy rattan and giving him about ten blows. Bao Yu knew well enough that he could not plead for mercy, and all he could do was to whimper and cry. Jia Zheng, however, found fault with the light blows they administered to him. With one kick, he shoved the castigator aside, and snatching the rattan into his own hands, he spitefully let Bao Yu have ten blows and more. Bao Yu had not, from his very birth, experienced such anguish. From the outset, he found the pain unbearable, yet he could shout and weep as boisterously as ever he pleased, but so weak subsequently did his breath, little by little, become so hoarse his voice and so choked his throat that he could not bring out any sound. 
the family companions noticed that he was beaten in a way that might lead to an unpropitious end and they drew near with all dispatch and made earnest entreaties and exhortations but would jia zheng listen to them you people he answered had better ask him whether the tricks he has been up to deserve to be overlooked or not it's you who have all along so thoroughly spoiled him as to make him reach this degree of depravity and do you yet come to advise me to spare him when by and by you've incited him to commit parricide or regicide you will at length then give up trying to dissuade me eh this language jarred on the ears of the whole party and knowing only too well that he was in an exasperated mood they fussed about endeavouring to find someone to go in and convey the news but madame wang did not presume to be first to inform dowager lady jia about it seeing no other course open to her she hastily dressed herself and issued out of the garden without so much as worrying her mind as to whether there were any male inmates about or not she straightway leant on a waiting-maid and hurriedly betook herself into the library so the intense consternation of the companions pages and all the men present who could not manage to clear out of the way in time jia zheng was on the point of further belabouring his son when at the sight of madame wang walking in his temper flared up with such increased violence just as fire on which oil is poured that the rod fell with greatest fight and celerity the two servant boys who held bao yu down precipitately loosened their grip and beat a retreat bao yu had long ago lost all power of movement jia zheng however was again preparing to assail him when the rattan was immediately locked tightly by madame wang in both her arms of course of course jia zheng exclaimed what you want to do today is to make me succumb to anger Bao Yu does, I admit, merit to be beaten, sobbed Madame Wang. But you should also, my lord, take good care of yourself. The weather, besides, is extremely hot, and our old lady is not feeling quite up to the mark. Were you to knock Bao Yu about and kill him, it would not matter much. But were perchance our venerable senior to suddenly fall ill, wouldn't it be a grave thing? Better not talk about such things observed jia zheng with a listless smile by my bringing up such a degenerate child of retribution i have myself become unfilial whenever i've had to call him to account there has always been a whole crowd of you to screen him so isn't it as well for me to avail myself of today to put an end to his cur-like existence and thus prevent future misfortune as he spoke he asked for a rope to strangle him but madame wan lost no time in clasping him in her embrace and reasoning with him as she wept my lord and master she said it is your duty of course to keep your son in proper order but you should also regard the relationship of husband and wife i'm ready a woman of fifty and i've got only this gay grace was there any need for you to give him such a bitter lesson I wouldn't presume to use any strong dissuasion, but having on this occasion gone so far as to harbour the design of killing him, isn't this a fixed purpose on your part to cut short my own existence? But as you are bent upon strangling him, be quick and first strangle me before you strangle him. It will be as well that we, mother and son, should die together, so that if even we go to hell, we may be able to rely upon each other. At the conclusion of these words, she enfolded Bao in her embrace and raised her voice in loud sobs. After listening to her appeal, Jia Zheng could not restrain a deep sigh, and taking a seat on one of the chairs, the tears ran down his cheeks like drops of rain. But while Madame Wang held Bao Yu in her arms, she noticed that his face was sallow and his breath faint and that his green gaze nether garments were all speckled with stains of blood so she could not check her fingers from unloosening his girdle and realising that from the thighs to the buttocks his person was here green there purple here whole there broken and that there was in fact not the least bit which had not sustained some injury she of a sudden burst out in bitter lamentations for offspring's wretched lot in life 
But while bemoaning her unfortunate son, she again recalled to mind the memory of Jia Zhu, and vehemently calling out Jia Zhu, she sobbed, "If but you were alive, I would not care if even one hundred died." But by this time, the inmates of the inner rooms discovered that Madame Wan had gone out, and Li Gongcai, Wang Xifeng, and Ying Chun, and her sister promptly rushed out of the garden and came to join her. While Madame Wan mentioned, with eyes bathed in tears, the name of Jia Zhu, everyone listened with composure, with the exception of Li Gongcai, who, unable to curb her feelings, also raised her voice in sobs. As soon as Jia Zhong heard her plaints, his tears trickled down with greater profusion, like pearls scattered about. But just as there seemed no prospect of their being consoled, a servant girl was unawares heard to announce, "Our dowager lady has come." Before this announcement was ended, her tremulous accents reached their ears from outside the window. If you were to beat me to death and then dispatch him, she cried, "One should be clear of us." Jia Zheng, upon seeing that his mother was coming, felt distressed and pained. With all promptitude, she went out to meet her. He perceived his old parents toddling along, leaning on the arm of a servant girl, wagging her head and gasping for breath. Jia Zheng flew forward and made a courtesy. On a hot, whirling day like this. He ventured, forcing a smile. What made you, mother, get so angry as to rush over in person? Had you anything to enjoin me? You could have sent for me, your son, and given me your orders. Old lady Jia, at these words, halted and panted. Are you really chiding me? She at the same time said in a stern tone, "It's I who should call you to task." But as the son I brought up isn't worth a straw, to whom can I go and address a word? When Jia Zhou heard language so unlike that generally used by her, he immediately fell on his knees, while doing all in his power to contain his tears. The reason why he explained, your son corrects his offering is a desire to reflect lustre on his ancestors, and splendour on his seniors. So how can I, your son, deserve the rebuke with which you greet me, mother? At this reply, old lady Jia spluttered contemptuously. I made just one remark, she added, and you couldn't stand it. And can Bao Yu likely put up with that death-working cane? You say that your object in correcting your son is to reflect lustre on your ancestors and splendour on your seniors. But in what manner did your father correct you in days gone by? Saying this, tears suddenly rolled down from her eyes. Also, Jia Zheng forced another smile. Mother, he proceeded, you shouldn't distress yourself. Your son did it in a sudden fit of rage, but from this time forth, I won't touch him again. Dowager Lady Jia smiled several loud, sneering smiles. But you shouldn't get into a huff with me, she urged. He's your son, so if you choose to flog him, you can naturally do so. But I cannot help thinking that you are sick and tired of me, your mother, of your wife, and of your son. So wouldn't it be as well that we should get out of your way? The sooner, the better, as we shall then be able to enjoy his peace and quiet. So speaking, go and look after the chairs. She speedily cried to a servant. I and your lady, as well as Bao Yu, will, without delay, return to Nanjing. The servant had no help but to assent. Old Lady Jia thereupon called Madame Wan over to her. You needn't indulge in sorrow, she extorted her. Bao Yu is now young, and you cherish him fondly. But does it follow that when in years to come he becomes an official, he'll remember that you are his mother? You mustn't, therefore, at present, lavish too much of your affection upon him, so that you may, by and by, spare yourself at least some displeasure. When these exhortations fell on Jia Zheng's ear, he instantly prostrated himself before her. Your remarks, mother, he observed, cut the ground under your son's very feet. You distinctly act in a way, cynically smiled old lady Jia. Sufficient to deprive me of any ground to stand upon, and then you, on the contrary, go and speak about yourself. 
But when we shall have gone back, your mind will be free of all trouble. You will see then who is interfere and dissuade you from beating people. After this reply, she went on to give orders to directly get ready to the baggage, carriages, chairs, and horses necessary for their return. Jia Zheng stiffly and rigidly fell on his knees and knocked his head before her and pleaded guilty. Dowager Lady Jia then addressed him some words, and as she did so, she came to have that look at Pao Yu. Upon perceiving that the thrashing he had got this time was unlike those of past occasions, she experienced both pain and resentment. So clasping him in her arms, she wept and wept incessantly. It was only after Madame Wan, Lady Feng, and the other ladies had reasoned with her for a time that they at length gradually succeeded in consoling her. But waiting maids, married women, and other attendants soon came to support Bao Yu, and take him away. Lady Feng, however, at once expostulated with them. You stupid things, she exclaimed, won't you open your eyes and see? How ever could he be raised and made to walk in the state he's in? Don't you get instantly run inside and fetch some rattan slings and a bench to carry him out of this on? At this suggestion, the servant rushed hurry scurry inside and actually brought a bench and, lifting Bao Yu, they placed him on it. Then, following Dowager Lady Jia, Madame Wan and the other inmates into the inner part of the building, they carried him into his grandmother's apartments. But Jia Zheng did not fail to notice that his old mother's passion had not by this time yet abated. So, without presuming to consult his own convenience, he too came inside after them. Here, he discovered how heavily he had, in reality, castigated Bao Yu. Upon perceiving Madame Wan also crying, with one breath, My flesh, and with another, staying with tears, My son, you had died sooner, instead of Zhuor, and left Zhuor behind you. You would have saved your father these fits of anger. And even I would not have had so fruitlessly worried and fresh for half of my existence. Were anything to happen now to make you forsake me, upon whom will you have me depend? And then, after heaping reproaches upon herself for a time, break out afresh in lamentations for her unavailing offspring, Jia Zheng was much cut up and felt conscious that he should not with his own hand have struck his son so ruthlessly as to bring him to this state, and his first and foremost directed his attention to consoling Dowager Lady Jia. If your son isn't good, rejoined the old lady, repressing her tears, it is naturally for you to exercise control over him, but you shouldn't beat him to such a pitch. Don't you yet bundle yourself away? What are you dallying in here for? Is it likely, pray, that your heart is not yet satisfied, and that you wish to feast your eyes by seeing him die before you go? These taunts induced Xia Zheng to eventually withdraw out of the room. By this time, Mrs. Xu together with Bao Chai, Xiang Ling, Xi Ren, Shi Xiang Ling, and its other cousins had also congregated in these apartments. Xi Ren's heart was overflowing with grief, but she could not very well give expression to it. When she saw that a whole company of people shut him in, some pouring water over him, others fanning him, and that she herself could not lend a hand in any way, she availed herself of a favourable moment to make her exit. Proceeding then as far as the second gate, she bade the servant boys go and fetch Fei Ming. On his arrival, she admitted him to a certain inquiry. Why is it, she asked, that he was beaten just now without the least provocation, and that you didn't run over soon to tell me a word about it? It happened, answered Fei Ming in great perplexity, that it wasn't present. It was only after he had given him half the flogging that I heard what was going on, and lost no time in ascertaining what it was all about. It's on account of those affairs connected with Xu Guan and that girl Jing Chuan. How did these things come to master's knowledge? inquired Xi Ren. As for that affair with Xu Guan, continued Bei Ming, it is very likely Ms. Xue Pan, who had let it out, for as he has ever been jealous, he may, in the absence of any other way of quenching his resentment, have instigated someone or other outside, who knows, to come and see master and add fuel to his anger. 
as Virgin tries of there, he has presumably been told by Master Tertius. This I heard from the lips of some person who was in attendance upon Master. Xi Ren saw how much his two versions tallied with the true circumstances, so she readily credited the greater portion of what was told her. Subsequently, she returned inside. Here she found a whole crowd of people trying to do their best to benefit Pao Yu, but after they had completed every arrangement, Dowager Lady Jia impressed on their minds that it would be the best were they to carefully move him into his own quarters. With one voice, they all signified their approval, and with a good deal of bustling and fuzzing, they speedily transferred Pao Yu into the Yi Hong court, where they stretched him out comfortably on his own bed. Then, after some further excitement, the members of the family began gradually to disperse. Xi Ren at last entered his room and waited upon him with singleness of heart. But, reader, if you feel any curiosity to hear what follows, listen to what you will find divulged in the next chapter. End of section 17. Recording by Cao Yuqing in Singapore.